Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, I suggest that we slowly start. Uh, we are very happy to see that many people relatively early in the morning after I, I guess many people had a great evening yesterday. So um, it is our great pleasure to have uh, our third keynote speaker, uh, Professor Samuel Horvat. Uh, Samuel currently working in uh, Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence in Abu Dhabi. And uh, uh, before that, he did his PhD in Saudi Arabia in KAUST. And Sam is a like, very well-known expert on distributed and federated learning. And he will be talking exactly on some aspects of these uh, topics today. So Sam, go ahead. Right, thank, thank you, Maxim, for a very generous introduction, and thanks to all organizers for inviting me. So what I want to talk about today is uh, federated learning, and let me just briefly discuss outline of the, my talk. So first, what I'll try to do, I'll try to give you some kind of like a gentle introduction to what we mean by federated learning and how it uh, developed. Then I'm going to discuss uh, several practical and research challenges that kind of need to be addressed in order to uh, deploy federated learning in real world scenarios. And then I'm going to talk a bit about our recent work that we did on uh, decomposable models that are targeted to, uh, uh, to face some of the challenges of the federated learning. All right, so let me start with the motivation of why we do federated learning. So if we look at kind of like a traditional machine learning, so originally what we did, you would have a single machine, you would just uh, kind of put all your data in and try to train your machine learning model. But as we uh, kind of progressed, what we see that essentially this models gets bigger and they require more and more data. So therefore we moved from uh, local solutions to uh, cloud-based solutions. Now, the thing with that is, like with this ever-increasing uh, data collection, what we have to consider is that a uh, majority of those data comes from uh, clients that might have, and, and that, privacy, uh, that data collection might have some negative privacy implication of these data collections. Uh, on top of that, uh, many countries uh, do have different privacy initiatives such as GDPR in the European Union, or uh, there is uh, CCPA uh, in the US that essentially kind of forbids direct data collections. So uh, with this in mind, essentially, if we want to further progress machine learning by collecting ever more uh, data, that might not be kind of a kind of standard solution, might not be the feasible solution, because not respecting those privacy initiatives, we can almost completely lose uh, the access to the data. Now, this is where afraid the learning kind of comes uh, to save us by bringing training actually to the edge. So to those clients that uh, own data and uh, the main premise of the learning is uh, following. So we do assume that we have uh, some orchestrator. Oh. Okay, so I'll uh, just point here if that works. Yeah, so we have some orchestrator who orchestrates the whole training process. And what it asks uh, those clients to do, it uh, asks them to compute some kind of like update to the model when we do training. And those updates are supposed to be very focused. And they are intended for immediate aggregation. So essentially, this orchestrator, or, or you can think about it as a central server, only sees the aggregated information in order to, preva uh, to prevent any data leakage. Uh, so therefore, kind of very learning uh, is kind of a, its basic definition. What it gives us, it gives us at least a hope to train on this large uh, decentralized data sets. Uh, on top of that, uh, there is an increasing demand to have uh, something what's called data locali uh, locality paradigm, meaning that, that the data should be processed where they were actually collected. And on top of that, uh, there are several recent studies that show that when you care about the uh, carbon footprint of your model, uh, then if you design your federated learning algorithm well, then you actually have a lower carbon footprint when compared to standard centralized learning. 
So some of the kind of a success stories of uh, varied learning, so where it's uh, already commercially applied, this is uh, in the big industry players. Uh, for instance, Apple have it in their uh, Hey Siri or QuickType. Uh, Google uses kind of the same thing for Hey Google and uh, Gboard. Then uh, where we see this kind of a fairy learning as a next game changer. So this is pretty much uh, all applications that historically wouldn't have much of the data. And the reason for that would be like very strong privacy constraints. This might be, uh, let's say, like smart health applications. Uh, there are already several startups working on that, such as uh, DocAI or Oaken, and also a lot in fintech applications where essentially privacy is a key. And there are several banks uh, already working on that, how to do kind of uh, decentralized uh, fraud detection, for instance, WeBank. And I mean, the thing is, is uh, like the application of federated learning, you can think about that as essentially any machine learning task that you would like to do, but you have to collect a lot of private data. Uh, the good thing about machine learning and why it's kind of getting more and more widespread is uh, several open source framework for federated learning. There is, uh, among the most popular, you have the Flower, uh, FedML, also Meta has its own uh, federated learning simulator, uh, same for Microsoft. And also quite popular is the NVIDIA Flare, which is the SDK for federated learning. I'll also do a bit of an advertisement. So when you're looking for the resource to get to know more about like recent research about uh, federated learning, so we've been running for, I think, roughly three years. So ever since COVID, we are running the online seminar where we have more than uh, 100 talks about different kind of aspects of federated learning. They're all on YouTube. So if you are interested, just Google Flow Seminar, register, and you will have access to, to all the talks that we have. And also, uh, some of the great resources are uh, some recent review articles, or there is even a recent book on federated learning as well. All right, so when we talk about federated learning, there are two main settings that we uh, usually consider. So first is something called cross-silo federated learning. And what we have in cross-silo federated learning, we have uh, different organizations. You can think about them as a kind of a big organizations that want to collaborate. Uh, for instance, the example that I have here are hospitals that have a patient records. They would like to train some uh, smart health assistants based on all of these records. But we have to realize that the data are private. So what you kind of care about here the most is uh, the privacy of the data. So, and, and here what we usually assume that the kind of a number of the uh, institutions that uh, try to collaborate is relatively small. Uh, and the main thing that we would care about in this uh, setup is privacy. So the setting that I will uh, consider more in this talk is uh, cross-device varied learning. So in cross-device varied learning, what we have, so all those uh, clients that we have are devices, you can think about them as the mobile devices or different IoT devices, and they want to collaborate in order to solve some machine learning uh, problem. You can think about that as a uh, recommendation problem where the whole process is orchestrated by a uh, center server. You can th uh, this one you can think about as a, as a provider and what's their goal. What's their goal is to train this uh, model in, uh, in this federated way where we only communicate the very focused update that are intended for immediate aggregation. And also one other thing that we have to respect here, that this uh, is all trained within uh, those devices. And also the model that we eventually going to uh, obtain is going to be deployed uh, for those devices. And one of the kind of main challenge here is essentially uh, like different heterogeneity that comes uh, with the client. And also the fact that uh, the number of clients, you can think about that as a number of uh, phones that might be uh, in uh, millions or hundreds of millions. All right, and that brings me to this kind of second part of the talk where I would like to discuss uh, challenges and challenges that essentially makes, uh, or challenges that if we can address those, we would be able to make uh, fair learning practical. So the first one, and one of the most prevalent one, is the communication bottleneck. So 
uh, for those of you, so the example that I uh, list here is for distributed training. So for those of you who are familiar with this, uh, we know that uh, essentially just by adding more and more GPUs, that doesn't necessarily lead to this perfect linear scaling. And the reason for that is at some point, what you're going to hit is the fact that communication is actually much slower than computation. So uh, for instance, I have uh, in this example right here, what you have is essentially if you run, let's say, deep light, which is a very communication heavy model on 8P100 with still relatively fast network, then what you're going to end up with is that essentially more than 90% of your training time going to be spent on communication. And in many applications, this would be uh, the major limiting factor. Uh, now, if we move to federated learning, now here, this issue is even more prevalent because now we do not have those machines, those clients being in a single data centers. Uh, the issue is that they are all connected through some wireless links or some other end user internet connections, and this would be even slower than the data center links. Also, on top of that, uh, you operate in a system where you have actually a lot and a lot of clients, so even the kind of the capacity to aggregate those updates uh, becomes the bottleneck. And especially what we see uh, in the real world application is that. Uh, like the model uh, download is still kind of a slow, so when the clients download the uh, model from the master or from the orchestrator, but then the uploading is the key limitation of the system. So thankfully there are uh, several remedies that uh, one can employ. So you can think about the communication compression, which means that essentially those updates from the client before uh, they are sent back for the aggregation, they're actually compressed. And there is a nice line of research uh, linking this, that if you design your compression very well, you can essentially add uh, more privacy into the systems. Then another possibilities are that essentially that you do not communicate very often. What you can do, you can try to define the local problem that is some kind of harder than just uh, giving the local update. By local update, you can think about just computing the gradient with respect to your local data, but you're going to do kind of more local work such that you reduce the uh, amount of communication, or what you can try to do in some smart way, you can try to limit the number of devices that will communicate, and what that smart way might be, you can think about like how to kind of figure out which clients might have uh, updates that are uh, more important than others, but still uh, respecting the privacy of the clients. Now, another issue, and that's something that we're going to look at uh, later more in detail, is the system heterogeneity. So the thing with system heterogeneity is, like when you train in this uh, ferret uh, network, a lot of the clients might be either unreliable or very heterogeneous. So, and this vast heterogeneity is also one of the key challenges when you want to deploy and train these models in, in kind of in this wild. So remedies that uh, you can here uh, incorporate is try to kind of devise the algorithms that would be uh, struggless re resilient, meaning that like if you have some clients that uh, kind of fall behind the, the training schedule, you can still allow them to update the global model later. Also very popular here is the asynchronous updates, but here the, uh, the challenge with the asynchronous updates is usu that usually and once you have asynchronous updates, it's much harder to guarantee privacy. Or another thing is like when you have uh, the devices that are not able to compute and even uh, like a store with, or work with the model, then you can just simply uh, drop them. All right, another challenge that also quite prevalent with uh, federated learning and maybe not a very standard in, uh, in standard centralized learning is uh, client availability. So when we talk about this cross uh, device for the learning, uh, what is the standard consideration is that in order not to um, reduce the user experience, you only participate in training when you are connected to fast network. Also, you're connected to the charger. And also with you, there is a large number of devices connected because uh, we want to kind of hide your updates such that 
uh, your privacy doesn't suffer. And with this, essentially, it creates uh, quite non-trivial constraints. And uh, with that, you have actually a lot of variations that might be undesired, meaning that they actually can kind of break uh, your optimization algorithm. And this is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, another issue with uh, generally like with deploying uh, faith learning systems onto devices is the fact that uh, like systems uh, are really not very mature. So for instance, kind of what's already happening for quite a long time is actually on device inference. So that's already deployed in uh, many devices, but the full kind of federated learning loop is still kind of a work in progress, but it's, uh, we are kind of moving towards there. And uh, nowadays there is actually a couple of providers already allow to run like a forward and backward on the, uh, on the devices. Another issue is uh, the issue of, of limited labels. So uh, while we do have, like when you think about your mobile phone, like you do have a lot of, let's say text, a lot of uh, photos that maybe uh, we can train on. But the thing with that is there's very few labels. And that's, for instance, one reason uh, if we would go back to kind of these first applications, which was, uh, uh, next word predictions, for, so, uh, for instance, for Gboard. Uh, the thing is, there you don't need labels, and this is why kind of the first applications of fairy learning was uh, for next word prediction. Now, uh, so line of work that people are looking at is how to incorporate semi supervised learning while exploiting the data structure within the federated learning, how to actually incentivize clients to label data. Um, and then, okay, and then we can talk about personalization. So now the first thing about uh, federated learning is that we might be actually training on very different kind of, within the clients, we might have very different subset of data. And then the question is uh, whether the kind of a global model, which is kind of standard way of doing federated learning, is the right thing to do. So. With, let's say when we look at this application right here, which would be next word prediction, that's very much depend on the context and of the users. So here, that would be not a case. So what the so, so kind of a possible direction for the research and, and things that people are looking at is how to incorporate kind of a meta learning approaches into federated learning. There's actually a lot of work on trying to kind of link federated learning and meta learning together. And also uh, how to kind of discover kind of uh, interesting structures within uh, our kind of a uh, federated network by looking at the clustering or some kind of a balance between local and global model, where by local you mean you kind of think, you can think about that as a model that trained purely on the kind of a distribution of the data that you only see locally and globally, that would be the global distribution. And then other kind of popular subset of the uh, federated learning is uh, split learning. Another kind of a very important issue that maybe was not discussed at kind of the rise of the federated learning or when it was originally introduced is uh, privacy guarantees. So the thing with this is while we have by construction that the data, they actually never leave the device, we do not have any formal guarantees that from the updates that we sent, even though they are aggregated and there is like a lot of techniques to make them uh, kind of private, we do not have, or we did not have originally, formal guarantees that fairy to learning does not introduce any privacy loss. And also when you think about that, essentially uh, you cannot have zero privacy loss if you have the learning. So, and then also uh, there was a couple of works that essentially showed that even when you do uh, faded learning in a very, uh, in a way that you try to have very focused updates, you uh, average or aggregate over many clients, still, if you're smart, then privacy leaks are possible. And this is where remedies such as uh, general cryptography comes. So that, that's more like a kind of having a system uh, more safe. But when we talk about true privacy of the client, that's where uh, differential privacy pops up. 
And for those of you who are not familiar with differential privacy, so what differential privacy uh, generally says that uh, kind of the uh, informal definition is that if I train the model and if you use my data or do not use my data, the actually output of that model doesn't change much. And by how much change, that's essentially like, but by the upper bound, how much it can change, that's the guarantee that you have in respect of uh, differential privacy. Now, another uh, issue that uh, comes with affinity learning is that essentially we can think about affinity learning as a collaboration among many mu and potentially mutually untrusted clients. So it's very easy target uh, for poisoning, and you can think about that essentially because everything is open, uh, you might have a competition, people might be training uh, the similar model, so there is incentive to kind of destroy your competitive model. So when designing the uh, for the learning algorithm that you're going to deploy in a while, you have to be aware of that. And uh, but thankfully, so in order to kind of prevent that, there are uh, several defense mechanisms that um, can at least remedy uh, this poisoning attacks. Now, the last thing that I want to discuss is about the challenges is uh, this intensive incentives to participate. So. Uh, when we think about like why would I even kind of give you my data to uh, to participate in this like very learning uh, training, uh, that's something that has to be somehow clearly defined. Also with respect to label, so for instance, like your model would improve if I label the data, but why would I do that? Also uh, with a local training, there is a cost incurred with like energy, privacy, and so on. And also, another, like the last issue is also whether I do even benefit from the federation. Now, also, that's kind of from the point of a client, but from the point of this kind of orchestrator, we also would like to know, like, what's your contribution? So, uh, do you even contribute to federation? Like, by not having your data, do I have any benefit? Uh, and our issues comes with, like, the ownership of the model. So, who actually, like, owns the model? Is it the community? Or is it some kind of this global uh, service provider? And this actually opens up a very interesting question, especially if you work on economics. So in general, we already have kind of a, when we talk about these um, three edges, which is computer science, economic, and statistics, we have already like a lot of discipline when it comes to um, when it comes to the intersection of two, such as the economics plus computer science would be algorithmic game theory, then statistics with computer science is essentially the basics of machine learning, statistics plus econometrics, uh, statistics plus economics, econometrics. But the thing is, when we look in the middle, so this is where we kind of see the affinity or collaborative learning when addressing all of these issues. So with this, I hope that I at least a bit persuade you that uh, federated learning presents kind of a new realm of unique complex challenges. Uh, when we want to overcome these, we must devise some kind of a system aware efficient optimization techniques. And uh, the key area to focus is uh, optimization theory, networking and scheduling techniques. And with this, uh, in the hope that these techniques will help streamline this data processing and improve our performance and therefore enhance the overall effectiveness of federated learning models. All right, so that was kind of, uh, that was the first part. And now the second part that I want to focus on is uh, this decomposable models. Now uh, with this, I would like to start with the motivation. So our motivation comes from like a very popular uh, linear algebra techniques that are widely used in machine learning, such as principal component analysis and uh, singular value decompositions. So why, why these are very popular? Because they can give you uh, dimensional reduction, noise reduction, you can extract features, and also you can comp uh, significantly improve your computational efficiency. And now the question that we start with is what it can, we can make kind of a PCA or SVD version of neural networks. So in order to answer that question, let me first kind of try to look at uh, the SVD, how we could potentially represent that as a neural network. So if you look at 
this decomposition right here, uh, then how we can uh, how we can have it as a narrow network is we can consider the narrow network that has uh, two, uh, one hidden layer uh, without any activation, without any bias, that would essentially represent this mapping. Now, the nice thing that you can know about that is like if we do uh, this kind of a pruning within this hidden layer, then what you can get, you can get uh, the singular value, uh, the SVD, but the reduced SVD, where we only keep uh, the first, uh, let's say here, two singular vectors, and so on and so forth. Now, so this at least kind of gives us the good example that kind of we can represent this uh, matrix factorization uh, within the neural networks. Now, maybe the most interesting part is whether we can actually learn this. And the thing is that we can, so uh, if we just define kind of general matrix decomposition, we can define it as a uh, following optimization problem. Now, if you want to retransform it into SVD, then what you can, I mean, SVD would essentially solve uh, this problem individually for each kind of uh, each rank K. So here, this one means uh, the first K columns of matrix U. Now, the nice thing with that, you can even put it all together. So you can have it as a summation across all the ranks. Uh, I mean, summation, the nice thing about summation, summation you can represent with like an expectation. And once you see this, and you're already kind of familiar with what we do when we have like many terms um, in machine learning, what you can do, you can just simply apply SGD, and that leads to our construction of what we call uh, the order dropout. So essentially what we show that essentially if you define your problem in this way, you apply SGD, but SGD not in the data points, you essentially like apply SGD to the models, then you can actually learn uh, SVD with a standard kind of uh, machine learning training loop. And also the nice thing about that, if you're kind of interested in optimization, you can still see this problem as an overparameterized problem, although even it's kind of a nut, but because the gradient at the optimum, even for each subproblems, are zero. Now, how do you, like, so how does this look in practice? So in practice, what we do is, like, if we were about to learn the, let's say, like, SVD, so we would apply this, uh, our order dropout techniques in the, in the hidden layer, and what in each step we do, we have some distribution uh, over the width. In each step, we sample the width, and that's the number of neurons that we, uh, that we keep. So essentially, that's why we call it dropout, and not the dropout because it's preserved uh, uh, the natural order of the neurons. Now, the nice thing about that is that here you can recover, I mean, with this construction, as I saw, you can recover SVD as a special case. So for SVD, if you have your mapping between the data and the output to be linear, and then you sample your data from the uniform ball, that essentially you can say uh, that the training loop, like the standard training loop uh, with this network, without the dropout, recover uh, SVD as a special case, and that's, that's what I have here. So essentially you see that across any of these uh, like submatrices, so here that would be essentially this rank uh, K matrix, that it converges to the best uh, K rank approximation of the matrix A uh, within the single loop. And it's also within the sampling. So we do not need to evaluate with respect to every single uh, matrix, but we can just sample one at a time. Now also, uh, you can re uh, recover PCA with this, uh, in this very kind of a similar scenario, where the only difference is that now I'm gonna sample uniformly at random uh, from my data set, but the thing is the mapping between the uh, features and the labels, essentially the, that's uh, the same thing here. And what you can see, so here the example that we have here is we only have the data to come from like the three-dimensional space and you can see that the quickly the network uh, discovers that and essentially provides you this, uh, provides you with this three uh, principal components and uh, zero out the rest. Okay, and then in general case, 
that's, I'm not going to discuss much about that, but essentially if we talk about this general uh, case for these linear networks, that it's something in between, uh, what it does is essentially does PCA on the transform data set by that mapping A. Now, how do we generalize that to neural networks? That essentially uh, comes or boils down to these uh, two works that I'm going to present. So first is uh, titled Fair and Accurate Federated Learning on the Heterogeneous Targets, where we're going to use the order dropout. And this is essentially the work where we introduce this notion of order dropout. So first, let me acknowledge uh, my collaborators here, Steve, Mario, Stelios, Ilias, and Nick. So uh, just to remind you the problem that we're trying to solve here is we're trying to look at uh, heterogeneous devices. So uh, we want to address uh, the issue of having uh, different tiers of devices uh, within our training. But uh, we do want to avoid this kind of a standard uh, construction where uh, when you look at federated loop in general, that dividedly accepted norm is that the model uh, that you have, so all the local models, everything that you're going to deploy has to have exactly the same architecture with the global model. So and in order to achieve that, you can drop low tier devices or essentially limit the global model uh, size in order to accommodate all your clients. Now, uh, the drawbacks or of, of those approaches that I just discussed is first, when you drop low tier devices, you might have very limited participation. And also, uh, now, ferrite learning as kind of training on very, also not just like heterogeneous devices, but very heterogeneous data. So by, uh, by limit dropping low tier devices, you actually might lose a very important part of your data set. Uh, and therefore have a lot of bias due to unseen data. Also, by, and then by limiting the global model size, you might actually degrade performance for uh, high tier devices. Now what will be our goals and what we want to achieve with this work is we want to have a fairness in participation, meaning that every single client can participate. And also we want to have very competitive performance, meaning that uh, all devices should have as good performance as possible considering their local or network constraints. Now, how do we achieve that? So, uh, I mean, very kind of naive way is first we're just going to simply drop uh, this assumption that every single client needs to run or store the same global model. And what we're going to do is for these lower tier devices, we're going to deploy uh, the thinner models. I'll, I'll show you how we do it uh, later where the model, uh, the width that we're going to deploy will uh, depend dynamically on the local network and network constraints. That might be memory, computational capabilities, load, battery level, or uh, let's say limited bandwidth. So and how do we achieve that? It's exactly through uh, the order dropout that I just discussed. So uh, here, so if we have a general network as, as the one on the left, then what we can do is uh, we can apply our order dropout technique in the following way. So what we're going to do, we define a set of relative submodel width. So these are numbers between 0 and 1. And we define distribution over those width. And what we're going to do in each step, in each step, we're going to sample from the distribution. And based on the width, we're going to kind of apply that left, uh, width limitation into every layer, but the input and output layer to keep uh, the structure of the network unchanged. Now, uh, just to give you kind of a brief motivation or, or, or the, uh, how this relates to kind of a standard random dropout. So uh, for order dropout, the motivation is not necessarily only regularization, but the motivation is that once we apply this technique, we kind of enforce as much knowledge as possible towards the left of the network. While the standard random dropout, the motivation is to prevent codependence of the neurons. And also another kind of a difference between the random dropout and order dropout is that our inference is exact, while random dropout has uh, inexact yeah. inference where you kind of, uh, where you just approximate the uh, ensemble with, with, with a simple average of weights. So those are kind of the, the main differences. Now, just to show you like one example, so consider this is our network right here. So we have the sampling, let's say that sampling uh, sample 0.4, 0 
that means we keep 40% of uh, each uh, hidden layer that and which here yields two neurons per each uh, hidden layer that that we consider and then once we're going to deploy or train then we can uh, accommodate the width of the network based on the tier of the device that we are about to deploy to now how do we apply this uh, into kind of a federated learning training loop so the construction is following so we have a set of our devices uh, we're going to first have take we take the architecture we take a set of the width that we want to train on our model and also the distribution of the width that we want to sample from uh, here example is for instance like let's look at uh, cypher 10 on resnet so we might have a file width that we want to train on and you can see that essentially uh, leads to different number of max and parameters per network across different width and what we're going to do for the devices we essentially split them into uh, several tiers and then what we're going to do each tier is assign with the p max value which is essentially m the maximal width that uh, those uh, devices might work with uh, while respecting the constraints now what we're going to do then for a, like kind of a single communication route or, or single training step of our uh, freighted training uh, as standard we're just going to select the devices to participate based on the constraints that i discussed uh, then for each device we send the model that corresponds to its uh, p max so the maximum width that it can work with now it perform local steps but uh, with the order dropout in order to kind of uh, train across all the width that it's capable to train on just because to get the uh, proper solution to get this kind of a decomposable network as I uh, described before once we have this uh, they obtain uh, they obtain the update of the model that's just communicating back and then the server aggregates this is kind of in this non-uniform manner in a sense we just aggregate over the client for the given neuron or the for a given set of width we aggregate over the clients that essentially updated it and then for the inference you just deploy based on the device capabilities now one of the nice thing because you already have the model that uh, train like that that's actually decomposable is that even after deployment imagine that uh, now we take this device from the higher tier even if this phase uh, we can then scale the model dynamically during the inference for instance like if that model has current increase or like has decreased battery level or increased load then in order to kind of perform within the constraint we can just simply uh, decrease the size of the model because we train it in this uh, decomposable manner okay so let me show you some of the experiments so here okay so that's strange so here the the one on the right I'm going to focus on, on the cipher only so here what we did essentially we're going to just use the same training setup as for this model right here and what we're going to do we're just going to train it uh, with the order dropout and what are this uh, red squares right here that's a uh, that's a model that's optimized and trained from the scratch uh, within uh, so, so here the red models essentially what you have you have uh, five different trainings while this one the orange one is uh, hours just training by a single loop uh, based on the hyperparameters of the the bigger model and what you can see essentially performance is more or less on par and we believe like with the tuning if kind of like a regularization hits in that if you would tune a bit of parameter then you can actually have even better performance than uh, just train model strains from the scratch uh, now another thing is what uh, might be uh, maybe a bit uh, or what somebody might say that essentially like okay do we really learn uh, the meaningful uh, decomposition of the model and one way to check it we take uh, our model trained with order dropout and we just compare it to the model that was trained only for a full width and we're going to obtain with like random dropout we're going to obtain the models that have the same number of parameters as our model with order dropout and look at its performance just kind of to double check that it's not 
just some kind of uh, implicit property of a general training that you would discover that essentially like any model of that with your sample would have the same performance. And here you essentially see very huge drop. That even if you take like 40% of the network width, then essentially that corresponds pretty much to random guess, but we can still do more than 90%. Yeah, apologies that it seems that from the Mac to Windows doesn't like some uh, figures. So here, uh, the next thing that also want to link here that's that's a nice property of the order dropout is that you can actually increase the granularity of the width that you train on so when we go from the uniform grid uh, of size 5 to uniform grid of size 10 then essentially you can see that the performance across the intersecting width uh, very well intersects and uh, and then once we actually going to deploy this uh, into trade learning there where we see the best increase in the performance where uh, the reason is that essentially the only available baseline at the time of this work was to kind of consider that in order to accommodate the clients that cannot run the given model we just when we train the model on that given client we're just going to apply random dropout and that's that's the way how we're going to match the concern of the client but with that uh, you can actually see if you're trying to train the larger and larger models, you actually might see the decrease in the performance. While for us, you can see the steady increase of a performance, meaning that the, the more uh, compute power or more like parameters you can store, the actually the better, better model you can get. And this is also just to double check that the scalability also transfer uh, to the federated learning. Now what I'm going to discuss quickly is uh, this uh, next work that also is based on uh, on the order dropout where this kind of motivation or kind of usage of the order dropout is, uh, is slightly different. So again to acknowledge my collaborators is Steve, Shashang and Hongi. Uh, so what's the main challenge that we're trying to overcome here is actually how to uh, train large deep models or like how to make kind of training of large, uh, small deep models kind of equivalent to train large deep models. And if we look at the standard problems with training large deep models, uh, particularly those one with billions or millions of parameters, there is energy consumption, resource demands, and data requirements. Now, uh, so the thing is like, why do we actually train large models? The reason is that they perform so well. Uh, the reason for that is this is a still kind of active area of research, might be due to implicit regularization, meaning that the uh, model biases towards the simple solutions and also smoothness in the last scape, so it's actually easy to optimize larger models than smaller ones. Uh, now what would be our goals is whether we can kind of keep the benefit of training larger models, why are we actually going to train smaller models? And then the aim is to design models that can maintain high performance while significantly reducing the size of computational requirements. And how are we going to do it? We're going to do it uh, through uh, order dropout. And we're going to try to discover some kind of low dimensional structures via this efficient decomposition. And by low dimensional structures here, I mean a low rung of the weight that's based on the prior work that essentially ob uh, observed that that's kind of a one good notion of low dimensionality. All right, and how are we going to do it? Essentially, we already see that uh, with order dropout is kind of connected to the decompositions. So what we're going to do is, like, if we have original mapping m times n, we, uh, we transform it into factorized mapping, we'll try to decompose it, uh, try to essentially remove the zeros, and that's how we get the low-rung approximation. And how we make this kind of low-rung approximation nice and trainable, uh, this is the way uh, how we design it with the order dropout. So let's have this, our original network. What we're going to do, like, within the each layer, we're going to input the, net, uh, the layer that has an inner dimension of a minimum of these two uh, uh, layers, then what we're going to do, we're just going to input this as a like factorized layer where we're going to deploy order dropout in this factorized layer. The order dropout here doesn't have any uh, bias or uh, any activation. And then what we're going to do for training, for training now our sampling is going to be a bit different. What we're going to do, is we're going to sample one layer at a time. So here, that might be the first one. And we're going to sample its rank. 
So this is essentially in each step the network that we're going to evaluate. And the reason for that is to essentially learn an efficient factorization of this layer that we can later prune. And that factorization is essentially the one that should account the data and should account the structure of network as well. Now that essentially, these are the main component of the method that we propose here called Maestro. So uh, just to walk you through the algorithm, so what we do here, so essentially this first part right here is just an order dropout. So this is just a sampling and obtaining the uh, prune network. And then something that I didn't discuss. So in order to have essentially low ranks, we somehow have to enforce it. And one good way to enforce low rank is uh, lasso penalty. And because we have a natural ordering, we can do group lasso. And then the last thing to actually have a good adaptive pruning, to, so to actually prune as we train, uh, we have this condition right here. So essentially what, what it tells, like once the network discovers that I don't need certain ranks, I'm just going to simply drop it. Uh, now let me quickly walk you through the experiments. So essentially what uh, this table tells you that essentially with any other method that does uh, low, rank uh, low rank approximation with just standard SPD, but not the decomposition that's uh, essentially tailored to the data and the network, uh, we do much better and we can do much uh, sparse networks as well. Uh, then also, uh, what I want to show here, that essentially it's uh, here, the, the one in the middle, uh, what we display here is the ranks per layer uh, for a different uh, group loss of penalties. And what you can actually see here that it might be not that the network learns only decomposition within the layer, or but also some global decomposition. Because the thing here is that by increasing the group loss of penalty, you always get a subset of the original network. Uh, another thing, just kind of a sanity check, when we compare, like when we kind of design a pruning technique, because again, you get a decomposition. So even uh, with having a network, you can do post-training uh, pruning because you have decomposed network already. We can compare it to SVD, which is kind of a naive linear approximation. Uh, when we go for the decomposition, so we can see that we do much better there. And also another interesting thing is that uh, we actually don't need to kind of look for a good uh, pruning technique. What we can actually do, we can just look, oh, what's the other networks found? And I'll try to replicate that. And it actually works relatively well. OK, so uh, I'll just have two more slides just to summarize that we discussed two main uh, or one of the two key challenges in federated learning. One is the efficient training and inference and heterogeneous devices. We looked at uh, order dropout as a technique that would enable the composition of networks. And we introduced these two techniques to exploit uh, order dropout as Fjord and Maestro. And some uh, other interesting application of order dropout that we're looking at right now is the automatic rank selection for LoRa, some model alignment, one chart architectures, and also network consolidation. So with this, uh, let me conclude and thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks a lot, Sam, for this uh, amazing talk. Colleagues, uh, do we have questions? Thank you for a great presentation. My question about cybersecurity and privacy of federated learning. Uh, what's the future of federated learning? Is it, uh, for example, integration with edge AI and quantum cryptography and something else? What else there should be done to be it more efficient and more private and for more secure? Oh, so yeah, thank you for your question. That's, that's a very good question. So, I, I mean, the main thing is, I mean, uh, in terms of like when you ask about like privacy, I mean we can make it as private as we want, right? The the, the thing with that is like you want you, what you want to actually achieve is best kind of accuracy or performance privacy trade off. So that's one of the main challenge because I mean always like you just don't need to communicate, you don't need to care about any any, any privacy whatsoever. Like you just kind of I keep my data private, never communicate that. That's so that has a perfect privacy, but essentially zero utility. So there is really like the main challenge that people are looking at is right now, like how to, uh, first of all, it actually turns out that it's even in this kind of a federated network, it's highly non-trivial to even train without any privacy constraint. 
just as I introduced the ferrated mining, that's still kind of a non-trivial task. Then when you add uh, like formal privacy guarantees on top of that, that introduce the extra layer of challenge, and there is a lot of work going on on to like how to find the optimal trade-off between the utility and privacy. So that's that's kind of the main thing. But you can deploy it essentially anywhere where you collect the private data, or where you not collect private data, but where you want to actually train on the private data. Uh, hi, thank thank you again for a great talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, could we expect? Uh, at some time, some I don't know unified framework for doing that, like hug and face. It will say like you know combined all this, and from the user perspective, you just check a model. Could we expect something similar for federated learning? Because you have mentioned a lot of frameworks, and they are kind of independent to each other. So, yeah. what's the reason? It's it's like still under progress, or yes, I like pretty much. I mean, that's the the, the main two frameworks. I mean, they kind of like uh, where I think. I mean, they're also. Uh, both of them like startups and one of the kind of main goal for them is to provide kind of like unify one-stop shop for faculty learning. That's good. Thank you for my, uh, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, so uh, my question is about, uh, as I understand, uh, there are several approaches uh, which uh, helps you to um, make uh, training process more efficient. And uh, you show some graphics on ResNet, as far as I remember, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and uh, on ResNet, we have uh, um, approximately no drop in accuracy, approximately no drop in score. Um, my question is, uh, the result of this good score is a result of uh, some of these approaches, or you uh, apply one, for example, um, dropout uh, or um, matrix approximation of the layer? Yeah, so, so I mean, essentially, I mean, that's the, I mean, the ones where you do not essentially lose any accuracy. I mean, what we kind of show here, I think that's the, the, the one, this is the one that you point out to. Yeah, so essentially what we show here that, I mean, first of all, like if you kind of do things well, you can kind of improve tiny a bit. Yeah. Mm, yes, so so essentially, I mean, that's when kind of a regularization kicks in, like the standard thing that you would expect to get with the decomposition that you remove a noise. And then we, we show like you can actually, like if you really care about, like you trying to push the number of parameters smaller and smaller, like you, you can still do that by just increasing this uh, like uh, sparsity penalty. Uh, okay, so am I understand correctly that uh, this uh, uh, table um, show, uh, shows the approach of regularization? Yes, so it's, I mean, regularization plus pruning, right? Thank yeah. you. Okay. Dear colleagues, I think that we are a bit running out of time because next sessions uh, should already start. So I suggest that if you have any more questions to Sam, that you just approach him like during coffee break. And Something like that. So let us thank Sam again. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to present uh, a joint work. Uh, mostly work has been done by uh, Ozge uh, Sevgili. Uh, so she is a uh, PhD student at the uh, University of Hamburg. And also uh, this work um, is with some collaborators also from Hamburg and uh, uh, in the Institute of Technology. Uh, so uh, the work uh, is about the task of ultrafine entity typing. Uh, so what is entity typing and uh, ultrafine entity uh, uh, typing is? Uh, consider this example. Uh, you have this uh, Olympic National Park. And this is a mention. Uh, many of you know about uh, entity linking task, and uh, this is when you take a certain mention, and then you need to, to link this mention uh, to a knowledge graph, to a knowledge base, let's say Wikidata or Wikipedia. So you assume then uh, in Wikipedia there is a specific uh, page uh, about Olympic National Park, and uh, then it's, it's quite useful to link uh, these because you can uh, harvest, uh, get all the information from uh, Wikidata about this national park, maybe attributes, mentions, description, and so on. Now, the reality is uh, even the biggest knowledge graphs, um, uh, they, uh, due to in inherent, let's say, power law of distribution or scarcity of the data, they cannot cover everything. So I remember this case, then uh, there is this uh, BubbleNet uh, database, 
uh, like uh, knowledge graph. And if you look for word Python, uh, there are about 50 census of the word Python, and uh, there are like uh, two roller coaster parks, one in Germany, another in the United States, in Florida somewhere. And that actually gives you an idea that you, even if you, no matter how hard you try, uh, there will be always this uh, gap. Uh, there, there will be always uh, the long tail of some entities which just nobody even or, or either cared to enter in a knowledge graph or actually mm, yeah, ne never managed to um, insert in there. So that's why entity type income uh, to rescue then you just uh, label uh, with certain hyponym and like is a relation and then you can still get a certain idea of what it mentioned is, even if it's um, not inside the knowledge graph. Now, uh, inside this area, there are different uh, granularities because you can, let's say, uh, this is a park or uh, this is a location or geographical area, uh, or maybe you, you can say this is an Olympic park, right? So th there are really um, also a hard question what kind of granularity um, uh, you, you need to take and this talk we speak about a uh, case when you deal with uh, pretty high granularity. So you, you, you speak about uh, like uh, tens of thousands of um, census or uh, labels, but th then um, the task is relatively easy when you take, let's say, 100 or 50 different types, then you can collect easily a lot of data. Now, but this information might be not so specific, not so useful for different applications. And the problem with ultra fine typing, uh, when you deal with a large vocabulary, uh, is then it starts to get again um, hitting this problem of scarcity of the data. So you don't have the, this amount of label and of data. And people uh, try to come up uh, with different ways with this problem. And um, one of the approach, uh, maybe not the most uh, successful even, but but still uh, interesting. Uh, I hope. Uh, I will present today. Now, that's unsupervised approach so that we don't use certain uh, manual annotated data, rather we use distributional semantics and uh, let's say bottom-up approach um, uh, to do it. How people also approach this problem? Uh, well, um, people try to use the distance supervision. So, okay, for, for this entity type, I think what people try to do, uh, they try to think, hey, where can I just get the data uh, for free? Uh, where they do uh, where the data occur uh, you might get uh, entity link in uh, data sets and for an entity link uh, you can um, look in the knowledge base and see hey, what, what what is the um, hyponym of this entity and then use it maybe um, generate several hyponyms uh, this is a common uh, approach to let's say automatically generate uh, such kind of uh, data sets uh, people also just try to explain well, they use something like Hearst partner, so rule-based approach uh, to extract these ESA relations from text. Let's say I say a sentence like uh, such cars as Mercedes, BMW, and Audi, um, they are expensive and luxur luxurious. Well, that would be like a, a second approach, uh, but um, uh, there are also some approaches which use uh, zero-shot and unsupervised uh, techniques, uh, again, to avoid this, this bottleneck. But what we are trying to do, uh, so, so we are trying to leverage uh, unsupervised, uh, induced word census uh, using this uh, job and text framework, uh, which is based on distribution semantics, and uh, it contains not only uh, distributional representations of words, but also distributional representations of word census, labels with hyponyms. Uh, and uh, what we actually do in this work, uh, we try to see how, how much uh, useful these uh, hyponym labels uh, to the task of Entity typing and so I'm surprised entity typing. So we try to disambiguate uh, the context with respect to this uh, induced census. So what, what, how it actually works? Uh, so really, at the core of this approach, uh, a repository of these uh, uh, distributionally induced census. So um, th these are coming from this job and text framework, and. Um, you can uh, look at uh, this paper and this paper just for, for the background work. So this is not what, what has been proposed in this work, but, but rather uh, like infrastructure which, which we are using. Um, 
And what it proposes for every word, uh, you have, uh, let's say in this case, is word Rennes. So Rennes might be uh, a city in France. Uh, so in this case, you see this first cluster, let's say Lille, Montpellier, Montpellier and uh, other variations of uh, Rennes. But uh, you also have this football club, uh, well, basically, um, this football club uh, has a different hypernym. And here you see these labels um, for ESA labels, uh, like club uh, will be the common uh, ESA label for one sense, for uh, German sense, and the city is a hypernym, is a label uh, for this sense. And well, basically, the magic of this is that uh, none of this is uh, done using human labor. Instead, um, how, how, how are people actually obtain this table? Uh, first, you, you obtain something like a word to vec distributionally um, you know, uh, related words, and then you perform clustering, and then you group these words, obtain these clusters of words. But again, you don't have hypernyms. But how uh, hypernyms are obtained? Every word uh, is assigned a list of automatically induced uh, Hypernames, let's say using these uh, uh, patterns. And then these counts correspond to uh, common hypernames for this cluster. Let's say uh, this is a noisy procedure. So, of course, uh, this term will contain a lot of hypernames, but the common hypernames will actually uh, pop up at the top. So, that's actually the trick how you get a relatively clean hypernames uh, here at the top. So, CT or club. Uh, they will be common hypernyms for a lot of these distribution related cities because they are all cities, right? They might be even some noisy, noisy, noisy words, but still. Okay, but but this is what uh, what we are kind of leveraging, what kind of using. Now, uh, how method works? Uh, well, you have this uh, input, and always you have, of course, a certain mention you need to assign the hypernym to in context. So you need to disambiguate this. Um, and this becomes your uh, sense repository when um, the, the rest is very simple, actually. Uh, so you vectorize the context using uh, Esbert representation and you vectorize the mention uh, because it also contains the word rents, but by itself contains certain information. And then you vectorize uh, these guys as well using, of course, the same vectorizer. So they, they can be, a certain similarity competition can be done. And basically, the rest is just picking the most uh, most relevant uh, cluster and picking hypernames from it uh, to label it. Uh, here, uh, of course, uh, a few um, additional steps apply. So uh, if you go for real data sets uh, for entity typing, you see not just a new words, but something like this. Uh, so, mentions might be really long, might be really ex um, elaborate, and even if you obtain sense inventory in, in this bottom-up way from the text corpus, there might be no sense uh, representations or mentions for, for this kind of uh, multi-word expression. So that's why a head words, a lot of um, additional post-processing or pre-processing are done, so head words are collected. Uh, so, or so different words, uh, keywords uh, from from these missions might be collected, and then uh, candidates for census they are um, obtained from, from from these, not uh, necessarily from from the exact mention. Of course, also certain other steps like uh, singularization of the hypernames, uh, and the mentions are done. So, uh, matching might be done more smoothly. But essentially, uh, 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 as soon as uh, all of these uh, normalizations, linguistic normalizations are done, uh, well, uh, you perform this vectorization of the context, uh, and you compare um, the context vector with uh, candidates prototypes uh, for different senses, uh, and you pick um, uh, the most appropriate um, hypernyme label. So the experiment-wise, what uh, what has been done, uh, uh, we, we took the setup of Choi et al., uh, which was uh, this paper, and compared to it and to some other um, uh, baselines. Baselines, the first baseline was just to pick the first cluster for a given word or pick a random cluster. So this means um, picking something. Uh, so, so this uh, is a very important baseline in every word and distribution task. Uh, it's called uh, most frequent sense baseline. Why it's important? Because uh, of the distribution again, so most words uh, are used uh, in the dominant sense, and of course, 
the largest cluster or first cluster in this case uh, will have dominant sense, and this this is kind of considered always a strong base. Like random cluster is just pick a, a random sense, and then um, uh, choose it all. Well, uh, this is approach uh, which uh, rely on um, encoding with a bidirectional STM CNN and uh, train certain uh, multitask objective, and um, also some other um, approaches ba based on uh, mask language model uh, and uh, NLI uh, were considered. Of course, uh, there are uh, quite a few moving parts in this method, uh, so you can uh, select headwords differently, uh, you can uh, singularize uh, these this different words, mentions differently. Uh, here, an entity linking in principle, the way actually how do you yield candidates maybe is more important than the kind of a neural network you use. This is, uh, my, many studies show this, and um, because this is a similar study, um, this is not a difference. If you do, if you in some entity linking business or this kind of uh, entity typing business, the way how do you select mention, how do you match it, it's very important. How do you generate candidates? Um, okay. Uh, of course, uh, some parameters uh, correspond to uh, job tax itself. Uh, for job tax, is is a fixed, uh, let's say, granularity of clustering. So clustering can be the, be fine or uh, more coarse grain. So you you can have for different words, let's say for Jaguar, you can have three senses or you can have ten senses. And uh, of course, they might be also different, more noisy, less noisy, and so on and so forth. Uh, here, of course, the uh, last uh, parameter uh, where we will take into account, and it's important one, is a number of predictions. So you can take only first uh, hyponym, or you can take uh, more hyponyms, like the first uh, five or ten. Uh, here, you can just return to this example. So uh, first, uh, second, third um, labels, they seem to be relevant, but if you go down the list, uh, this is just an um, automatically created list, and of course, you, you hit at some point where uh, they will be like a very noisy hyponyms, which, which correspond to some very generic or, or, or irrelevant senses. All right, uh, so, so here is a table with results. So uh, first of all, we see that indeed uh, first cluster uh, and uh, random cluster, um, they, they relatively strong baselines. Mm, so you can, uh, but, but uh, the method itself is actually outperforming uh, these baselines. So actually, it does a certain certain disambiguation uh, consistently. However, uh, the results from the literature are pretty strong and based on, on these uh, other approaches. So in the end, what uh, a kind of um, a contribution of this work uh, managed to do is to, in combination with the approach of Choi, uh, the method uh, yields certain improvements. So basically, uh, itself, uh, the methods show that um, the clusters are pretty noisy, so just using the method by itself uh, yield quite noisy results. But it yields some additional uh, information, uh, and if you combine this with a method of Choi, especially taking only a few predictions, so you see here the precision really uh, drops quite significantly if you take first uh, hyponym or second, three, first five, first seven, so precision drops, but, but recall, of course, uh, increase uh, with time. So uh what actually worked much better uh is also to drop in pronouns what is the reason why uh if you combine uh with pronouns uh if, if you work with pronouns it doesn't really work well the reason very simple uh think of uh pronouns like it um uh, if you have senses even if you have some senses several senses of the word it or she he um hyponyms of the senses will be completely meaningless and uh if you take uh, some mention in context and you have um, something like uh, mention it, well, uh, th th there is no way to co correctly generate uh, candidates for this. So that's why if you take setup without pronouns, uh, this, this boost actually for ultra fine uh, setup ca can be obtained, like, like you see here. Uh, but uh, that's kind of summarized in this picture. If you don't, uh, if uh, you consider pronouns, um, the results more or less will stay the same. Uh, but this additional information coming from distribution uh, labels, they're useful um, in, in, in setup without pronouns. Okay. So, so in this case, uh, slight improvement of F score uh, were improved. Um, and of course, there are certain errors in, in the method you can uh, see here. Uh, this is what um, was generated, and uh, these are kind of 
two predictions. So for instance, uh, you see uh, the method generated something like a violation difficulty for this mention, but the true uh, label was like a crime or something. And um, again, you see the task is pretty challenging uh, for real data sets as you have very long uh, mentions. And in this case, the, the method seems to generate quite plausible results, but again, According to human judgment, uh, sometimes these might be some, somehow relevant, but they're also not mentioned in the gold standard. Okay, uh, so the summary of this talk is like this. Uh, we explored uh, how, uh, how information from Jobim text from unsupervisedly uh, induced word census can be used for the task of unsupervised uh, for um, entity typing. It seems that uh, if you don't consider pronouns, results can be improved uh, if combined with a method of choy. Uh, that means um, word senses contain helpful and uh, complementary information. However, um, word senses induced just from text, they are pretty noisy uh, and you need to deal with them with extreme care because also you need to be very careful about how you can data generate. So that's uh, pretty much it. In case you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. And uh, Osge might be um, also on a Zoom link, so in case uh, Osge, you want to say something? Yes, I'm also here. Thanks for the talk. <laughs> So yeah, just uh, just one very simple question. Uh, uh, it seems that all the experiments were done uh, with the English data. So I'm not I'm, I'm not familiar with this job in text uh, framework. So how easy will it be to extend it to other languages? And uh, does it exist for other languages? Uh, yes, it actually exists for um, multiple languages. Um, I am, I'm sure it has support for German, uh, for Russian, uh, for Italian. Mm, not 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 sure uh, how, how long this list is, mm, but yes, I, I think about uh, um, let's say maybe f five to ten languages are supported. And yeah, you can uh, look at the website; they have a nice web demo. You can just uh, enter a word and uh, look up all of these uh, word senses. Actually, it's a snapshot of this demo. Mm, uh, so you, you enter a certain term, select uh, maybe model and language, and you will see something like this. You see this uh, um, automatically induced uh, sense clusters and uh, these labels. Thank you very much. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Maria Maslova, and today I'm going to present a project uh, which title is RUCAM. Comparative argumentative machine for the Russian language. And my colleagues are Irina Nikishina, Stefan Rebrikov, as well as Chris and Sebastian. Uh, so I'm going to speak about uh, quite an important topic uh, the problem of choice. I'm sure that all of you uh, have faced uh, the necessity to choose between iOS and Android, uh, holiday places. Uh, car models, and so on. Uh, and one more topical issue is the choice between cats and dogs. So who is for cats in this auditory? Raise your hands. And for dogs? <laughs> I see. Uh, so in the end of the presentation, uh, we will see how our system uh, responds to this question. So this quite logical uh, to create a sort of system that will help to solve this problem, the problem of choice, uh, with the support of some reliable arguments. Uh, however, um, this task is quite complicated, uh, as it lies concurrently in the field of question answering and argument mining. Still, one of the most known and prominent research in the field is CAM, uh, the system uh, which uh, can answer um, users' uh, comparative input uh, with the support of uh, 
some arguments extracted from uh, the large text corpus. Um, however, CAM is English oriented and there are no analogs for the Russian language. So now we present RUCAM, a system um, aimed at comparing two objects uh, from a general domain in Russian uh, with argumentative explanation. Um, if compared to its predecessor, RUCAM uh, has uh, following, following differences. It allows to work with comparative questions in natural language. It has the component for object and aspect identification from comparative questions, and it uses uh, an elastic search index of open stupid or a crawled aggregated corpus, um, abbreviated OSCAR. Uh, we do not only uh, develop a similar system and a pipeline from an engineering perspective, uh, we also try to uh, pose and answer following research questions. What are the main peculiarities of CAM that need to be taken into account when adapting it to other languages? And one more question, a more specific one, what are the main challenges while adopting CAM specifically to the Russian language? To start answering these questions, let's look at the system design. The process can be split into two steps, uh, question analysis and argument retrieval argument mining. Uh, the first step is about the identification of interrogative and comparative nature of a sentence. Also, it includes um, object and aspect identification process. And uh, the second step um, consists of the search of relevant arguments uh, for the input objects, their classification, and ranking. Let's consider each step in detail. The processing of a request starts with identifying the question type, so whether it is comparative or not. Uh, it can be done in different ways, including a rule-based approach. Um, here we stick to the idea of special patterns uh, in comparative questions, which include comparative forms, explicit mention of comparison, similarity, difference, etc. Uh, to implement some machine learning approaches, we first compile a data set from the sources shown in the table. Um, and here's an example uh, taken from this data set. Uh, then uh, we use a routine bird and fine-tuned bird from another research. As you can see in the table, uh, the letter shows the best results. Uh, but comparative questions are quite specific kind of question that uh, can be can be um, identified um, uh, with with uh, nice quality uh, even using uh, rule based methods. After identifying the question as comparative. Uh, we need to extract objects and optionally aspects to further provide them uh, for the argument retrieval stage. At this step, we also implement several approaches, and including a rule-based one. Um, it is founded on the idea that all requests uh, have certain structure, uh, namely, they consist of, they uh, contain two objects, compared and um, connective of comparative nature between them. Uh, we consider following um, cases, two nouns, two verbs, uh, the combination of noun and adjective, and the combination of a noun and two subordinate adjectives. Also, we expect a connective from the list of conjunctions and uh, um, synthet uh, synthetic words um, expressing comparison between these two objects. In order to create a data set for the task, we take six um, 
thousand sentences from the previous step that have been labeled as comparative and manually annotate them. Three experts in computational linguistics were asked to label the first and the second object an optionally aspect and common object. A common object is a specific structure uh, with um, noun subordinating to adjectives. So, for example, in a sentence, uh, in a phrase, green or black tea, tea is an example of common object. Um, so, the level of uh, annotation agreement is shown uh, when creating the final data set for models fine tuning, we use the annotation version supported by the majority of annotation. And that's one more example, uh, considering our own uh, example, yeah. Um, uh, we use fine tuned transformer encoders and a few short approach on generative transformers uh, to solve object and aspect extraction task. Uh, the table presents uh, the results for each model. We see that generative models perform on par or, or even slightly better uh, than baselines and significantly worse than um, transformer encoders. Still, they may perform much better after proper fine tuning, as we have shown them only five examples. Uh, regarding lower and zero scores for common object and aspect labels, uh, we claim that there are two problems. Uh, the first is the inconsistency of annotation, and the second is uh, is a complex uh, nature of these labels, uh, I'm in semantic, in semantic uh, sense. In order to retrieve arguments in favor of one or the other object, uh, we use open super large uh, crawled aggregated corpus, OSCAR. We use OSCAR instead of the common crawl while disclaimed it's to be its filtered version. Uh, we store and index this data with elastic search when indexing documents, we decide to create two indexes. Um, the first uh, one is it for storing document information, uh, like the number of sentences, uh, web, uh, web link, and so on. And the second uh, is for storing sentences themselves. Uh, to retrieve sentences, we first, used, uh, um, we first uh, do the snowball stamming, not limitization because of the type constraints and then apply uh, wildcards to be able to find all word forms. Uh, we send a Boolean JSON query and require uh, that the clause must appear uh, in matching documents. We consider this step to be uh, the most challenging in all uh, camp pipeline uh, as Russian language um, has a highly fusional morphology uh, which makes it much more difficult to retrieve uh, sentences than in English uh, because uh, query words may uh, occur in any form. And look at the elastic output for our objects, just an example. After the candidate sentences uh, with possible arguments are found, it is necessary to understand whether the sentence argues in favor of the first or the second object. Again, we have a rule-based approach that requires a list of keywords with adjectives and adverbs um, with the meaning of superiority or inferiority uh, of the first object over the second. Also take into account negation cases when the sense of a sentence is reversed. We collect a data set from uh, 140 pairs and amount and annotate them uh, using the Yandex Taloka system for data crowdsourcing. To do this, uh, we select same or similar pairs from the same domains as in English research, English conversion, like programming languages, um, car manufacturers, food, drinks, and so on, uh, and make uh, queries to Elasticsearch uh, to extract all sentences matching the query. Then we create a system of tags. There are three tags. Better tag means that uh, the first item wins over the second. Uh, 
verse tag means that the first item loses, and the tag none means that there is uh, no comparison between uh, the objects we, we are interested in. Um, unfortunately, um, the annotated data set um, is uh, highly imbalanced, as 75% uh, of sentences belong to none, and for example, only 9% belong to the worst tag. At this step, we also implement several transformer encoders and a few short approaches with generative transformers. Uh, the results for comparative, um, comparative uh, sentences um, classification are inconsistent and relatively low for all the models uh, due to the class imbalance problem. It is interesting uh, that the rule-based approach produces a quite decent result on um, better uh, better, um, better, uh, better sentences. Uh, then it uh, even outperforms um, bird large on worse sentences and generative transformers on non sentences. The process of sentence ranking is identical to the one in CAM uh, with co comparative sentences by combining uh, the the classifier confidence and the elastic search score. Uh, when displaying the arguments in RUCAM on a certain object, we sum up not only better arguments uh, where the current object is the first item, but also worse arguments where the object is the second one in the sentence. For instance, both sentences, cats are better than dogs, and dogs are worse than cats, are used in favor of cats when comparing them with dogs. The main outcome of our research is the final system where we integrate all the parts described above. The evaluation of the system is currently work in progress. Um, we plan to evaluate RUCAM um, analogously to CAM evaluation pipeline uh, by asking whether users are performing faster uh, well, searching something <laughs> of comparative nature, if compared, um, if compared the work in the work with uh, Cam with the keyword search, and also uh, we can ask some users just to play with the system to collect their feedback. That's it about the pipeline, and it's time to answer research questions in general. Uh, so, in general, when transferring CAM to other languages, you should take the following peculiarities into account. The difference in the notion of, of comparative sentences in different languages, difference in the syntax and morphology of languages when re-implementing rule-based approaches, and the existence of the relevant data sets and pre-trained la large language models for training for different subtasks, as well as large text corpora containing comparative sentences for search in the target language. Mm, so, nevertheless, um, as it has been shown in Russian, it might be quite smooth uh, if at least some of the requirement, required tools are, uh, are available. What do we have now, we have UCAM, uh, the first instrument which helps to answer general domain comparative questions in Russian. Inspired by the CAM system, we create a similar pipeline, adding new steps for comparative question identification, object and aspect identification, and sentence classification. We also present several new data sets in Russian that might be further used for the fine tuning of language models for each subtask. And from the performed experiments, uh, we can see that rule-based approaches uh, show decent result on all subtasks of comparative question answering, as well as few short generative transformers. And this <laughs> subtask uh, needs to be further investigated. And finally, let's look at our comparison at our small research. According to our system, uh, cats win over dogs and do that quite confidently. So that's interesting. And that's an example of some top, top ranked sentences. 
um, from the extracted from the elastic search. As future directions, we plan to incorporate a summarization system uh, that would be able to produce a coherent answer uh, from two lists of arguments for each object. Uh, it will allow us to compare the results of various uh, instruct tuned uh, um, models for Russian and ChatGPT with the RUCAM pipeline. Thank you for your attention. Okay, any questions? Thank you for your work. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on how you plan to evaluate the system uh, outputs? Because your experiments were based on different components, right? So whether classifier argument identification works well, whether sentence uh, classification works well. But uh, ultimately, a user has certain information need, and it's presented with these outputs, right? Whether cat is, cat, cat is better or not. And how would you judge whether the system, this system, is satisfying this information need well or not? So, uh, for users, uh, there will be a sort of front end uh, to use and uh, and <laughs> to input and uh, uh, work uh, f uh, slower, faster, and what else should I say? <laughs> uh, Okay, yeah, that's a, a human study. Uh, do you uh, think it's a possibility to um, do it in auto an automatic, like a reproducible way, so that um, tomorrow somebody will develop another system and uh, it can be uh, compared as well, uh, or it, it's just not obvious? Uh, as I understand for now, um, the main way of evaluation uh, is supposed to be human, human-based, uh, but maybe we should think more about some ways of evaluation, of of mm. automatic evaluation also, that just uh, a sort of future work, I suppose so. Okay, Thank you. and maybe if, okay, okay. I will mm, pass. Thank you for the talk. Uh, the question is like related to what uh, Alexander asked. Uh, have you tried to ask questions like uh, compare something that is incomparable and how system deals with that such thing? I mean, it's partially due to lack of data, partially due to some strange query, and what uh, what is the default behavior, what is the intended behavior in your system? Like if I compare cats and Audi or something like this. What is the bad? What, what? Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> in this data set, if you train it on this data set, cats are, will, will be always better, better than humans. <laughs> yes. Uh, in fact, I suppose there will be not enough output from the corpus uh, if we uh, pose such question. Yeah, yeah clearly. But uh, what is the default behavior in this case, like, or some like? What system should do? For now, yeah. For now, there's going to be done a request. So if we identify that the question is comparative, then uh, the two objects will go to the Elasticsearch system and will retrieve some sentences. Uh, in my opinion, there will be almost no sentences comparing cat and BMV. Dependent, like sometimes we have a cat as the machines, and then this is a disambiguation problem in this case. So yeah, but mostly it's for future work because one of the limitations of this, yeah, so there might be some incomparable objects and this is, yeah, quite a limitation for now. But in future work, yeah, normally we are planning to apply some taxonomic structures to look for uh, hypernames and looking for how they close are related or maybe they're like in the different parts of the graph so they cannot be compared. Not compare, yeah. Yeah, that could be done with some uh, more fine tuning, something or some kind of unsupervised baselines using taxonomy and WordNet, in my opinion. Um, 
Thank you for the talk. Have you considered uh, to do more classes? Uh, it's like, uh, it seems to me that uh, sometimes uh, the answer to the uh, comparable question is uh, things are equally good or equally bad. And uh, have, you, have you thought of, uh, of this classes? We've never thought about that, uh, but I think uh, that as, as a final result, uh, we should um, receive a sort of process uh, for the first object and the second object, and uh, that output requires uh, the classification better, worse, and none, and nothing more. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. And now it's time for the third talk. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Maxim Savkin, and I would like to present our paper called Tuning Free Discriminative Nearest Neighbor Few Shot Intent Detection via Consecutive Knowledge Transfer. Uh, so let's start from an introduction to the task. Um, intent classification is task of identifying user intents given an utterance. Naturally, it appears in dialog systems and uh, comes along with the task of autoscope detection. Here you can see on the slide, uh, tell me a joke is an example which doesn't belong to any of the predefined in-scope intents, uh, so it belongs to the autoscope class. Mm. I would like to emphasize the importance of autoscope detection as it is crucial for generating an appropriate response. Uh, we will solve both of these problems simultaneously. So the motivation behind this work is that most of the existing methods for uh, intent classification rely on expensive fine tuning uh, and have high training requirements, especially state of the art models. Uh, and also most of them are focused on in-scope classification, completely missing out-of-scope detection. Uh, our approach, on the other hand, uh, in our approach, we try to create a model which can work as a service. So um, it doesn't require any task-specific fine-tuning. It takes a few short data set and a set of unlabeled utterances as input and produces a set of intent labels. Uh, we tried to inherit the discriminative nearest neighbor architecture. Uh, it uh, utilizes a standard k nearest neighbors and replaces the distance function with a deep cross encoder Roberto model. Uh, this model takes an input and a training utterance and tries to predict the probability of these utterances belonging to the same intent class. So it is some sort of a similarity function, but uh, based on a deep cross encoder model. So in the original paper, strong capabilities of this similarity function were achieved by fine tuning it uh, on uh, a pair of examples from the target data set. Uh, however, we suggest to completely skip the fine tuning step and focus more on creating a, a strong pre-trained uh, similarity function which can differentiate between unseen intents. Uh, so further, uh, I'll focus on retraining this similarity function. Uh, we consider using several binary classification tasks. Uh, the first one is natural language inference. Uh, it is popular for pre-training some strong binary discriminators. Uh, the second one is paraphrasing. It suits a bit better for similarity prediction. And the final one is a consecutive pre-training where a model firstly trains on a large natural language inference data set so that it can learn some inter-utterance relations. And then in, it tunes on a smaller paraphrasing data set uh, so to better measure the similarity prediction. Uh, we also, for natural language inference, merge the last two classes, neutral and contradiction, into non-entailment. So it's a binary classification task. Uh, one problem with paraphrasing uh, is that it lacks large high quality data sets. Uh, so uh, to mitigate this issue, uh, we've tried using a small high, a small high quality data set and uh, uh, augment some uh, non-paraphrases. For generating non-paraphrases, uh, we use some sort of clustering. You can notice that 
paraphrasing is an equivalence relation, so paraphrasing data set can be divided into equivalence classes, and uh, utterances from the same class have uh, the same meaning and can be considered paraphrases, and utterances from different, different classes can be considered non-paraphrases, that they possibly have different, different meaning. Uh, so all those missing connections you can see on the slide uh, will become our newly generated uh, non-paraphrases, which we will use to increase the results for paraphrasing data. As for the metrics for the final model for end-time classification, we are using in-scope accuracy, out-of-scope precision and recall, which are defined as standard recall and precision, uh, but um, Positive class is an out of scope, and negative class is a combination of all in scope classes. Uh, we randomly sample 10 few shot data sets from the original data sets and report the average and standard deviation for all the metrics. Uh, the data sets we'll be using are the following we'll be using a large clean. Uh, 150 data set, which contains uh, 10 domains and wide variety of intents and uh, a banking data set which contains only one domain but 77 fine-grained intents. Uh, so let's move on to the results of pre-training. As you can see uh, on the left plot, uh, a natural language inference task, despite being so popular, achieved uh, the worst results uh, due to its directional nature. And the best results we were able to obtain so far are with consecutive pre-training, where a model firstly trains uh, on a large natural language inference data set, and then uh, tunes uh, on uh, a paraphrasing data set with uh, newly augmented non-paraphrases. This is the, first, uh, the third column. Uh, I would also like to notice that uh, augmentation really helped to increase both in-scope accuracy as, and out-of-scope recall by introducing new non-paraphrases. Uh, so let's compare our model against other tuning-free methods. Uh, the first one is TF-IDF uh, KNN classification, uh, and uh, the second one is embedding KNN vanilla, which is actually just a KNN based on B encoder Roberto model, which was pre-trained uh, on a natural language inference task, only pre-trained, no fine-tuning at all. So here you can see that uh, on the Kling data set uh, and banking subset of Kling, we are achieving uh, the best results so far, uh, even getting much, uh, and our approach is much more stable to threshold selection than our approaches, uh, as it has much larger area under the curves of in-scope accuracy and out-of-scope recall. Uh, we also thought that it would be important to compare our model with uh, some fine-tuned methods. Uh, DNC is the state-of-the-art model for autoscope detection, uh, and here you can see that uh, here you can see that, as expected, fine-tuned methods are better in uh, initial in-scope accuracy. However, for a standard Roberto model, you can see a huge drop in accuracy, which means that it has a lot of um, low confidence predictions. And uh, our model has a larger area under the curves on e-scope accuracy, so it is more stable to selection of threshold. Uh, these results are not included in our paper, but we decided that it also would be important to, to uh, see how our model stacks against ChatGPT. So uh, the whole clean data set didn't fit in the prompt, so we've used only a banking subset of clean data set. And uh, with standard out of scope examples, you can see that ChatGPT with zero short prompts achieves nearly ideal results. Uh, so, and we suppose that it's all uh, due to the fact that it memorized this data set quite well. So we've decided to change all text labels with indexes. And we also replaced uh, standard out of domain examples, out of domain out of scope examples with harder in domain out of scope examples. And as you can see, uh, our model still attains relatively high recall and accuracy, while ChatGPT really struggles with. Uh, these out of harder out of scope examples. So only a uh, few short ChatGPT is able to produce some relatively good results. 
Yeah, uh, so summarizing our paper, uh, I would like to say that uh, we've developed a model that doesn't require any task specific fine tuning. Uh, so it can be applied to any data set for intent classification. It supports an auto scope detection as the best performance on clean data set and it is robust to threshold selection. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you elaborate on this difference between setups uh, in domain and out of domain? Uh, uh, so you mentioned, uh, yeah, just next up. Ne yeah, next slide. This slide. Uh, just uh, the one before conclusion. Uh, okay. So you mentioned that you removed some identifiers and converted them to numerical. What, what does it actually mean? Uh, I mean that um, ChatGPT. Uh, probably has memorized the data set quite well. So we've decided to reduce the effects of this memorization uh, and replaced uh, all uh, text labels with just indexes. So it couldn't memorize just uh, by prompting just so well. But wouldn't it, would it be fair to chat GPT? I mean, in the sense that uh, maybe your system memorized these uh, indices, uh, but chat No, GPT it uh, doesn't. Uh, take a labels just at all. So it just takes uh, input utterances and compares them between themselves only and doesn't take uh, a label as input. So it's totally fair, I think. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions in the audience? Okay, maybe we have some time for one Zoom question, if we have one. No, we don't have questions in the Zoom. Let's thank the speaker. Okay, now it's time for the fourth talk. Hello, my name is Vasily, and we are going to talk about whether it is possible or not to find the number of topics in a natural language processing data set. So, a couple of words as an introduction. What is topic modeling about? A topic model receives as input a huge text collection, unlabeled, and as output, it produces topics. Topics as uh, uh, topics as probabilities over words. So we can see what text is about, and uh, we can locate the places in text where each topic is covered. So the problem of topic modeling can be viewed as a matrix decomposition problem. Topic model receives as input uh, a matrix of word in document frequencies, and it decomposes it ma this matrix into matrix multiplication of two matrices. First matrix of word word probabilities and topics matrix phi and second matrix of probabilities of topics and documents well but it is not clear how one should select this the hyperparameter is it crucial or not how to find it so it seems that in some text collections uh, at least the number of topics can be well defined beforehand for example if we take some articles from Wikipedia, they are labeled, they are split into sections. So if we take some articles from, let's say, art section, some from biology section, some from history, we get a data set and we can say obviously that there are three topics in it. So, but in real life, it may appear more complex because these topics labeled by humans, this is something that just helps to simplify the categorization process. So in real life, it may be, well, much more topics in this text collection. These bigger topics may be split into smaller ones. And furthermore, topics may combine and produce some new topics. So is there a number of topics in text collection or not? Can we find it or not? We are trying to find an answer to this question. And uh, what are we going to do? We're going to train 
a topic model for a text collection with varying number of topics from low to high. And we're going to track some topic, some topic model quality measures and look at the plots, at the dependence of quality measure against number of topics. And if we, well, let's say, see some local minimum or maximum or plateau, it may be a sign that uh, the number of topics corresponding to this interesting point is an optimal one. So this is the picture which we are, well, expect to see. Uh, after going further, I think it is important to say a couple of words about similar projects. We are not the first to try to track a lot of quality measures while training a topic model. We are even not the first to try to find the number of topics using these quality measures. But we believe that our research is one of the most extensive one. So what, are quality, what quality measures are we going to use? First, perplexity, one, maybe, one, maybe the most common measure while training topic models, the lower the better. Second block are measures, diversity measures. They compare topics with each other computing distances between pairs of topics. Because if a topic model produces topics which are all similar, it is bad. The second block is clustering measures, uh, because topic modeling can be viewed as a soft clusterization problem. Words are split into topics, which are soft clusters. So we can adopt several measures from clustering analysis to use it as a measure of topic model, topic model quality. And the last on this slide, is a block of stability measures. Well, topic models are unstable. It means that if we train a topic model on the same text collection with different random initializations, we can get different results. So we compare different topic models obtained with different random initializations with each other, compare their topics. Well, this is not all measures which we use. The, following, the, the next block are information theoretic measures. We use, we use several of them, but the idea is, is the same. They compute roughly the difference between, between model complexity and model likelihood. So the bigger the likelihood, the better, but uh, the bigger complexity, the worse. So they, these metrics are trying to find the balance between the two, uh, the two model characteristics. The next one is entropy. There are works where the authors propose to use this metric because, well, another analogy with topic mo between topic modeling and a complex system where we have several possible states, topics, and particles, that is words, can occupy several of them. So the optimal number of topics using this measure is the number of topics which gives an equilibrium state to the system. And the last block, which we use, the last block of measures are top tokens measures. We compute coherence and lift scores. That's it. Well, the methodology of our experiment is roughly described here. We, for each data set, we train a topic model with varying number of topics from minimum to maximum, compute um, topic model quality measures, and look at the plots. Minimum and maximum topic model, uh, minimum and maximum number of topics which we vary uh, depend, depends on the data set. The models which we use are the following. PLSA, the simplest model, which have only one hyperparameter, the number of topics, LDA, the most known topic model, uh, and a couple more. The correlated topic model, which is trained in order to produce topics which are distinct. Sparse topic model, which distinguishes its topic, its, its topics, it splits the topics into two groups. Background topics, which are smooth and, well, Mm, about nothing. And specific topics which are sparse and exact. Sparse means that the largest probability mass is spread only on a small group of topic words. Well, 
And this is models and this is datasets. We use several datasets in English, several in Russian language. For each dataset, we know at least approximately the number of topics in this dataset they expected. This is our ground truth. Well, probably I should say a couple of words about the last dataset, Rovik Good. This is our dataset composed by our research group. It consists of good Wikipedia from good articles from Russian Wikipedia. So and, th and this is this is the result. This is the results. Table with three nu nu numeric columns. Each column is a score which we assign to each quality measure. So what do they what, what they mean? The first column is Jacquard metric. It it tells how the predictions of the same topic model but trained trained with different random seeds are consistent with, with each other. The lower the better in this table. It is called Jacquard because it is computed the following way. We take the predictions of topic models with different random seeds and we compose and uh, we um, make two sets. The first set is a union of predictions, the next set is uh, intersection of prediction, and we compute the, the Jacquard distance between these two sets. The next column is informativity. Well, it tells how the plot of dependence of quality measure against number of topics is readable by a human, whether it contains local minimum, maximum, or plateau, or it just random up and down and without any possibility to make a prediction out of it. The last column is called expected. Well, it tells whether the quality measure succeeded in finding the exact number of topics, whether it is whether it, it is whether it corresponds to the ground truth from the table with data sets. Well, what, what, what can we see from here? Uh, the best values in table are colored with blue, but these best values are obviously far from good. So it may be an indicator that there is no such notion as, as natural number of topics in a data set. And there are several illustrations to support some other conclusions. First, uh, we found that optimal number of topics depends on the topic model used. For example, on this plot, we, oops, on this plot, we can see three three curves. Each curve corresponds to one. Uh, each curve corresponds to a sparse model with different sparse hyperparameter. So one is more sparse than another. And as we can see, these models, this is the same sparse model with different parameters, they give different results as optimal number of topics as local minimum. What is more, we can see that this, well, broad, broad lines averaged over random seeds, also each random seed produces a bit different number of topics. So it is also what, is, what, what impacts the result. And on this plot, we can see, well, not about this plot. Other finding is the following. Different quality measures produce different results as number of topics. This is general case which we studied. However, sometimes on this plot exactly, we could see that different quality measures give the same result. For example, here, one topic model, one data set, and several quality measures, and they point roughly at the same number of topics, seven. But this is not a rule, this is an exception. And that is probably it. So, conclusion, we found out that number of topics is probably not a natural characteristic of a data set, it is just another hyperparameter of a model, and it is also dependent on the quality measure which is used to find the number of topics. Perplexity and coherence, maybe a bit surprisingly, they failed to give any decent results. However, however, information theoretic criterion and Ringy entropy achieved best results. Well, as a remark, as a final remark, we want to say that probably this is not such an important task to find the optimal number of topics as just 
finding a way of training a topic model which has all topics interpretably good, whatever topic number you assign at the beginning. Well, that's it. Thank you for your attention. At Zoom, it's fine listening to me from the mic here. So I have one small question. So could you please summarize what we should do if we need to select the optimal number of topics? So basically run as many models as possible and then to select, as I understood correctly. But The best way we think that if you should know beforehand at least roughly what number of topics you have in your collection, and it is, it is the best way. And the second, if you didn't, if you don't know how many topics you have, two or two hundred, then this is best to just probably train topic models, conduct many experiments, and in order to find the topic model which best describes your collection. Well, another way to train many topic models and collect good interpretable topics, put them aside, and by looking at how many topics you collected, you can see how many topics you have. So, something like this. Okay. And you start with some number of topics and start experimenting, making your topic model better or collecting topics. Can you think you have more questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, did you consider uh, some also classification uh, based experiments where you apply obtained representations to and measure quality of this? No, we were concentrated on just intrinsic quality measures without trying to assess topic models by experts or secondary tasks because, well, if we try to select the number of topics based on secondary task, it, it obviously would produce better results because we <laughs> just find the number of topics which give us best results. We wanted to find out whether there is some natural number of topics which could be found by intrinsic quality measures. Mm. Yeah, I think that might be also different for different classification tasks or for different applications, mm -hmm. uh, different granularities might be needed. Uh, so that might be kind of at, at the heart of this issue, right? So you have different hierarchy of granularities Maybe for retrieval, you need coarser granularities mm -hmm. for, I don't know, authorship identification or something. You need uh, very specific things. So th there might be just this general idea that everything in computer science depends on application and there is just no uh, universal representation. I mean, uh, at least in terms of topics, which is uh, works always well. Like, like in clustering, you might have uh, different uh, views on, on this data. Yes, yes, yes. You, if you're trying to solve some secondary task, it is best to search the number of topics based on this task. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have more question. Yes, we do. No, no, Andre, we have one question from the audience and then yours. Yes. From them. Thank you for the insightful talk. Uh, I have a couple of small technical questions. Uh, that data set were wiki good, right? Uh, and uh, uh, as I believe, you, in all those data sets, you had the true number of classes, the topics, right? So, how did you obtain the topics from the rule wiki, right? So, it's categories probably, but what was the label set? Well, Yes, it, it was scraped from Wikipedia. We know we, we knew the categories of each article, so that's how we found the number of topics. I mean, what was the topics like? Some categories from the Wikipedia. Some some large categories, yes, which are good topics are divided into. Mm. There are articles which called good, which are checked and well big and thorough. And there are several categories which these good articles belong to. So, we... so there was some manual post processing for the label set, right? Yes, yes. Ah, great. And second question, um, also as a technical, uh, what motivated the choice of the models in concern, right? PLSA, LDE, and 
different flavors of ARTM. So, I mean, uh, the the kingdom of topic models is rather large. So, why this? Well, our main idea was to take just several topic models in order to exclude some well biases towards topic models. We just wanted to take more than one topic model, so we took PLSA, LDA as best, as well known as simplest approaches, and several other variations just to, to I mean, make more. I mean, wouldn't like neural topic models uh, contribute some some something else, or it was not really that important for the study? No, we didn't consider neural topic modeling because, as well as I understood, the, as well as I understand, there is also a hyperparameter T for these models. Well, we just excluded what we excluded is the models which uh, also try to find this number of topics as a result. For example, hierarchical Dirichlet process, we excluded these models because they introduce additional hyperparameters which need to be optimized and they are also non-universal because in terms that they are assessed differently than the majority of topic models which have just two matrices phi and theta. Yeah, of course, but some neural topic models have T as a parameter like ETM, for example, by yes. D and, and so. But anyways, thanks for the answer. Thanks for the question. Let's thank the speaker again. And now we have the last talk of the session. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this talk. This talk is uh, uh, this work is done in uh, with collaboration with uh, in collaboration with um, Kazan Federal University. So um, this is a part of a project of uh, studying uh, text complexity on different levels. So this part is related to uh, text complexity at the sentence level. And the uh, the other parts of the work of this uh, big project done in CAFU is uh, related to uh, academic complexity, academic text complexity, and also uh, lexical complexity. So the context is that uh, of this project is that we want to do the prediction at the uh, at the sentence level and uh, at different levels, as I already discussed. And uh, sentence complexity is uh, one of these. Uh, well-studied tasks already uh, but in russian it's not that uh, well studied and um, uh, there are limitations uh, for classical measures so we tried uh, not only the classical approach with the uh, features but also uh, the deep neural networks to train and uh, measure the performance uh, on this uh, task uh, okay, and um, yeah, one thing that is uh, there are uh, other languages like Italian, English, and others that already get data set for sentence complexity uh, in Russian. There was no data set, and uh, yeah, brief discussion of the work that people tried to do before us, and they collect data in different languages. They trained some classical approaches like on lexical features and syntactical features as well and deep learning methods like pre-trained language models and collected a lot of uh, different data sets in, the, in this domain uh, including english and italian and uh, our part first part of the project was collecting the data in order to uh, run the evaluation so the data set we resembled the methodology uh, for english and italian data set collection so we used the uh, Toloka uh, crowdsourcing platform and uh, ask the lockers to annotate uh, the sentences according to seven levels of complexity. But we also wanted to uh, experiment with different features, so we sampled the data set from the syntax rules corpus because the, 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 there is a syntactic annotations and other uh, interesting things that we can make use of later. Uh, it, yeah, that was a sample of uh, sample of the sentences uh, was related to the frequency of the lexemes in the sentence. Uh, so we we tried to sample the sentences of uh, average uh, frequency, like not to sample to complex to rare words and so on, as our colleagues before did. And it uh, each bin uh, contained. Uh, 
200 sentences. So overall, it's like 1,020, uh, 1,200 sentences. So it's just sample interface of the uh, UI. The, so people just were asked to uh, pick one of these scores. There was a 10 out of 8, 10 assessments per sentence. And um, yeah, just example of a sentence, example of, the, of this thing. And uh, yeah, we collected uh, data from people who are native speakers. There are no other like, restrictions or something like this. We applied when we collected the data. Uh, there is a slightly, there, there is a slight uh, imbalance of the data here. You can see the distribution of these scores among the, in the data set. And yeah, it's uh, biased towards complexity, more, co more complex uh, sentences, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, contradictory to what we have in two other data sets, English in, uh, and uh, Italian, uh, but it's still uh, kind of in interesting, interesting observation. Um, regarding the as assessment of uh, agreement, uh, so we have this distribution of distribution of complexities uh, corresponding to the, uh, so the x-axis here is the uh, sentence length in tokens, and y-axis is the uh, average score, distribution of average score. And uh, yeah, of course, there is a clearly the correlation between two parameters, but also we uh, measured the average number of uh, people who agreed about the score uh, on the sentence. So out of 10 people, assessors uh, 4.3 on average agreed about the score, the complexity score. Uh, of course, the sentence length is a crucial parameter. It's uh, important to assess the complexity or readability of the sentence. Uh, but it's not the only one, and uh, previously we an analyzed, so previous work we analyzed the, what uh, features can be important based on the features uh, that are more important, more, more correlated to, to the target, we build a simple linear regression. And then the, in this work, it's kind of a step further. Uh, we try to push the performance uh, uh, more to get more quality of uh, of this data, and then in the second part of the talk, there will be some uh, modeling, like classical and uh, deep learning approaches. Uh, here you can see the difference between discrepancy between Italian and uh, English and Russian data, and you can see that, yeah, in Italian and English, you have relatively small number of uh, complex sentences. Not, not complex here, but uh, complexity on the y score, but on the uh, x score again, just length of the sentence. And in those two data sets, there are relatively less number of sentences with a long, uh, uh, relatively less number of instances with long with long sentences. Um, and the same you can see here as a distribution of the complexity score. Uh, so, uh, peak is Russian, and uh, this one is English, and this one is. Italian, so the average uh, uh, complexity also different on different languages. So it can be due to sampling, of course, uh, but uh, maybe it's just uh, also related to some other like linguistical uh, uh, properties, such as average length of word, average length of sentence, and maybe the uh, also annotator basis. Uh, here. You can see that, the, yeah, distribution of the, the, these properties, like this uh, Russian, English, and Italian data set, and here the frequency of lemmas uh, set of length. So it's uh, more or less uh, similar. So here the discrepancy is appearing, but because we, we got the logarithmic frequency, so after the normalization, they, they look the same. Uh, so these three data sets are comparable and uh, you can run the several experiments, several models on this data. Uh, simple approaches like based on linear regression and uh, decision trees and SVMs uh, based uh, on uh, classical like TF-IDF uh, metrics uh, features. And uh, then we tried also uh, like modern approach based on BERT model and fine tuning of BERT and also graph-based uh, neural network. So that was initial 
idea to select features, uh, three features uh, that we can select from the feature set uh, of the, uh, and then build a, build a linear model that with the three parameters uh, gives qu quite uh, not very nice results and uh, uh, for this uh, for this quality like R2 score is quite low and MSC and MAE quite low. So the next uh, idea about the BERT is quite uh, obvious. I don't want to stop more on this. It's just fine tuning of the uh, pre-trained RUBERT, Italian BERT, and uh, English base model. Uh, regarding the GNN, we uh, make use of this uh, model that gets the syntactical uh, tree, dependency tree, uh, uh, augmented with additional uh, edges. And also we uh, we use as features of these nodes in each uh, syntactical tree in, in, in dependency tree, the features provided by fast text. So it's uh, uh, the convolutional model actually gets the features and applies the uh, graph based uh, uh, convolution in order to find the representation of the whole uh, like of each of each, each node and then we do the pooling over the uh, all these three and the, the final final uh, linear layer decides which what is the complexity of the sentence uh, results of fine-tuned birds of course it's uh, as it was expected they were uh, quite decent and uh, this is a uh, just number outrageously low numbers like good numbers because of a large number of epochs uh, when we compare it to like uh, GNN and uh, SVM and other models, uh, we can see that yeah, yeah, bird bird based models for all languages they are much much better, um, and yeah, linear regression sometimes just doesn't provide any reasonable result uh, because of maybe a number of features. Who knows? Uh, and yeah, this GNN model actually is not that not that bad uh, compared to some some other languages maybe. Um, that's uh, data set is available and uh, we are going to continue this uh, studies uh, in both cross-lingual, multilingual setting, maybe building a model that can be applied to several languages. And there is an interesting direction of research when the other group working on lexical complexity, so, so they want to measure the complexity of the word in context and then using this thing you can measure the complexity of the context itself. Uh, not just sample some sentences with words, but simple, simple complex sentences or simple sentences with the same word and analyze its complexity and context. Uh, that's probably it. Uh, if I have time, I think I have some time for questions. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. I have one small question. Why English and Italian data set use seven scale? Why do they use seven scale? Instead of five, for example. Like for me, five was the simplest way to think if you're not satisfied with binary classification because it's yeah. not the, the type of a binary classification task. Why not five? Why, why, why did you decide seven? That's a good question. Actually, I don't remember they explain it well in the paper. Uh, that's some, somehow this, uh, uh, it's called a Likert scale. And uh, that's, that, that's usually, yeah, from one to five. And in this case, it was like seven for some, maybe more fine grained is better. I don't know really. Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you for the great talk and for the data set. Finally, <laughs> uh, and um, the question uh, that I want to ask is when I put myself in the shoes of the annotator, yet again about the scale, um, well, it's sort of hard to choose, I, I believe, whatever, however you explain each, you know, each, I don't know, button, right? So I wonder if there are any gamified things or some 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 procedures some uh, procedures where people annotate the complexity of the text implicitly so that the data set can be derived from the procedure mm -hmm. 
Is there anything of the sort? Uh, something that comes to my mind is this eye tracking thing that people uh, like measure something like uh, uh, indirectly, like how, how long time, how how many times you have this uh, saccades or something like this, and uh, uh, when you read the text, and th 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 there are measures, and also I think in Kafu there is a investigation of this uh, part how students in school read the text and how they perceive it uh, using the eye trackers devices but for this uh, crowdsourcing it's uh, i think the only thing to do is to increase number of annotators and somehow control the output uh, quality like uh, measure the time uh, how how much how much time people spend on uh, each sentence for instance or annotating each sentence it should be not less than like several seconds maybe so no, that's kind of general approach thanks yes. okay we have one more questions in the zoom yes please yes uh thanks for the talk uh so my question is also about the data set and also about putting myself in the shoes of uh, the annotators so the obvious strategy for an annotator is, of course, to just label uh, long sentences uh, as uh, difficult and short sentences as not difficult. So uh, the guidelines for the annotators, did they include any specific instructions about uh, taking into account sentence length or not taking into account sentence length? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, good question. Uh, yeah, there, there was a short guideline. Actually, we provided like examples of sentences uh, that are short, the hard and not hard. And uh, we completely rely on the intuition of annotator in this case. Uh, I, I think uh, any guideline in this, in this part, when you uh, try to gather an assessment of the complexity that is, or difficulty that is purely like perceptional thing, it's not uh, kind of, can be, cannot be formulated uh, uh, or defined objectively, in my opinion. Yeah, so we rely on the intuition, linguistic uh, intuition of uh, assessors, and we minimize these uh, guidelines as, as we can. And, uh, and then again, just uh, if you have uh, uh, enough number of assessors uh, per sentence, on average, you will get a good assessment. Uh, good good uh, score for the sentence the guideline was very short I can say. yeah and the guidelines didn't mention the sentence length in any way right uh no 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 it was not related to any bound to any parameters or whatever so we just uh, like didn't want to push assessors or bias them towards some attribute or whatever okay thanks Okay, any more? Oh, 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 two questions, okay. Yeah, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I have one small question. Have you considered any relation of text complexity with linguistic acceptability? If there is one, uh, some co um, connection between these two notions, maybe the text complexity could be assessed with uh, the perplexity of the models and other methods used for acceptability. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't measure this exact uh, relationship uh, between these two things. Uh, what I was thinking about the uh, measure connection between the grammaticality or the some syntactical features. So well, that, that, that's why we're looking into syntax groups because you, you can uh, com compute some syntactic based uh, parameters from the sentence. But uh, like grammaticality or some, you know, uh, quality of uh, sentence can be related to complexity, of course. Uh, but acceptance in this case, uh, well, I don't think we have a lot of data in Russian. Maybe I'm just I just don't know about the. There is a, the Rukola dataset, which is oh, okay. like in the very Rukola. Top. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's maybe possible. Yeah, to do this. In, in this okay. Case. Great. Thank you. It's a good idea. Uh, yeah, it's just a very short comment related to Andrei's uh, question. Um, do you think it makes sense to, when annotators are given uh, different sentences, to provide the same length of the sentences so that mm -hmm. they uh, they never biased indeed by this very strong. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
So that's good. Maybe, maybe model can learn better uh, if you provide all. Yes, yes, everything. that's that's good point. Uh, actually, that's uh, it needs different scheme of annotation. You give uh, two sentences with the same length and decide. Uh, yeah. Ask annotator to measure to 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 answer which one is uh, more complex. Yeah, like this, may, right? maybe they pay attention then to more non-trivial yeah. uh, features. And yeah, yeah. To model it was a similar thing we tried in previous work. That was a classifier that was trained on the pairs of sentences of the same length. But uh, for, annota for annotators uh, here, we collected only the scores uh, per sentence. And the, that's, that could be a bias towards the length of the sentence. To avoid this, yes, uh, the collect coll we didn't do this, but the idea is quite obvious and we maybe we'll try to, to, to do it. Right now, it's... Um, the goal of the project is to uh, develop a model that will just sample complex sentences or simple sentences. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alexey Andutov. Uh, I'm from Umanosov, Moscow State University. Uh, yeah, I and my colleague uh, Natalia Lukashevich uh, prepared research with topic uh, document level relation extraction uh, in Russian. Uh, what are we going to talk about uh, this today? Uh, first of all, why is the task of extracting information and uh, subtask are relevant? Uh, we will short introduce what is a relation extraction task and what is the difference between sentence level and document level relation extraction. And uh, I will show the problem of nested entities in this task and uh, what models for document relationship extraction are used. Okay, uh, traditionally one of the most uh, important tasks in the NLP is information extraction. And one of these uh, important subtask and least export is relation extraction. Uh, this task has, has a broad range of applications, starting creating and updating knowledge bases like Wikipedia and WordNet to structuring documents like. Uh, why th this work is important? Uh, first, we address extraction with nested entities and ignoring these aspects. Uh, results in information loss. And next we focus on the document level relation extraction. It's a complex problem uh, and it's crucial for understanding entire document. Uh, notably, no studies focusing on Russian language have been published yet. Uh, what is the task of relation extraction? Uh, look at this example, uh, given a sentence, the previous uh, Cannes Film Festival was held from May 19 to 26, uh, given uh, as entities, festival, and date, uh, we should predict the type of relation uh, point in time uh, in this case. And also, a relation can be formulated as triplet uh, subject, object, and relation type. Uh, but in this work, we consider document relation extraction document level and let's look an example a news article about uh, Konstantin Rubinov uh, we consider two entities uh, music band Gershdanska Barona or civil defense and Konstantin Rubinov uh, at the same time we see that Konstantin Rubinov uh, same uh, have uh, some mentions like Kuzio Kuzio that is uh, nickname of Rubinov, and we should uh, recognize a relation type founded by and recognize evidence support, uh, supporting our sentences that can help you to understand the relation type in this case. And what is the difference between sentence level and document level? Uh, first of all, uh, in first case, you have single sentence and usually only two entities involves but in document level relation extraction uh, you have a long entire document uh, entities 
can be mentioned in various forms and you should also predict the evidence. Yeah, we use a narrow data set uh, which contains uh, annotations of entities and relations between uh, some of words and uh, there are about 30 different types of entities like uh, person or place and about 15 and about 50 different types of relations like workplace, alternative name or work as uh, and uh, importantly that uh, some of these relations occur between sentences in the text. Okay, uh, how this task of relation extraction uh, can be solved? The baseline approach treats its uh, classification task uh, for a pair of entities in, it, in text. Uh, for example, given a sentence, uh, you should mark uh, two entities and uh, apply some of classifier. Uh, but we have some problems uh, with more advanced approaches. Uh, for example, when we mask our entities, uh, we have problem with other weapon. Uh, entities like Moscow State University, and uh, it can it can be used in some models like Spanbird. Uh, okay, and one of these approaches solves this problem, and it's about tagging. Uh, in my previous work, I presented that this problem can be solved by several approaches. First of all, decomposition into subtasks uh, and each solved by a separate model. And in the main approach is joint extraction, uh, where you use a single model to extract all of information uh, in your text. And in short, that uh, our results that using a single model provides better quality. Uh, this allows for incorporating all knowledges and uh, into one model. Okay, we took this into account and considered some approach that addresses relation extraction uh, in a general sense. And uh, what approach did we use to solve the task of at the document level? Uh, we started from baseline, uh, be able to stand that. Me, uh, was mentioned in a uh, docred paper. Um, text with features like uh, growth and entity type vectors and coordinates of entities in text uh, are applied by BOSTM. And uh, finally, we aggregate some of uh, entity mentions and classify by multi class classification layer. But in this task, it's important to consider all of entities during prediction. And uh, it seems a good idea. And in approach of DocuNet, uh, after encoder, our text, we uh, build a uh, relation matrix and use UNET uh, architecture from computer vision approaches. And finally, we can pass these metrics and classify the output. In addition, uh, we previously mentioned that uh, we previously mentioned the concept of evidence or of supporting sentences uh, that can help uh, to recognize the uh, target relation. Uh, in our task and in the extended narrow data set, uh, such a labeling is also provided. Uh, the dream approach allows us to the additional markup uh, beyond predicting the relationship. Uh, let's also model the importance of the sentence in this text. And uh, finally, we can keep only the most important uh, sentences and make predictions predictions based on uh, this document. And this approach is called 
fusion approach. So we see that best result uh, was from dream and fusion approaches using Rue, Roberto, Large encoder. And also we, and also let's look at the some main problems we encountered when working with uh, model on the Russian dataset Nereo. Uh, first of all, uh, in this task you should process uh, entire document and we use window-based text processing with overlapping windows. Okay, next. Uh, the second problem is that the uh, quadratic comp complexity based on the number of entities and uh, this is because the number of relationship in the document is the square of the number of entities and uh, a lot of relations in your text is label uh, like no relation and it's important and uh, in cases when I are using some large models uh, it can be help that removing random negative relationships up to set uh, ratio within the document okay uh, finally uh, we conduct uh, first metrics on document level relation extraction in Russia in Russia and specifically and the narrow data set also metrics achieved uh, nearly the state-of-the-art models for English uh, I mean benchmark docred uh, we explored the issue of uh, nested entities and implemented some uh, enhancements to process uh, longer text and also we see that balancing negative relations relationships helps optimize the training process in the task of document real relation extraction Okay, that's all. Uh, any questions? Okay, so your experiments uh, were done on uh, only neural data set. Yeah. Uh, how you would estimate uh, how generic this model is if you just uh, go and start apply to uh, new text, let's say from uh, Newswire or internet websites just for harvesting very large database of relations about uh, persons uh, mm -hmm. uh, w would it be accurate or domain shift would be very very severe mm -hmm. yeah i'm sure that uh, it's a general approach for relation extraction uh, where we use these models uh, yeah first First of all, we uh, checked uh, all of the models that uh, have the best results of the English benchmarks, like Docred, and uh, we used approach that can be used uh, in another data set, like Nereo, and for another language, like Russian. So I think that it can be used for any domain or any area but um, in some of cases you can uh, see some problems like uh, problems with you i mean that you should optimize your uh, model to a process for example in real time and so on okay thank you very much second question Okay, let's then thank the speaker again. And now it's time for the second talk of the session. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, so, uh, hello once again. Uh, my name is Maria, and today uh, my colleague Leona, who is here uh, via Zoom online, and I, we are going to present our joint work on the way to control bot text summarization. However, today I'm more like a presenter because the main research was performed by Alona and she's the main contributor, so all credentials to her. And I was more like a tutor advisor, unfortunately, Alona. 
couldn't come today, but she's here with us, and after the talk, she will be ready to answer your questions with me. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the application of the new promising approach, namely the Hydra sum approach to controllable text summarization in Russia. And the structure of the, mm, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so today first we will talk about the motivation, then uh, briefly discuss uh, all automatic text summarization approach, and then I'll give the brief uh, overview of the original Hydra sum method. And then we will switch to our research, talk about the data, the experiments, and of course we will discuss uh, the result. So basically, um, uh, the concept of controllable tech generation brings an additional layer of flexibility and customization to the summarization process. And this controllability allows users to specify specific attributes of the desired text, such as length or style, for example. Uh, this customization enhances uh, the user experience by providing summaries that align more closely with the information and individual preferences. Moreover, uh, it allows users to specify the level of compression uh, to make it easier to summarize the desired text. As for the objectives of this uh, study, the main one was to investigate whether the multi-encoder architecture uh, utilizing transformer-based model called the Hydra sum is applicable to the Russian language uh, because it has shown uh, great results for English, and whether a Hydra sum could produce more stylistically diverse or higher quality summaries than the classic approach of fine-tuning uh, language model. This research uh, lies in the field of natural language processing uh, with the focus on automatic text summarization. Uh, as traditional methods of text summarization uh, are mainly divided into the two big groups, namely the uh, extractive and the abstractive ones, they provide contr no controllabilities, producing texts which are not stylistically diverse. Uh, the Hydra sum method, uh, on the contrary, uh, introduces some control. And uh, briefly speaking, Hydra sum is a mixture of expert architecture with multiple decoders, which is based on the pre-trained language models. As a base model, the authors of the original paper choose Facebook's, and Bar uh, Facebook's Bart Large, but they claim that it can be applied to any transformer model. In Hydra sum architecture, the base model is extended to consist of multiple decoders, namely the author's experiment with two and three decoder architecture, where each decoder captures uh, different uh, stylistic features of the input text, uh, and each decoder has a total number of decoder block where the parameter of the bottom layer are shared among decoders. This is done to minimize the number of additional parameters introduced in the model architecture. The top layers of different decoders are pre-trained independently, thus each decoder can specialize and learn distant representations to suit its specific task. And uh, an important thing is uh, the gating mechanism, uh, which is an important part of Hydra sum. Basically speaking, this gating mechanism is a weighted sum of the K decoder's output, and it dynamically determines how much each encoder's output contributes to, to the overall result, enabling flexibility in decision making based on the weighted contributions. After utilizing the gating mechanism, uh, the outputs from the shared layers are fed into a feed forward by softmax activation function, which outputs the overall next token uh, probability. Thus, this process assigns ways to the outputs, determining their relative importance. Uh, the author provided three inference strategies, namely sampling from individual decoders, uh, where one decoder is more extractive and the second one is more abstractive, and um, 
mixture of uh, decoders uh, using the gating uh, mechanism, uh, mixture of using manually specified gating mechanism. Basically speaking, to adapt Hydra sum architecture to the Russian language, we've chosen the classic summarization data set uh, known as Gazeta data set. And recently it has uh, been one of the most popular data set for summarization task in Russia. Uh, the data set consists of news articles and their summaries from Gazeta news website. Titles of the articles is date, uh, URLs and additional information. Um, uh, we also introduced two additional binary columns, namely the uh, gate column and the send column. As a base model, we took MBART model, um, which is a multilingual language model pre-trained on, uh, uh, on the massive corpora. And besides MBART, we also train three baselines, namely the standard fine-tuning of the transformer model, like root 5 base, root GPT-3 small, and fine-tuning of MBART uh, cells. Because, of course, we wanted to compare just the performance of the fine-tuned MBART with the MBART incorporated in the Hydra sum uh, architecture. Uh, to compare uh, the performance, we uh, evaluated it using the uh, classical metric, namely we used Rush scores, measuring the quality of generated text with respect to uh, reference summaries. Uh, apart from Rush scores, we also measured generated uh, uh, summary relevant metrics such as abstractiveness, specificity, uh, length and readability. Uh, uh, just in two words, abstractiveness is measured with the help of two additional tools, namely uh, coverage, which counts the proportion of words presented in both input text and in the summary. Density, which counts the average longest continuous extra copied from the input text. And this metric uh, for evaluating generated summaries was uh, suggested in the paper Newsroom, a data set uh, of 1 million point, uh, of 1.3 uh, million summaries with diverse extractive strategy. To measure specificity of summaries, a um, uh, specific tailor tool uh, was used. And the length of th summaries is measured by two additional metrics, uh, its absolute length and the compression uh, rate. Now on to the results. Uh, we see some significant difference between the performance of two individual decoders. Uh, the first decoder, which is uh, called decoder zero here, uh, provides longer summaries and has lower coverage and density. Then the second decoder, it is called decoder one here. And decoder one is more extractive than decoder zero and shows bigger coverage. The most extractive summaries were produced by uh, Ruti5 and Embart, and most abstractive appeared to be uh, the reference one, <laughs> showing the low coverage and density, which is predictable because <laughs> is the true answer. Mm. Uh, so, mixture of decoders produced more abstractive summary than each decoder individually. And in terms of uh, specificity, all generated summaries have uh, results which are quite close uh, to each other. It can be explained by the fact that all models will fine tuned on the same data set and therefore they share the same vocabulary. However, individual decoders of Hydra sum architecture have also shown different results of specificity on specificity metric. Decoder zero had, uh, has generated a summary with the lowest specificity uh, score among all summaries, whereas the highest result on this metric was shown by a mixture of decoder and the Ruti5 base model. Uh, to sum up, uh, in uh, this uh, work, we studied the application of the Hydra sum uh, method to the uh, Russian language. We found that uh, the first decoder in it is more abstractive, while um, the most extractive summary were provided by Ruti5, and a um, mixture of decoder provided more extractive summaries than other models. And all models showed close results on specificity metric. Um, 
Oh, oh, the time is up and I'm practically finished. During uh, our experiments, uh, the Hydrasum approach proved to be quite promising for, uh, for the Russian language. And uh, as a part of the future research, we plan to train this model with more decoders and on a big and more diverse uh, data set to try capturing more stylistic features. Moreover, it is important to try manually specify the gating mechanism during uh, the inference uh, stage. So now uh, my colleague uh, Alona and I, we are ready to answer. Uh, your questions, Alona, uh, can you hear us? Are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. This is Alona. Hello. Okay. Do we have a questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, my question about the this uh, metrics that you use uh, for evaluation of uh, decoders behavior. Uh, like naive question, is it possible to somehow adjust the behavior of the model or the fi fine-tune the model to, towards uh, more abstractiveness output, more specific or something like this. So you, you, as I understand from the last table, you just measured the quote, this matrix, but is it possible to change the matrix, the output corresponding to the required criteria? Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, Alona, can you answer? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, yes, because it's like the future work which are, we are going to do. Uh, when you're you are manually specifying the gating mechanism, you can do it yourself, so you can assign weights, and uh, thus you can kind of change um, the output to to be more abstractive or more specific uh, more specific one yeah by uh adjusting the weights by assigning the weights yourself and yeah so it's ma manual manual approach right? yeah you can do it manually right okay okay thank you uh, thank you very much for your talk my question is about uh, the mixture of two decoders as I have seen from the results table, the results are lower. So can you please a little bit elaborate how this mixture of decoders was done? Maybe I missed it. And why do you think the results are lower? Thanks. Um, just, just a second. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so the mixture of decoders, it's uh, when the model um kind of um it's when the model decides um which uh, output to generate so it kind of it samples from uh, both decoders simultaneously um so the result was lower um well I think I may add, uh, in the mixture of decoders, we basically assign the uh, mixture of probabilities from the two decoders. Uh, thus, we uh, basically uh, obtain the weighted uh, probability from the two decoder. And here, uh, as far as I remember, we used uh, just the um, uh, average, averaging from the two, uh, pro all the probabilities from the two decoders. Uh, and uh, thus, uh, maybe we should have ex uh, carried out, and this is our future plan, to experiment with different, uh, with different, uh, with different decoder weights, so that, for example, the first decoder or the second decoder uh, is uh, more important in the result. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. So just uh, a quick question about uh, this mixture of the quarters. So what about uh, its computational requirements? So is it more, uh, I guess it's more compute intensive than just using one decoder, right? So uh, how how much of a problem it is? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch it. Can yeah, you, can so... You... <laughs> 
I guess when so, you are using a mixture of decoders, when you sample from two decoders instead of one, right? That's right. It means that, yeah, it, I guess it's more compute intensive. And uh, so, so uh, what's like, is it like uh, twice uh, as expensive or the dependency is not linear? So just uh, how much of a problem it is? Will it be like twice more expensive? Well, it is expensive. Um, it um, it took a long time, to, uh, much longer than training with one or yeah, with one decoder, and um, but it's it's not really a problem because I did it in my call up uh, notebook. So yeah, I kind of spent um, some resources on it, but it was it was okay to do that uh well i guess it depends on the size of the training data or the inference data but just uh, my question is essentially is the dependency linear so is it just uh, the case that when you use two decoders when you sample from two decoders it takes uh, twice uh, the amount of time or compute resources as when you sample from one decoder or is it more complicated well, the dependency is more complicated because, as we've uh, mentioned in the beginning, uh, they have the shared number of uh, layers, uh, the bottom layers, uh, they share the bottom layers. And that's why, of course, the inference from the two decoder is not twice uh, as expensive uh, as sampling from one decoder. But uh, I, I'm not ready to write the exact dependency. It's much more complicated than... <laughs> Uh, but it's less than twice. Yes, less than right. twice because they have some shared parameters just uh, for this purpose to save some computational resources uh, during the fine tuning and the inference stage. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna, and uh, my work is dedicated to machine translation for Russian Hakas language pair. Uh, my goal is to present the results that we were able to achieve and also to try to explain how we did it so that you can maybe uh, repeat it on uh, another language pair of your choice. Uh, so uh, the Hakas language is a language spoken in Russia by about 40,000 people uh, and uh, have uh, a very limited amount of digitized data, so it is considered low resource. Uh, actually, uh, Ex uh, there exist 60,000 uh, pairs uh, in Russian and Hakas, and they are from TIL corpus of Turkic languages. Uh, you can see the results of training the baseline model um, exclusively on Russian Hakas data. And as you can see uh, on the picture, everything that is less than 10 is uh, hard to uh, get a sense of, and uh, everything that's above 50 is considered uh, high quality, good translations. Uh, so the basic uh, approach to improve the um, results of the model is transfer learning, which means uh, you initialize the weights randomly and then you pre-train the model on a resource-rich language pair. And then you take these weights and initialize another model with them and um, fine-tune it on a low resource language pair. Um, so the biggest question, uh, one of the biggest questions was uh, which language to choose for pre-training. Uh, we wanted it to be um, Turkic as well because we thought that maybe it will help the model to train well. And we also wanted to be in Cyrillic script because we wanted to use the shared vocabulary between the parent model and the child model. Uh, so here you can see the languages that um, meet these requirements uh, and the sizes of the available corpora. So as you can see, Kazakh language is the largest one. But uh, the problem about these languages is that uh, the data is mainly uh, web scraped and uh, it is uh, not of a very good quality in terms of translation, but also it uh, tends to lean to certain domains like news or uh, government documents. So uh, we decided that we will stick to Chuvash language, mainly because uh, it is manually aligned and checked and actually, it is uh, the second in size, so uh, for quantitative reasons as well. Um, 
The processing of the data uh, didn't include much for the parent data because it was of good quality and we just did some additional shuffling. And the child data from the TIL corpus, it, uh, consist it contains some trash symbols, random numbers, but also uh, the Russian sentences were of good quality, but the uh, Hakas sentences, for some reason, they lacked punctuation at all and also uh, had some mistakes. But luckily, we had another corpus that consisted of 30,000 uh, pairs, uh, and uh, they were of good quality, and also they were the same sentences that were in TIL. So we replaced the translations that we were able to get from electronic corpus of the Kakas language, uh, and thus we improved um, the quality of half of the data set. Um, the next step was tokenization, and um, this was done by byte pair encoding. Uh, with dropout. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with this technology, I will briefly explain. Uh, so um, it goes like uh, you uh, split the sentences by uh, characters, and then you set up the amount of merging operations. So um, you first glue together the symbols that appear most often together in the text. So on the left side, you can see the traditional byte pair encoding. And the dropout uh, technique actually uh, is the same, but you just skip some merging operations. For example, you can see on the picture B that uh, on the left and the, on, in the middle, uh, the RE are glued together. And on the right one, the RE is skipped, and it starts with AT. So uh, this is a good way to um, kind of augment the data, because uh, when you split when you do the dropout several times on a, a source data and get uh, different um, tokenized sentences, you can then uh, assign uh, the same translation uh, to all of them, and you kind of uh, increase the amount of the data you can train it on. Uh, so here's the short information about the setting that uh, I used. Uh, I used transformer model in its classic uh, way from the original article. I optimized the blue metric. And I used the shared vocabulary between uh, Chuvash and Hakas data. Uh, the experiments uh, I did was uh, the increasing the share of the Hakas data in the vocabulary from being the same amount as Chuvash to uh, 1.5 uh, times larger. Another experiment um, included uh, dropout. Um, in uh, byte pair encoding. And the third one was adjusting the maximum sequence length parameter, because um, it turned out that 99% of the parent data was about 100 tokens long, and the child data, 75 tokens long. So we played with this parameter a little bit. And actually, it showed that um, all of these experiments combined show the best results uh, in metrics. Uh, comparing and uh, and has uh, quite a big improvement comparing to baseline. Uh, I also um, compared character F metric, which um, uh, compares uh, not word engrams but character engrams, and sometimes is considered better. Um, and uh, here um, I compared my results to other works on low resource languages, but this is maybe not very representative because uh, there's a lot of factors that um, uh, affect uh, the result of the model, especially for different languages, but just so that you can see um, how it generally works. What is more representative, though, is uh, examples of the sentences that uh, the model gave to us. Uh, you can see on the top example that uh, actually the meaning uh, of the resulting translation is like the same to the uh, to the reference translation. And uh, in the below example, you can see that sometimes the model still makes mistakes. Like um, here, it missed uh, the word the word to study basically. Uh, and the future work, uh, it may include uh, adjusting the number of byte pair encoding merging operations because uh, some uh, hypothesis includes that uh, the more morphological uh, the tokenization is, maybe the model will train better. Uh, also, traditional way is to expand the corpus and also trying uh, another Turkic or not Turkic language for the parent model. Um, so this is all, I think. And uh, I'm ready to answer your questions.
Okay, do we have a question? Oh, we have three questions. Uh, did you consider uh, pre-training in some on some other languages uh, to enable better um, transfer learning uh, capabilities? Let's say you pre-train on some some other languages in unsupervised or supervised way, uh, which might boost uh, performance for Kakas. Uh, yes, of course. This is a future work. We will try different languages and maybe just the. Uh, NLB model, whatever, um, so that uh, we can compare the results. Do, do you have any idea, like, uh, which languages are more beneficial, less beneficial? Uh, because some might hurt, some might improve. Uh, yes, actually, uh, I read some articles about this, and uh, the main uh, idea, I think, is to be um, similar in uh, morphological structure. Because, for example, when you translate from English to Russian, then in English it will be the same word for all the cases and things like that. And uh, it, it is difficult for, for the model to catch those, uh, uh, those differences. So the more complicated, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, the, parent, uh, the language for the parent model, uh, the better for the child model, since Hakas is very morphologically Eurasian. But, but not necessarily the same linguistic family. Uh, no, actually there are, um, there are studies that show that um, the size of the corpora makes the, the biggest difference. So they even uh, pre-trained, uh, I don't know, uh, on Finnish language and uh, fine-tuned on uh, Turkish, something like that. And they still managed to achieve some good results. Yeah, actually, some colleagues had similar experiments, and yeah, that was counterintuitive to me. But yeah, they pre-train on some completely different language, but with a similar morphological structure, and that actually gave a boost. Okay, so thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So I have. A, thank you for a talk. I have a small question. So uh, are you familiar with Hakas language, or are, is one of your colleagues uh, knows? It, how did you evaluate the results? Mm -hmm. uh, I am not familiar with Hakas language, but I know some Tatar, and it is quite similar, so I could actually visually evaluate it somehow. But uh, for the sake of uh, science, <laughs> uh, my translations were evaluated by the native speakers that I um, asked to do it. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a couple, just I think, technical questions. Could you please, maybe I've missed that, just elaborate a bit more what kind of model did you use? Uh, just transformer architecture with six encoder and six decoder layers and eight attention layers. Ah, I see. Okay, and um, with blue, right, um, what kind of, uh, I mean, for blue evaluation, what kind of tokenization did you use? Uh, it was. Uh, the, the same tokenization as for, for the, the training? The BPE thing? Yes, okay. yes. Well, uh, that's interesting because maybe uh, for the sake of, I don't know, getting a different view on uh, the quality, maybe you should try to, I don't know, try some, uh, some like, raw tokenization by, uh, or some, uh, I'm not sure about the existence of morphological Analyzer for Hakas language, but some something like stemming limitization and, or and raw tokens because this can give a different perspective on the evaluation. It's like uh, the same issue that was widely discussed at the time when uh, character level machine translation was popular. So that's a, a, a bit different thing. So and definitely worth comparing. I think. Uh, yes, I think we can do that. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I have not a question, but rather a suggestion. You have said that one of the corpora uh, uh, was in some other script, in, in Latin, probably. Uh, maybe you could use just uh, some transliteration scheme and uh, augment the, da the data that way? Uh, yes. Um, as I said, uh, we wanted to be in, it in Cyrillic because uh, we, we thought, uh, first we used the shared vocabulary, but the transliteration um, crossed our minds. But um, I actually didn't find the good transliteration tool. Because, uh, for example, for Turkish language, 
it is very difficult. Uh, it has many rules, and uh, to transliterate it to Cyrillic is uh, a very complicated separate task. So I didn't find the tool, and I I didn't go for this idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as I know, for like some languages uh, exist like specific transliteration schemes. So if someone has developed it, uh, it could be used. Um, I will have to look at it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Okay, more questions? If let me check with Zoom. Okay, we don't have questions in Zoom, so thank you. Thank for you very much. Talk. And the sec next talk will be online. Yes, that's true. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Zaitsev Alexei, and I'll be talking today about how difficult it is to uh, make an adversarial attack for machine translation models. Uh, I have two authors that did most part of the job, most part of the experiments in writing, and I want to thank them, Pavel Burnishov and Rizveta Kostina, who are participating in this project as well. So let's start on what and why we are doing. Uh, so basically, okay, all models, or most of the models we see today in NLP are uh, neural networks. And uh, we often see some very weird examples on how uh, they work if you know the right way to attack it, how to make it do what you want and what is, for example, prohibited by the model actors. Uh, so it seems like a good goal uh, to try to examine and how can we find some Thank big you. points of a model. Can you see? Can you hear me? Is we, everything well? Alexei, we can uh, yes, see yes, the we slides. Can. Let's wait a little bit. Oh, OK. OK. Um, maybe. OK, so what is the problem? Uh, we want to find some vulnerable points of the model. And we can try to find this with adversarial attacks. So basically, adversarial attacks are a way to find these vulnerabilities. We try to find in an efficient way on how can we break the model, how we alter the output of the model by small enough change of the input. Uh, for example, we can see the following uh, idea here. It's an example of an attack. Uh, in the bottom, so we have uh, some uh, model that tries to mark this uh, input flat misguided comedy. Uh, okay, to a label, in this case, you can see that it is definitely a negative review. And so we try to fix this input uh, with as small change as possible. So in this way, in this example, we change flat to VT, basically the meaning is almost the same. And in this case, the model outputs positive label, a marking that we uh, succeed, succeeded in breaking the model. And now the label is not correct because definitely it is still not a positive review, but okay, models think it is positive. Uh, so the question is how should we design such attacks to common classification models for NLP or, for example, translation models. Uh, so, okay, the problem, maybe the main problem for this area is that we don't have differentiability and uh, the search space for NLP is discrete and we somehow should move in the discrete space looking for adversarial attacks, for adversarial changes of the input uh, basically, what we can we can try to do, we can try to, for example, in code flip, uh, calculate the gradient with respect to a particular token in the input. And so we can try to say that if you have this first order approximation of what is going on, we can then find what and how we should change uh, to uh, change the loss. Most and what? what we are doing and what's a pretty successful strategy. And also we can try to use more advanced models. This was proposed in our previous paper. Uh, it is based on the idea that we uh, somehow should uh, modify the loss function when designing the adversarial attack. So basically what we can try to do. 
we have this input sequence x1 x is on the right, x1, x2, xc, and so on, xt, where d is the length of a sequence. And we want to train a generative model are to modify it. So now the output is some x prime, x1 prime, x2 prime, and so on. And so what we want from the sequence, we can formally express in the loss function. Uh, the first is a classifier. So we want the label of the output to be different from what we have for initial sequence. And this we can encode with this uh, second term here. And we are C capital is the score of a uh, model. Also, we can try to say that, uh, okay, we should not be far away. And this uh, deep Levenstein distance or whatever other distance like blur or similarity uh, we have, we wanted the similarity of X prime and X to be high in terms of how many tokens we change or in terms of some semantics metrics. And so in this case, we design the loss function and we can backpropagate this on the softmax trick into the generator and make it generate adversarial examples. This is what we can do. And this also transfers problem from a discrete optimization problem to continuous optimization problem. So we can try to adjust it. And uh, basically this idea is followed by another one that allows us to do practically the same thing but for machine translation model. Uh, basically, we try to find the change in the embedding space that leads to okay small change of the input, but a significant change in the output. So we look at this gradient, uh, the scalar product of the gradient of the adversarial loss and our embedding. We try to find the embedding that is good. And using this embedding, we generate back decode the adversarial sequence and also change, we hope that we will change significantly the output. And this we can proceed in different ways. Uh, for example, we can say that, okay, we have another, mo okay, we have this loss function and we focus on predicting blue and blue for uh, the initial sequence should be uh, high. So we should not change X significantly. But if you look at below for a pair of y and the adversarial translation y prime uh, should be significantly different. And we can directly organize flow of the gradients in all parts of this model and train it to generate, to find good candidates for adversarial attack. So it seems like a very natural approach, but does it work? Let's look at the results for... Uh, mm, Classification problem. Can we change with our generate uh, Dilma model the input and obtain uh, good results? And the thing is that yes, we can. And we what what we are looking for in this table? Uh, we have four problems, and we have the accuracy for these problems. Before attack, the scores of the accuracy is pretty high. It's like, for example, for AG is 0.95 here. Uh, but what's going on next? After different attacks, there are some sort attacks, and the last two approaches are different variants of power attack. And we see that if we use our top performing attack deal with this deep Levenstein distance, we have for some problems almost 0.5 accuracy. That means that we can almost broke the model here and here and significantly decrease the quality of the model for AG and FT problems. And so uh, what else we can look, we, what we usually should check as well is that our change in the meaning is pretty, is pretty small and we don't change much the semantics of the sentence. And we can try to achieve this uh, by looking at the scores of this, at this right part. This is a score of a discriminator. So what is discriminator classifier? Uh, we generate a sample of adversarial examples, adversarial uh, sentences, and we have a label that it is an adversarial se sequence, a label one. 
Also, we can check for label zero for a common natural uh, sentences from our sample. And we can try train the classifier. And we see that in many cases, this classifier are not very good for our attacks. It means that this discriminator, even after training, can distinguish adversarial examples and normal examples. It means that our generative model and this, our generative attack works pretty well if we try to solve the classification problem. But let's go to the main uh, goal of the paper. Let's try to check if we can do this for adversarial uh, attack on machine translation models. And basically, uh, what we do, we run the attack with different hyperparameter value that corresponds to the power of attack, how much we should corrupt the output or an input, because okay, it's definitely these two correlated things, how we change the input and the output. Okay, that what and next we can do, we try to assess the quality of what we are doing of the attack. So we basically look at some similarity score for the initial sentence, the changed sentence X prime after an attack, and the original translation, and the translation after an attack. So we want this guy similarity to be large, and this similarity to be small for a successful attack. So basically we need to plot both of them. So let's do this and look at what's going on. So we tried a different sort of attacks, okay, and see actually what's going on. So each point here is a different high parameters setting, different colors corresponds to different sort of attacks. And basically what where we want to be, we want to be here, where we have a similarity between initial bird and uh, okay for in, for initial sequence x and x prime attacked uh, but low similarity between the translation after the attack so between the y translated and y translated after the attack and as you can see for all metrics despite we want to be here we have small improvement i would say that okay for all class of methods, we have okay significantly lower the diagonal, which means that we significantly okay slightly or slightly lower the diagonal, which means that we slightly change the okay the change in the input and the output are pretty much the same. Okay, uh, and also an additional experiment shows that in sometimes we still can be pretty successful. Uh, we added another type of attacks. That's called uh, character-based attacks. We sw swap, swapped characters, and also we combine this with the gradients, and we can see a new group of uh, points here that again corresponds uh, to the different uh, num for the different hyper parameters. And generally, we see that we change the input less than we change the output. It means that in this case, we can attack machine translation models. Basically, we think that this effect comes from the idea that uh, we need to find some big spots of uh, deep uh, translation models. And basically, it's not an easy task. And we should focus on something that is lies outside, outside of a training sample for such models. And swaps of characters make us uh, to get here and to improve over the baselines. So basically it means that uh, if you want to change the classification label, uh, we still can try to find some change uh, in the input to get okay change of this label with very small perturbation of the input. If you look at machine translation models, uh, the situation is different. Uh, typical approaches doesn't work here. And uh, what we can do is try to go to the character level. And in this case, we are pretty much successful. So we can say that, OK, machine translation models are pretty strong, like many other sequence to sequence models, as we think. So that's all about my talk. And do you have any questions? Any questions? OK, we don't have question in the audience. Oh, we have one question in the audience. 
understood you right, but uh, uh, do you check uh, that the sentence that uh, you change, for example, um, about uh, uh, the review that you showed in the beginning, yes. uh, do, you, do you check uh, that uh, the actual meaning of it stayed uh, negative, uh, but the label changed? So yes, yes, I can try to show some examples from the paper. And you can see that typically, okay, we change, the change is pretty small. And uh, if we show this to a human, uh, we would say that uh, this, it still would identify something like this. Okay, the first example may say that this changes to something okay, that's not very meaningful. Uh, here we say that, okay, human can say, okay, it's a misprint, but definitely it's a gallon. But after translation, we see that Okay, the translation is pretty, pretty, pretty different, and the meaning is not the same for even machine translation for kind of some successful examples. Uh, so you check that the meaning stays the same while the yeah. label changes. Yes, right? yes. Uh, actually, okay. If uh, talking about the first paper, we even did some human evaluation, and they say that in most cases the meaning is pretty same. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. And okay, the next also will be online. Uh, good day, everyone. <laughs> um, let us start. So the prevalence of online shopping has made it the foremost method for purchasing various goods. The online customer reviews play a crucial role in providing valuable insights into customers' interests and knowledge of the product. But how can we discover the insights automatically and formulate them? Our paper, User Review Summarization in Russian, researches this question. So what is User Review Summarization? Uh, well, uh, the logical extension of text summarization is multi-document summarization, where we summarize uh, multi-documents. Uh, but from the multi-document summarization stems the opinion or user review summarization, which uses the specifics of human opinion presentation in various sources on the internet. Um, here on the slide, you can see an example of user review summarization. The input consists of reviews covering different features of the entity in different colors, and the summarization model should analyze given reviews and produce a summary which should cover all the reviewers' opinions. Uh, so the research uh, researchers in the field explore both supervised and unsupervised settings, but while supervised setting is widely used due to its effectiveness, it's obvious, uh, it requires golden summaries for training, which can be extremely difficult and resource intensive to produce. Moreover, uh, actually, the majority of the existing studies focus solely on the English data uh, and neglect non-English languages because they lack publicly accessible resources. Uh, this hampers the opportunity for broadening our understanding of cross-linguistic properties of our summarization, and we uh, try to change it to uh, collect the data set. Uh, in recent years, the researchers suggested a lot of methods for opinion summarization. Some of them suggest using automatic data aggregation, while others use weak supervision in the form of seed words for further major topics identification. Uh, some articles suggest using information about such topics or aspects uh, to model summary generation. During our work on the project, we experimented with the best performing contemporary abstractive and extractive models from the articles on the screen. Uh, we employ different methods which use sentiment and aspect information to create a summary. Uh, as our work focuses generally on the data and training and not on the architectures, uh, let us overview only the main ideas of these methods. Uh, so uh, the first method that we will be reviewing is plan sum. It extracts sentiment and aspects distribution from the data and then fuses these distributions and token embeddings. Uh, the result of the fusion are then fed, fed into LSTM decoder with attention, which composes the actual summary. Uh, another, uh, another method, ASUM, uh, does not have a colorful scheme, but mainly it uses multiple instance learning model from the previous works of the authors to induce aspect controllers and then feed them into the transformer model, the original transformer model. 
the controllers are actually calculated using uh, with supervision in the form of uh, manually collected seed words. Uh, another uh, method is quantized transformer, uh, which uses transformer encoder and decoder to quantize the sentences of the reviews to find the average opinions, so as valuable aspects, and formulate it with the existing, uh, using the existing sentences. And the last work which we review in uh, this project uh, is the semantic coding encoder, uh, which continues the work of quantized transformer, but creates the distribution of aspects and uh, just ranks them and chooses the top elements as the basis of the summary. Uh, so let's talk about the data. Uh, the standard data sets for opinion summarization uh, in English language are Rotten Tomatoes, Yelp, Amazon, OppoSum, and Space data sets, each presenting data in different domains. Unfortunately, from our knowledge, there are no publicly available data sets for user review summarization in Russian, and the majority of Russian online services do not allow to use their data. Therefore, the data was collected from the open internet source tripadvisor.ru with the help of web scrapping. Resembling uh, the collection of space data set, we collected around 1 million reviews of hotels from 11 cities and structured the data in a convenient way. As requested by one of the reviewers, which will also show the statistics of the collected data sets, uh, some of the data distributions. But uh, as you can see, the statistics are fairly similar among the uh, train, test, and validation splits. Uh, uh, the labeling process for the validation and test splits of our data sets involved manual annotation uh, by us, the authors. Uh, similar to space data sets, 25 summaries per split, we created 28 summaries per split. We wanted to compare the performance of the models trained on the collected Russian data and the existing English data sets, which is why we followed the annotation of space data set. Uh, the set of aspects was taken from ACE SUM paper, translated uh, to Russian and fixed for manual summary construction. Every hotel was labeled based on 50 reviews certified by rating to ensure that both low and high rating reviews are present in the data. Uh, we manually filtered the concepts and phrases corresponding to specific aspects and chose the most repetitive of them as a summary basis. We, well, we admit that uh, the human written summaries might provide some restrictions on the operation of models and leave this for further research. Uh, we choose uh, models uh, with the highest metric values on space and Amazon data sets, which utilize aspects information for the correct comparison on the Russian language data set. Uh, during our experiments, we trade abstractive and extractive methods and compare their performance. Some methods were not taken into consideration uh, because they either utilize self-supervised learning apart from unsupervised learning in these methods, or propose novel algorithms which do not consider sentiment and aspects information. For our experiments, we employ the Rouge metric because it is a standard metric uh, in this area. Uh, we also experimented with changing methods, pre-processing and seed words extraction steps, but uh, as these did not lead to any improvements, we wouldn't stop on this. Uh, here you can see uh, the results of different models evaluation. All the models were trained on the collected data, uh, but the models with FT postfix were additionally fine-tuned on the small part of translated space data set. While the evaluation on the collected data set shows clear dominance of fine-tuned ACE sum, evaluation on the space data set shows several well-performing models, among them fine-tuned ACE sum, which showed the highest bigram rouge metric, and variations of plant sum, uh, which show higher unigram and longest common subsequence, subsequence metrics. Uh, so, uh, having conducted a manual analysis of the produced summaries, which can be also uh, found in the paper, we found out that abstractive summaries contain more specifics from the reviews. Extractive summaries contain more general information. But on the other hand, quantized transformer and semantic code encoders, uh, so as extractive uh, summarizers, included personal information in their summaries. And plant sum, which pro uh, produces more human readable texts, catches in direct relation to aspects, while ACE sum described the fixed aspects more precisely, uh, but with limited lexical variety. 
Uh, so, in this work, we explore the application of modern solutions to the Russian language user review summarization. We managed to collect around 1 million reviews of hotels and annotated parts of the data for evaluation. We compared models from unsupervised and weakly supervised settings. Uh, the best performing models among uh, the approaches were adapted for the Russian language analysis and trained and fine-tuned to summarize the opinions in the hotel domain. Uh, our conclusion is that abstractive approaches outperform extractive approaches on the collected Russian dataset in contrast to findings for English data presented in the recent article proposing the semantic autoencoder model. So specifically, uh, the best performing model on our data is a sum, uh, and uh, on the space data set are planned some variations. Uh, further research may focus on the stylistic limitations of human written summaries for better model performance, uh, coherence and readability analysis uh, of the summaries and ways to improve them, researching uh, the self-supervised methods, which are actually excluded from the comparison, uh, as some of the well-performing models on the standard data sets. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I think about three slides ago, you've uh, provided quite a cool, yeah, this one, uh, quite a cool summary of the specifics of each models and of their performance on the reviews you've collected. And I wonder, is it possible to, well, some of, some of, the, some of this, specifics clearly are, but uh, is it possible to uh, measure all of these effects? Were you, um, I don't know, going to do that? Uh, it's actually, uh, uh, first of all, it, uh, these are the findings of the work we've done, so it may differ from uh, more general information, uh, but that's what we found out. Uh, and secondly, uh, it was uh, measured manually, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, because the test and validation uh, splits are actually not, uh, not that big, so we managed to measure it manually. I see. Could you please remind me what was the size of, uh, you know, the data sets uh, based, the, the, the size of the, of the part of the data set that you were, um, you know, making the conclusions on, based on? Uh, okay, so, so uh, we followed the annotation of space data set, uh, which actually, actually achieves some kind of good results. Uh, they had 25 uh, hotel summaries. So for every hotel, we have uh, a review set around 100 or 200 of uh, reviews. Uh, and for each of the hotel, we create a summary. So uh, they had 25 summaries for uh, validation split and four taste splits. So uh, overall, 50 summaries. And we uh, had 28 summaries for both splits, so 56 uh, summaries in total. I see. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering, do you consider now only the hotel reviews or do you plan to do more on other topics? or it's just hotels now? I am kind of missed it from the talk. Uh, so, uh, the stand, as you can see, uh, the standard data sets, oh, uh, you can see it, but uh, anyway, uh, the standard data sets uh, review the different domains, but we chose the space data set uh, because it uh, stated the most clearly the procedure of uh, uh, collecting and annotating the reviews, and it was, uh, uh, the easiest domain to start from. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, it is a bright prospect of the research to try uh, with different uh, domains, which were actually done in English data uh, in different uh, articles. So yes, the answer is yes. Thank you. Okay, more questions? We don't have questions in the audience. Zoom part? Okay, I guess we don't have questions yes. on the Zoom. Well, we do have questions. Have? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, just a quick question. Thanks for the talk. And uh, as far as I understand, uh, you annotated the reviews. Well, you you wrote the summaries for the reviews based on a set of aspects taken from like one of the prior works, right? And of course, 
this choice of the aspects influence the sum, the resulting summary is quite a lot. So uh, do you think if you choose another set of uh, aspects, your findings would be much different? Uh, about this, uh, we actually uh, explored this uh, avenue. Uh, so we tried to find uh, the seed water extraction methods in order to uh, comprise a different set of aspects, uh, different from the aspects from ASAM. Uh, and we tried uh, all the different word embeddings, uh, all the different uh, methods described in different papers, uh, but actually uh, it didn't produce any better metrics uh, according to uh, like summarization metrics rule, uh, which is why we stick to the ACE sum uh, set of aspects. Uh, but uh, if anyone could find a, a better way to extract uh, aspects, uh, this could be uh, another uh, MU of the research. Yeah, I guess it was not exactly what my question was about because you evaluate your model on uh, the summaries which are written by humans taking into account some set of aspects. So the, your gold standard will be different if the aspects are different, right? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so yes, uh, the the production of summaries was based uh, on uh, the, set, the given set of aspects. Uh, the mm -hmm. set of aspects was taken from the ACE uh, sum uh, method. Uh, and they actually like provided it uh, because they collected it manually uh, from a great uh, uh, like uh, uh, from a great experience, uh, human written, and they extracted the most valuable aspects. Uh, but if we had another aspects, we could also experiment with that. Yeah, so my question was about your expectation. So if, uh, for example, your current set of aspects uh, include uh, includes things like cleanliness of the apartment, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, like the food uh, quality, etc. But if um, if you choose some completely different set of aspects, I don't know, just like the easiness of uh, finding the hotel or something like mm -hmm. that, uh, do you think that your ranking, like the, uh, you, uh, your results will still be the same? What is your expectation? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're yeah, in uh, okay, experiments uh, or not. Just, yeah. uh, I understand that. Uh, it is uh, quite difficult because uh, the model generates, uh, well, uh, generates the summary based on what it was trained on. Uh, so I guess uh, it can find different uh, aspects and it would uh, give uh, even lower quality, but uh, better summary, <laughs> if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, so probably Rouge uh, for that purpose is not the best metric, uh, but it, uh, the one that uh, uh, we used because we had the fixed set of aspects. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I guess uh, we should announce that. Please don't forget that we will announce the best uh, paper during the closing session. So please make sure to attend it so as to learn uh, what is the best paper in the NLP track. Okay, so let me just first introduce you. So, yeah, sure. Thank you for, ca for coming. So, uh, Artem was uh, supposed to be here, but unfortunately, for some personal reasons, uh, had to cancel his um, trip last minute. Uh, nevertheless, it's a great pleasure to me to present uh, another very interesting speaker uh, from Emirates today. Uh, Artyom, uh, I know him uh, since uh, 2019, and I should say that uh, he always amazed me by his energy dedication to NLP research and uh, to dedication to uh, the topic as well which he's going to present today over this years. Uh, so I've seen how Artyom emerged uh, into really a leader uh, in this topic, in this field. Uh, he studied a lot on um, active learning and certain estimation techniques and published extensively at the very top conferences and continue to do so. So his record track in NLP uh, is really impressive. And um, today we will learn uh, about this very important, uh, I, I think, topic uncertainty, quantification and generation for NLP and more specifically for LLMs. So without further ado, Artyom, please. 
go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind words. I'm very apologize that I cannot uh, be there in person because of our health issues. But never mind. I mean, uh, let's uh, dive into a very interesting topic. I currently I mostly um, work on safety of NLP models in several ways. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead. So uh, we'll have some introduction and some estimation background. Yeah, this topic will be more uh, focused on uncertainty estimation uh, and uh, especially on uncertainty estimation for language models. I will also present our last effort regarding, uh, you know, summarizing and uh, systemizing these um, diverse works on uncertainty estimation for language models in one package, in one Python library. And finally, we will conclude with some suggestions. All right, so first thing first, we know that uh, language models are very good, become, becoming very good in multiple tasks. And basically, regardless of what task you'll pick up, you'll find something like that on uh, the, the papers with code that we um, approach or exceed the human baseline. You can see that, um, well, most every uh, task might be considered as salt, or maybe most of them, um, middle complexity tasks are solved. But uh, playing performance as accuracy is not the only thing that we want to pursue. There are uh, also safety, and this um, safety uh, is related to two other aspects. Uh, first of all, is bias and reliability. So let's start with uh, bias. So what do we usually have? Uh, we have some you know, data with uh, some problems with maybe some garbage maybe, and maybe some biases, some, you know, biases, purest correlation between target variables and some, you know, un, some feature that shouldn't be really uh, be taken into account. And we train a model and we get, of course, a bias model that picks up on these particular dependencies and use them to do these predictions, which is, of course, not good. Uh, because, well, we can... Think about many biases. For example, one of bias, like if you classify a mood a uh, person by a picture and you pick up like a color of his eyes as a feature, that's probably a, a one example for bias which you shouldn't take into account because, of course, like the color of the eyes doesn't makes any sense for predicting uh, the mood. But uh, due to your data, you can you know pick it pick it up as a viable feature and use it uh, in the future. So what we want to do is in debiasing in fairness, we have like a garbage data with some biases and eventually getting a, an unbiased a good model. So what how we can do this? Um, yeah, one of one important case of uh, bias in NLP, which is uh, usually considered, is social biases and stereotypes, like uh, depending on gender, race, uh, age, uh, and here's one example where we try to determine the uh, profession of a person, that where we try to determine the occupation of a person, want to determine whether he will, well, whether a person will be a surgeon or a nurse. And uh, we can find out that sometimes classifiers just look at the gender of the person and just put all women to nurses category and all males to the surgeon category, which is completely unfair and should be avoided, of course, in practice, because if we do this, we will facilitate biases in the data in our safety, the stereotypes. So uh, how we can deal with this? Well, there are a few techniques that we can um, apply to our models, these devising techniques that, you know, uh, reduce the um, importance, uh, re reduce the effect of bias in the original training data. First, we can um, reweight instances in the, in the training data. So, you know, the signal from the loss, um, from the training loss will not um, bring this um, spurious correlation between protected attribute and the target variable. Another case is when we try to unlearn or forget about uh, some protected attributes in our representation, future representations. And here, for example, we have this additional loss component that um, help us to forget about like gender, race, and other stuff. So the model cannot uh, predict from the future representations these uh, protected features. So eventually it becomes uh, less biased 
more uh, balanced. All right, that's how we deal with a, a bias. Now let's go to reliability. Okay, so what is reliability and why we should care? First of all, let's look at this uh, an example. As you can see, there's like a banking application where a person asks for his balance. Um, and uh, well, this banking application works perfectly fine when the questions are related to the topic. But when a person asks something unrelated, like from the sports, it tries to answer his request in the way it was trained for, uh, trained to do, and it fails because it answers gibberish, something which is, shouldn't be answered. And that is an example of out of distribution uh, question uh, where the person asks something from the domain, which is not part of the training domain of the model. So instead it should be probably saying that, okay, sorry, I can't answer your question because it's is not my type of concern, not of my type of uh, domain knowledge. So, all right, so that's one of the example of out of distribution input. Another example, uh, well, a little bit more critical, safe critical application, diagnosis in medicine, where we have, for example, some symptoms, input symptom, symptoms, or maybe anamnesis of a person, and your model has to make a diagnosis, which might be affect the treatment of a person in the of the patient in the future. And of course, um, there might be some out of domain questions, uh, like it should that it should try to avoid, try to ask a person for the help. But it also can be some situations where we have something like very close uh, diseases like SARS and COVID, and it's very difficult to distinguish between, between them with uh, this particular amount of information you have. So you probably should try to ask uh, for a physician or a real person or another more complex system to make a decision for that instead of like um, making a diagnosis that probably can harm the patient in the future. So that's two examples. Let's go ahead. So what we have in reliability, uh, we have to always remember that model capabilities are very limited. First, due to limited amount of data it was trained on, there's always like a training data set and it's limited. And uh, going beyond this data set always uh, has a risk of, you know, uh, making more model answers completely unreliable. And it's also a situation when our task has ambiguities, like in SARS and COVID, uh, where it's very difficult to dist distinguish these two diseases with a lack of information, like lack of features. So this uh, second thing, ambiguity in the task uh, is another concern. We have to spot these areas of ambiguity and also try to abstain from making any decisions in, in these. So what we need to do to achieve reliability is to develop mechanisms that take into account these limitations when the model is deployed. And reliability is basically a capability of our system to, you know, to apply this mechanism in a perfect way to detect out of distribution instances, uh, detect ambiguity and many other stuff, like maybe adversarial attack detection. So, okay, so how to handle reliability, how to make your model reliable. This slide is a little bit marketing here because uh, basically we're promoting here some of our work, which was published in ACL in 2022 and 2023 and, and other conferences actually. Uh, there are some you know, solutions to a reliability problem in terms of selective classification and audio detection. Uh, the last one will be published in uh, ACL this year. It is intersection between bias, debiasing and uncertainty. Uh, but of course, there'll be a lot of, uh, there are many more works in NLP uh, and uncertainty for NLP, and we will discuss them later. Just a small slide here about our work. Okay, so our new concerns, what we have uh, today, today we have generated generative AI era, and in generative AI, AI era, you know, models can generate something inappropriate, something that shouldn't be generated. And in particular case with ChatGPT here, um, there's a, is a case where it you know gives an incorrect answer. Here we can see that um, well we're asking how many letters in the word nineteen and it's incorrect. Then we ask uh, when we try confuse model even more and it becomes even more confused. So yeah, this happens all the time with uh, 
language models and um, be sure I would I check this um, example for this uh, you know lecture. And well, the first one was fixed, but the second one is not fixed. You can conf still confuse the model into thinking that there are like any number of letters in the word 19. Another example, um, I apologize uh, uh, before uh, Alex Panchenko for that, but uh, this is a question about his biography, like tell me about Alex Panchenko and the model also hallucinates some facts about his biography and very confidently say that he's a professor. I mean, like, he will be probably in the near future, but uh, right now he's not a full professor in Hamburg, but it pretty uh, convincing in saying that, well, um, uh, some, saying some false facts about Alex. And that happens all the time with uh, such kind of models. So what we have, what concerns we have in uh, the area of generative AI. So models can generate unacceptable output, and we should first consider the hallucinations, like the false facts that they generate. We also should consider something like toxicity, uh, because you know the data can, the model can be trained on can have some leaks of toxic uh, toxic text, and we should avoid that. We also should care about truthfulness, because sometimes model cannot do the task, and it should be quite explicit about that. I cannot do this. It should be truthful. And also one thing which is commonly uh, put into consideration is personality, that the model should not pretend somebody else. It should be explicit about its personality, that it is a model, it is like a, like assistant, it's not a, some sort of like a human professor, et cetera, giving you this answer. So how to deal with these uh, problems? Uh, in general, there are a few ways to do this already, and people are you know, applying currently to all this uh, G uh, language models, like Yandex GPT, ChatGPT, um, and others. It's uh, reinforcement learning, of course, where models is trained on a big amount of, you know, scores of assessors to, and they these scores are essentially aimed to reduce bias, reduce toxicity, reduce uh, many other issues with the model. There are other approaches to this problem, like contrastive learning. You can also just fine tune on some good answers that people craft by themselves. Also, you can uh, do some filtering of the input data or output results with a stop list and other stuff. One of the colleagues that were visiting the MBCI was from Microsoft Turing and said he like stop list is a way to go with the language models. Very good thing. It works much better than anything else. Uh, fact checking and another stream of work where people try to look at the output of the model and do some you know fact check checking with the databases. And finally, which is, uh, I think, one of the most important and most um, interesting for me is uncertainty estimation. Like, can we apply uncertainty estimation in, for language models? All right, first of all, let's just go through uncertainty estimation uh, background, uh, I hope, pretty fast. Uh, again, let's consider one small example here. Consider we have a classifier that is trained to distinguish cats and dogs. And it works perfectly when it has perfect picture of cat and perfect picture for dog. It works good. It predicts what it was intended to do. But what we have uh, here is uh, something weird, which you know cannot be classified into a cat or dog um, uh, class. Um, here, probably, in models should uh, output something around 0 0.5, like something 0 0.49 or 0 0.59 to demonstrate that it's something weird, it's something super uncertain, and maybe we should call a person or something else to uh, work with this image. But unfortunately, like um, this probability scores that obtained through softmax classifiers are not very good. The, the reason is here. The softmax probability it gives you, it can be used as a, uh, as a certain estimation score, but unfortunately it gives you uncertainty like this. So in most of the area, you are completely certain here and here, and you only uncertain in this small decision area between two classes. 
And that's what we get from a software classifier. But in case of our example with the cat and dog, this cat and dog image can appear like anywhere. It might appear something like here, here. And of course, in these areas, we will be completely certain and we will predict a particular class. So overconfidence is the problem of software explorability and certainty estimation. So what we really want to have is something like on the right picture where everywhere we, we don't have any particular evidence uh, and we don't have any training data, we are un uncertain and also we are uncertain in the area between two classes. That's uh, what we want to have. All right, so that's why we cannot use softmax probabilities. Uh, well, we can, but sometimes it doesn't really what we want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what is uncertainty in particular? Well, there is no unified way of uh, specifying uncertainty scores. It can be anything which works very well for us for our task, like audit detection or selective classification. It might be like some sort of distances, probabilities, entropy, of course, or error, uh, estimation of an error. Uh, but well, in biasing theory, there is a particular way of defining uncertainty. And this is basically a entropy of a probability distribution. Considering we have a training data and uh, we can, well, we can um, uh, esti we can help, um, say that uncertainty is basically an entropy of pr uh, predictive distribution. And this predictive distribution can be parameterized with a neural network. And of course, if we are Bayesian, we probably would like to put some sort of like a prior on our uh, parameters. So they have also some sort of distribution and then if we then we can rewrite our predictive distribution in this way. So we have um, this formula, which we can substitute put it into the predictive um, entropy formula and get something like this. But of course, um, I mean, in we, we could we could could do this in a Bayesian way. We could you know try to um, uh, try to estimate everything. Uh, correctly using some sort of uh, approach uh, from the Bayesian theory, we can do some variational inference, etc. But uh, usually we don't have an access to, we don't have a way to do this. Usually the Bayesian neural networks uh, is very hard to train and they are usually very difficult. They also have several drawbacks like storing additional weights and, and, and other stuff. So, um, Let's go back to types of uncertainty and look at our uh, classifier again. Here we have a situation where we have a lot of uh, information, a lot of data, and we have a lineal classifier that tries to distinguish two classes. Uh, but unfortunately, in this area, small area between classes, these classes overlap. This is an example of high aleatoric uncertainty where we have noise in the data, where we cannot uh, easily distinguish between two classes just simply by drawing a line. So in this situation, we are saying that we have high aleatoric uncertainty, which is related to noise and ambiguity in the data. Another situation where we have lack of uh, data and we have uh, some sort of freedom to draw this uh, linear classifier in various ways, uh, and it will you know, perfectly uh, you know, distinguish two classes, but eventually uh, the situation like, like um, here is ambiguous for us because again, this might be a training set, but in the real situation, some data can be located here and this data can be attributed to one of these classes. Uh, so in this case, we say that we have high uh, epistemic uncertainty, which is related to lack of knowledge. So we don't have enough uh, information, not enough data to draw this uh, classification boundary. All right, so by definition, uh, the whole predictive uncertainty is basically a sum of epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty. And uh, then what we can uh, do is to write some, you know, um, I would say from, from the um, previous uh, formulas, we can derive several formulas for epistemic uncertainty and for aleatoric uncertainty. First of all, let's look at epistemic uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty is basically, as I said, it's a lack of information. So what we here uh, define epistemic uncertainty as uh, information that we get uh, about model parameters after we see uh, the target variable y 
for the object X. So this is how like our knowledge about model parameters change after we get information about this particular instance. So if we rewrite this formula a little bit, uh, we eventually get this uh, formula where we subtract our predictive uncertainty from uh, this term, which is basically an expectation of entropy for each particular realization of model parameters. All right, and uh, okay, so what is aleatoric uncertainty then? Well, by definition, we have that uh, predictive uncertainty the sum of epistemic uncertainty, aleatoric uncertainty. So simply we can derive a formula for aleatoric uncertainty here. Um, so this is basically this expectation of entropy uh, of, of predictive distribution for each realization of model parameters. So again, uh, in Bison theory, we have like perfect uh, formulas for these uh, things, but in, in reality, we cannot, uh, you know, estimate them directly. It's quite difficult where there are several ways to do that in Bison modeling, of course, like back, uh, Bison backprop, uh, variation inference, et cetera, et cetera. But usually people don't do this because it's a little bit more uh, complicated and a bit, little bit more uh, um, overhead to do that, and it's very hard to train Bison models right now. Uh, again, let's uh, look at this formula. So predictive uncertainty is the sum of epistemic and lateral uncertainty. Uh, we can see that epistemic uncertainty is a mutual information between uh, model parameters and uh, uh, target variable, and aleatoric uncertainty is a is an expectation of uh, this entropy of, of each. Uh, realization of uh, each realization of model parameters. And again, let's look at how um, like uncertainties look on the charts. We have some sort of like two moons data set. Aleatoric uncertainty will be basically this uh, line between two classes. This is a decision boundary. Uh, Pacific uncertainty is basically all area around this training data set. And then we sum these two uh, uncertainties together, so we get this predictive uh, uncertainty. So we have both uh, certain areas in the like in the area without training data and between these two classes. Uh, some words about where we apply different types of uncertainties. Uh, Electric uncertainty usually can be used for like cleaning data. We can spot some noise in the data sets. Um, like epistemic uncertainty here can be used to detect outliers. Of course, it can be used to, for a desirable type detection. And there's also um, a possibility to use it as, um, um, as a criteria for active learning, for selection criteria in active learning. Uh, total uncertainty is used for selective classification, and that is kind of more the most critical thing for uh, safe critical applications where we need to abstain from uh, making a decision. Some, some, uh, somewhere, for example, in medical applications. All right, uh, let's just have a very broad overview of methods for uncertainty estimation. Uh, we'll get to, in particular, realizations of these methods where we discuss particular methods for language models. So in general, very strong approach to incentive estimation is basically using ensemble of uh, models and look at the diversity of predictions of these ensembles, of these uh, ensemble elements. So if while well, the diversity is high, the uncertainty is high, uh, the same thing you can do with the Monte Carlo dropout. Monte Carlo dropout is a technique where you make not one prediction, but multiple predictions, but you enable your dropout layer. So each prediction becomes a little bit different from uh, one another. And you can assume it's, it as a cheaper version of ensemble. We, we don't, you don't need to train multiple models, but you just have like uh, one model, but you apply different dropout masks and you get a little bit different predictions. And again, like we are looking at diversity of predictions. If diversity is high, then certainty is high. Uh, there's also density-based methods where we try to approximate our training distribution with some uh, with some uh, models uh, based on the latent feature representation. So we just try to um, create um, 
a data dis training data distribution and analyze whether our instance belongs to the training distribution or not. And finally, there are some techniques uh, related to training loss regularization. Training loss regularization, uh, well, uh, you add a regularizer to the loss. It helps you to calibrate your model a little bit. Sometimes it's also can be helpful in selective classification. Okay, so why is sentence estimation for language models is hard? Well, first of all, we have not one, but multiple prediction, uh, predict, pred predictions uh, in a sequence. Uh, these decisions uh, are based uh, on various sampling algorithms. We also can get the final sequence, not just uh, like simply looking at the maximum, pro uh, maximum probability token, but have a multiple uh, beams uh, and select the beam in, in the end. And of course, we should remember that predictions of language models are can it's hard to normalize them because again, each like uh, sequence, um, well, you can drink infinite number of possible sequences and how to estimate the probability of each of each of these sequence and how to normalize them. So this is basically a very uh, hot uh, topic for um, hot ongoing research topic right now. Okay, finally, we get to the ascent estimation for language models. Let's look at what we have. Again, the simplest uh, techniques are very similar to what we have for the, like, uh, for the standard classification models. We can look, for example, on maximum sequence probability here. It's basically, we can uh, estimate the probability of a sequence by just multiplying the probabilities of each decision in a sequence and you know, subtract, it, subtract it and get our uncertainty score. Uh, there's also like a very common thing is to have an average of uh, log probabilities of our tokens. Uh, well, sometimes it is called perplexity, sometimes it's called normalized log probability. Again, it depends on what, whether you do exponentiation or not. And also you can simply just, you know, calculate entropy for each particular token and average it. And there are many other, you can, Figure out, you can uh, think about many other ways of uh, aggregating individual predictions of, of for each individual token, uh, but these are just the most uh, common ones in the literature. Okay, okay a little bit more uh, complicated stuff. I mean, not the complicated stuff, but a little bit more you know, interesting stuff. It's uh, point-wise mutual information here, for example. Uh, it's a way of uh, addressing uh, um, it's a way of addressing uh, that some uh, sometimes model outputs gen generic uh, stuff, and basically maybe the uncertainty of this gener uh, generic stuff is not that crucial. So I mean, like if we uh, if it outputs something very generic, uh, maybe we shouldn't be that much uncertain about that. So there's a uh, approach to correct uh, things with this additional uh, with this additional term where we simply run the model with some um, query and run the model without query. And uh, so we look at how the model, uh, how the sequence, uh, what, it is, what is the probability of sequence without any particular input, how generic it is. Uh, a little bit more complicated uh, way of doing this is uh, conditional point-wise mutual information. This uh, is an idea uh, where we uh, basically fall back to the simple perplexity, but sometimes where we are very uh, uncertain, we look at, at the probability of the generic uh, sequence. So this is basically it. So uh, most, of, most of the time we are using this term, but sometimes if this entropy is high enough, we also uh, add this uh, term with the generic uh, model. It's a little bit faster. Uh, the, then this one and works also a little bit better. Okay, um, assembling. Um, I will not spend a lot of time on assembling here. Unfortunately, compared to like classification, assembling in generation were not that uh, good. I mean, classification is one of very reliable algorithms. Assembling uh, usually, if assemble doesn't give you any improvements, probably nothing will do. But in uh, but in uh, sequence generation ensembles, uh, according to our experiments, do, do not perform that that well. 
Anyways, so for example, we can do uh, the same stuff as before. We can just look at the average probability from each of the uh, ensemble element. Uh, we also can look at the average uh, log probability, of course. And there's also not a uh, more stronger um, technique, which was suggested by Malini and Gales, is a reverse mutual information where we uh, look at uh, the logarithms also of the each realization of, of each individual uh, ensemble element. Note that uh, we also could use some sort of, sort of like Monte Carlo uh, dropout here, but um, Monte Carlo dropout in sequence generation works a little bit worse again. And note that you probably need uh, to keep uh, the same dropout masks across multiple uh, sequence generations to keep your uh, scores uh, good enough. Um, yeah, all right. So uh, density-based methods, these are quite strong methods, especially for out of distribution detection. In uh, here are two papers that propose these techniques uh, for, for OD detection in sequence duration tasks. These are, this is our work, which was published on ACL in 2023, and very concurrent work, which was published on iClear in 2023 also. Um, basically, this is the idea of uh, using the density-based techniques in um, sequence duration. It's basically the same stuff. Uh, in uh, classification, uh, we use so-called math numbers distance as a certain estimation uh, metric, uh, certain estimation score. And you compute it uh, like this. So uh, the idea behind that is that you estimate the probability of, you estimate the conditional probability of your particular instance belonging to some sort of class in your training data. Like for example, here we are looking at the probability of X belonging to yellow class. And we say that, well, this probability is basically a normal distribution with a centroid, in, with, a, uh, with a parameter M in the center of this uh, class with the covariance matrix uh, uh, sigma, which might be a co uh, computed uh, just looking at the, this particular class or at the whole data set. Uh, this is just a different ways of computing Holmes distance. So if you do the durations correctly, you will eventually get uh, this um, Holmes uh, distance score. So assembly will be basically the distance between the centroid of your class uh, to your um, to your data point, where, which you are trying to estimate uncertainty for, um, and the higher this distance is, the more uncertain you are. So, because your point is lying far away from the training data, and uh, well, in of course, in sequence generation tasks, you don't have particular classes. So, basically, in sequence generation, we have only one single class where you have uh, all the training data in one this signal class, you compute this uh, centroid, you compute the covariance matrix, and then you can estimate the uh, distances between centroid and uh, your mm, instance in question. Uh, okay, so how do we, so what, what is H here? H is a representation of our instances and uh, in sequence to sequence models, we have two options here. We have an encoder and decoder, and we tested both of them and they work pretty well. In, uh, you can take the representations of each uh, of the input sequence um, and average them. And you have a, a, an embedding of the input uh, question, input uh, query. But you also can do the same thing with the output. You can get the embeddings of all output tokens and also average them and get this embedding of uh, the output sequence. So then we can compute this, we can compute uh, the covariance matrix, we can compute the centroids, of course, using our training data and determine whether, we, uh, whether this instance is out of distribution or not. Pretty uh, simple. All right. Uh, there are two modifications of that. One is based on uh, is basically Mahal's distance plus PCA plus minimal covariance determinant. PCA helps us to reduce the dimensionality of our representations and reduce the effect of outliers. The same thing goes with the minimal covariance determinant. It helps to uh, filter out some noise when we compute the covariance matrix. 
Uh, and uh, okay, there's another option is relative Mahabas distance where we calculate Mahabas distance of uh, for our particular point and we subtract uh, the distance to the some sort of like global central uh, the centroid of the background collection. In this case, we have a big background collection like maybe C4 data set. We uh, calculate the centroid for the C4 data set and look how close our instance to this uh, centroid. And he, this idea is just like that. Uh, we don't want to be high and certain for very common, uh, for very common uh, sequences to very common queries to very co common outputs. So we are, in this case, we are uncertain only when we are both far away from the training data and far away from like the pre-training data set. Okay. Um, all right, semantic entropy. This is one. Uh, okay, so uh, let me reiterate with density based methods. Uh, these methods are very good for audit detection, and uh, they are our type of epistemic uncertainty estimation techniques. So, if you have if, if, even uh, especially sequence to sequence models, they're showing pretty good at uh, tasks for machine translation, uh, summarization, question answering. And you can find some experiments in our paper and the paper of our colleagues in the concurrent work. All right, semantic entropy is a more interesting stuff. Uh, it, you know probably that model can generate uh, multiple similar sequences in terms of meaning, but very different in terms of surface realizations. Like you can ask who is the president of the uh, United States and for example, like model can answer like George Bush or the president of the United States, George Bush, or George Bush is the United States president, et cetera, et cetera. This will be essentially the same thing. And we want to take into account the similarities and semantic entropy does exactly that. It, uh, it samples several predictions from the language model, like A1 till a AM. Then it clusters into meanings, like uh, meaning clusters. Uh, and then it estimates a certain uh, entropy on top of these meanings, not the particular sequences. So, and each meaning can contain multiple generations, like again, regarding this uh, president, uh, they all basically can be put into one single cluster. Uh, to calculate uh, the probability for each meaning, the author just simply sum the probabilities for each individual uh, sequence, and then basically calculate the standard entropy um, formula on top of the probabilities of these meanings. Well, this works pretty well, but surprisingly, that um, black box methods uh, work even better. So, you know, in semantic entropy, we need an access to lockets and probabilities of the output uh, language models. But usually, but sometimes, or even actually usually, some models like ChatGPT, GPT-4. And many other APIs didn't provide you an access uh, neither to embeddings not, nor to logits of models. And then you probably need to only, um, only you can, um, what you can do only is to analyze its outputs. So what you do here, you again, sample multiple outputs from the language model. Then you can calculate, uh, get pairwise similarity between uh, these responses. And then you can compute a sort of uh, sentence estimation on metric on top of that. Uh, first, what uh, these authors of this paper tried, they tried multiple similarity, uh, pairwise similarity scores. One of them is basically Jacquard similarity, where they simply look at the bag of words of uh, two answers. Uh, surprisingly, it, it worked. Uh, and another thing which is um, more elaborative uh, is to use uh, off-the-shelf NLI the Berta model for um, NLP entailment. So the idea is just to look at two uh, outputs and uh, analyze them with the Berta and uh, determine whether one is the entailment of another. So if one is uh, basically entailment of another and another is entailment of the first one, you say that they are essentially the same thing. So they're, they're similar. So this is uh, the second way of computing similarity, which is uh, more uh, effective. So now 
let's get to uncertainty scores. Uh, again, surprisingly very simple score, uncertainty score here is a number of semantic sets. Uh, here you, again, you calculate these pairwise similarities, you basically uh, cluster them into semantic clusters and calculate the number of these clusters. And if the number is high, then you're uncertain. If the number is uh, clusters is low, then you're certain. That's basically it. Uh, again, this works, but there are some better versions of that. The second version is uh, to compute, um, basically doing the spe spectral clustering on top of these uh, similarities. So instead of like just uh, trying to create this uh, hard uh, adjacency matrix, you can you create a, like I would say um, soft adjacency matrix where you uh, put you have an adjacency matrix with uh, scores of similarity of uh, each uh, output sequence to each other, and then you can do some sort of spectral clustering where you can. Uh, basically look at the number of this uh, spectral cl clusters. So essentially this method uh, does uh, this. Another more simpler method, but uh, actually from our experience a little bit more effective is basically looking at average pairwise distance. Again, we can uh, construct this matrix and we can just look at um, sum of uh, pairwise, pair, pairwise similarities between uh, output sequences. And then we can just average uh, that and get uh, the uncertainty score. So again, if the average pairwise distance is high, then we are uncertain. If average pairwise distance is low, we are certain. Um, yeah, so these two things are work are actually a pretty uh, pretty good. So, uh, and moreover, I want to again emphasize that for this particular case, you don't need anything. Uh, you don't need an access to the model. You can just do the. You can do this. You can apply these methods to ChatGPT, GPT four, anything that has an API. All right. Uh, finally, the mo the method is called P two uh, from the Anthropic uh, paper which basically says, well, why not we can ask the model directly? Um, and they did, they just uh, did the, this stuff. They, they evaluated the question, um, multiple choice question answering. They uh, provided the question and the answer of the model and then ask it whether it's uh, true or not. And surprisingly that the model, as you can see here, uh, it's answers to the second question, like whether it's true or not can be used as a proxy metric for uncertainty for uh, its original answer. As you can see that uh, for, um, um, for the wrong answers, the model is usually uncertain. Like the scores are below 0 0.5 or closer to 0 0.4. And for the right answers, it's pretty confident. It's, uh, it has uh, this uh, distribution as you can see. So this uh, interesting way of looking at uncertainty like Again, asking the model directly itself. Um, it's probably also interesting direction for the future work. But again, I want to emphasize that this, despite it works in this particular case in the work of these uh, researchers, in our experiments and experience, experiments of other people that didn't work really well. Like for example, for machine translation and for other stuff, for question answering also, um, sometimes it doesn't really work. All right. So let's do some su sort of summary, what works and what doesn't. For uh, audio detection, I was just going with the density-based methods, of course, uh, and I was just considering robust density estimation first. For selected classification, I would uh, look at the black box method, its average pairwise distance and lexical similarity also. Um, yeah, and also probably it's a good way to combine uh, density-based methods and perplexity that was shown in some uh, in one work, on I clear work, uh, that it helps. We also get experiments where it helps, but in text, text classification. Uh, current, this P2 method uh, sometimes doesn't work and ensembles also sometimes uh, fail. Right, now let's uh, get to the final part of this talk uh, to our 
program framework, LM Polygraph. So it basically helps you to know what LMs do not tell you. So LM Polygraph is basically a Python library which accumulates a state-of-the-art and some estimation techniques. It supports state-of-the-art models, sec to sec models, GPT-like models. It has wrappers with, for ChatGPT, for Hagen Face API. Uh, it, you can just use a very small number of uh, um, just a few lines of code to add uncertainty to your language model. Uh, it also provides a benchmark to evaluate novel method and certain estimation techniques, maybe your uh, on your data, etc. We also will provide a live, live demo. Uh, I hope soon, maybe on NLP, maybe on AAAI. All right, uh, some demonstration examples with a lamp polygraph in our demo. For example, here we asking model to translate some sort of non-existent language like translate into was Jabian language. And you can see that model is completely uncertain because of our uh, sentence estimation metric is zero. And like for French, it's pretty easy. As you can see, model is completely certain about its output. Uh, another example with, um, with the knowledge of the model, like as we can see, the model doesn't know Russian uh, songs from Russian artists, uh, from Russian singers, but it knows uh, pretty well that, um, the uh, songs of British uh, uh, of the of Beatles, and as you can see, it tries to in the Russian case, it tries to imagine something like it tries to predict something like Irina Allegrova Allegrovna. So it tries to predict something similar, but uh, essentially it fails. And now we can detect that it fails. Uh, another example is like uh, asking some. Uh, simple and com complex questions. If we ask a complex question, like how uh, we can cure a dinosaur, consider like dinosaurs came from Earth, how we can cure them there from Pumania. And despite it provides some, you know, a list of suggestions about how to cure Pumania or for dinosaur, we can see that it's completely uncertain. But uh, when we ask the same thing for the human, well, it, uh, it uh, shows pretty decent uh, confidence. The same thing with the uh, like uh, how to perform a kidney surgery. Well, and surprisingly, the model gives you a pretty good uh, plan for a kidney surgery to perform with high confidence. But uh, what we, if we ask how to perform a kidney surgery with only one arm, and now the model is completely uncertain about that. Uh, yeah, it also notes that doing a kidney surgery with one arm is not very good, but you see that uh, some estimation scores works here that it shows that uh, this is an unreliable answer. So finally, uh, some words about our team. Uh, there are, I want to acknowledge our great team for uh, making uh, this library, for uh, developing stuff. Uh, I want to acknowledge Maxim Panov, who is on the, at the conference. I want to acknowledge Alexander Panchenko, who's also was a part of this initiative. Uh, here is uh, our, uh, Many authors, they are from different organizations. There are many others, but these are the main organizations uh, of our uh, work. So in conclusion, let's uh, look at some takeaways. Um, okay, so there are several things that we should consider beyond just accuracy, beyond just performance metrics. These are devising fairness and reliability. Uh, and certain estimation is a crucial component of machine learning systems, including language models. And uh, for already consider density-based methods, right, like robust density estimation for selective duration, try black box methods because they uh, work very well. And maybe you can also try combination of density-based methods and perplexity. Well, overall, don't trust LLMs. Try LM polygraph and uh, to reveal what LLMs do not tell you. I uh, want to also uh, note that we have a very strong team at MBZUI that work on devising fairness, which is led by Professor Tim Baldwin, and I am um, have an honor to be one of his uh, colleagues and uh, his group. Uh, regarding fact-checking, we have uh, also a very strong team, which is led by Professor Prislav Nakov. And I'm working also in uh, both of the direction uh, and also in uncertain estimation. Also, I would note that Maxim Panov is also uh, one of the colleagues who is working on uncertainty estimation right now. 
All right, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, would like, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Again, here's my contact. Again, here's our GitHub link. link. Please uh, tell, give us some feedback. It's still in, in better, in I would say even alpha maybe version, but anyways, um, let's see how it goes. Artem, thank you very much for this most insightful talk. Uh, so first of all, I would like to ask uh, for if there is any questions from audience. If yes, uh, you can come here or uh, go to the mic. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Artem, for the very nice talk. Okay. So my question is uh, just uh, maybe uh, clarifying some uh, things maybe I'm not understanding. Have you tried to analyze how the uncertainty of the model may be correlating with the error rate or the wrong decisions that made by the model? Because I understand it's a different thing, right? Well, actually, uh, this is a task of selective classification where we want to uh, all uncertain instances to be incorrect and all certain instances to be correct. So we want to so sort our data set in this way. So all very uncertain instances are have more errors and all instances that have um, correct answers are confident. So when we maybe do some abstention, like 10%, we abstain from making prediction for 10% and give these instances to human uh, expert or another system, we get a better boost, we get a better uh, outcome uh, out of that. Uh, so yeah, uh, we did this. We have a couple of paper regarding text classification, and we also have a paper regarding uh, selective generation, where, for example, we solve question um, question answering task with multiple choice question answering. So we yes, we analyze our the quality of uncertainty by looking at how good, for example, it uh, in multiple choice question answering, which answers are certain, which are not. Okay, thank you. And to a short question about just a funny question. Have you tried this LM polygraph to real humans? What they generate? And is it possible to <laughs> maybe to analyze what humans generate? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, we cannot ask a human and uh, ask him to write uh, the answer for the same question multiple times, right? Uh, and it's, it's polygraph for language models, it's not for human. <laughs> Yeah. It's uh, about how we can analyze the distribution of predictions of language model, uh, not not a human. And unfortunately, for human, for human, we have a, the the common polygraph, right? So, Artem, I would not agree with you because if you're ever um, uh, making the sociological tests, you know, like in companies, <laughs> this is what they do. They ask you again and again the same question, and actually, they kind of sample they and see whether they should, so. So, actually, that works. But we yeah. haven't how frequent, tried that. Uh, how frequent human uncertain? How frequent LM uncertain actually? Yeah, yeah, they have like a hundred uh, questions, but then it's just repeating more or less the same question, different paraphrasing, and then they basically just check whether you answer the same way. So actually, that's not that far from what okay. how they do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, more questions from audience. Uh, okay, uh, Artem, maybe let me ask you this um, uh, question, like. Really, um, the fact that assembling doesn't work in black box um, works so well is what has been empirically discovered. But uh, do you have some generic uh, explanation or some insight? Why is this so for LLMs and why it works so differently from some other machine learning setups? Well, maybe we haven't, uh, we haven't designed uh, ensembles very well. I mean, there are several ways to design ensembles. We can just train them on different uh, data sets. We can apply multiple uh, seeds to them. But uh, essentially, if they are pre-trained, they are very, very similar. So that's problem. So they're very, very similar. And maybe if we look at um, ensemble of multiple different models, uh, like for example, if or we apply some techniques for building an ensemble, uh, like in LM Blender, for example, that will help us to uh, help us a little bit. So I think we need to to add more diversity to uh, to ensemble uh, in this case. Uh, I think that this is the answer, but maybe there are some other issues. Maybe there are some other caveats uh, in assembling. 
so I am understanding your answer correctly that um, the variation in uh, let's say a function of decoder mechanism currently current uh, typical decoder mechanism is like less than variation in ensembles of some uh, classifiers as run through Monte Carlo dropout something like this well I mean in in uh, simple text classification uh, models you can build an ensemble just by using different random seeds right and they will be a little bit different they'll be different enough uh, in language modeling, uh, per training is uh, probably even um, you per training models even harder. I mean, like you, you they pre trained on bigger data set. So if you find if you fine tune them on small data set, probably they will not be that different from each other. That's problem. Um, so the more data is in pre training, the more similar will be the ensemble elements in in your ensemble. And this, the more similar answers they will give you. Um, I think this is one of the possible answers to this question. Thank you. Uh, any more follow-up questions uh, from audience? Okay, maybe let me ask one last but short question. Uh, so you presented uh, this uh, approach when you just ask language model uh, whether uh, the answer is correct. That's interesting, but uh, whether people tried some kind of a chain of thought uh, elaboration of this idea let's say you you answer multiple times and then you kind of a sample um, several uh, responses or you repeat again the, the question about certainty or correctness in in different ways not just once this way obtaining also some kind of a sampling but uh, in this uh, dialogue way style yeah I think that um the way the, ref, the ref, reflexive power of language models is very strong too. And uh, it, I saw a work where, of course, ch a chain of thought was used to improve the quality of the answer. Of course, we know that uh, the chain of thought uh, improved the quality of the answer or the chain of, um, well, when the model assesses its answer by itself and it says that it's not a good an answer is also been used in some works. I think there was a paper just a few days ago, I saw this idea, I thought, okay, well, it's pretty fast how people, you know, get to this uh, idea. Um, yeah, so if you, unfortunately, I don't remember the title exactly, but uh, the idea was essentially um, similar. They queried it multiple times, they assessed the output by the model and then tried to correct it multiple times. Really great. Uh, we live in an interesting age. And if you're interested in this research, uh, yeah, get in touch with Artyom or me. And uh, for your research, you might get involved as well. As you see, there is a lot of room for improvement. Okay, so we are very late, uh, out of time now, unfortunately. Artyom, thank you very much for your insightful talk. And now we need thank to you very much for the gears uh, to the next speaker. Now uh, we switch into the gears and uh, we're having a, a next speaker, uh, Dr. Mohamed Malik. Uh, so uh, he is a postdoc fellow at the High School of Economics uh, in Moscow now at Computer Science Faculty. And he's also a former assistant uh, professor at uh, Islamabad in Pakistan. He has an extensive research experience with um, uh, both teaching and research contributions spanning almost 20 years. And today he will uh, be speaking about freighting content and target identification in low resource languages. So, and that's another NLP talk today. Hamid, without further ado, please. Start. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, organizing committee for providing me this opportunity to deliver a talk on this uh, uh, social media mining topic and to share my findings with you. So let me introduce you that uh, the title of the talk, uh, that is Threatening Content and Target Identification in Low Resource Languages Using NLP Techniques. Uh, that is the outline of my talk. Uh, uh, in the first uh, start, I want to introduce some terms and ter terminologies related to this domain, then the challenges, 
and then after that uh, problem definition uh, to uh, related to my contribution in this domain uh, regarding urdu language i will discuss a case study with the uh, results and then i will conclude my talk uh, uh, by summarizing the uh, findings and then future prospects okay uh, so uh, uh, coming to the first uh, point that is the, what is hate speech uh, in literature there are several definitions of uh, hate speech exist because researchers try to define the hate speech according to their understanding uh, their knowledge their vocabulary and their thinking prospective so these are uh, these are few uh, uh, hate speech definitions i added and the references are also added you can see uh, these definitions slightly vary according to their own uh, thinking perspective and their their uh, understanding uh, but let me introduce you the most uh common and most uh, uh, you can say the, the the majority of the researchers have a consensus on this definition of hate speech that is it's it is a toxic speech attack on a person's individuality and likely to result in viol in violence one when targeted against groups based on specific grounds like ethnicity religion race place of birth personal background language uh, residence caste community and etc so uh, when there is a hate speech there is some target because hate speech always target someone so this is the basic uh, the basic uh, conclusion which uh, which we can I conclude by uh, by understanding this uh, uh, definition of hate speech the next point uh, which i want to uh, describe is what are the various forms of hate speech how hate speech can be uh, can be delivered how hate speech can be uh, can be formulated Uh, it, it could there are a few common and few famous uh, terminologies uh, uh, presented here like cyberbullying can be used to to describe to to uh, to define the hate speech flaming profanity abusive language discrimination and toxic comments so these are few forms of hate speech let me uh, share with you the definitions of these uh, these forms and then uh, we can uh, we can also dis uh, distinct between the de the their definitions and the general hate speech what is the difference between them for example if uh, i consider the uh, abusive language as you can see the the term abusive language seeks to diminish or humiliate some person or group and and when we see the hate speech hate speech is a type of abusive language so uh, abusive language could be the parent of hate speech means hate speech is at least we can say that hate speech is at least abusive language and in the other way we can say that the abusive language is a form of hate speech similarly toxic language if we consider toxic language okay so uh, the toxic language as far as its definition is concerned uh, the toxic language is conveying content that is disrespectful abusive unpleasant and harmful and when we when we uh, when we see the definition of hate speech not all toxic comments contain hate speech means it's uh, toxic comments could be general without targeting anyone You, we, we can we can analyze and we can understand this uh, concept of to uh, toxic language that some people have a habit of using toxic uh, uh, style of uh, using language uh, uh, usually they use some uh, some words which are not directly targeting someone but they have a habit of using uh, uh, of uh, uh, these words so that that, that is a, a type of uh, toxic language that is without hate speech in hate speech when there is a uh, we, when we talk about the hate speech uh, there must be a target okay so the considering the next point that is uh, the famous 
12 languages uh, landscape presented here that is uh, shared by the Washington Post in 2022. Uh, the landscape describe the proportion of uh, speakers <coughs> related to that particular language. Here we can see the Chinese language dominate, uh, which have uh, 1.39 billion speakers worldwide, uh, including all dialects of the Chinese language, means the all script. Uh, some languages have more than one script. Similarly, uh, Urdu language also has more than one script, Arabic and uh, in Hindi language also. As far as Urdu and Hindi languages uh, are concerned, we can see the, the, the population of the people globally that uh, 588 million people are basically using uh, Hindi and Urdu language uh, for their communication. As far as Arabic language is concerned, the statistics are there. The, uh, the proportion of speakers for Bengali language and for Russian language is almost equal. And uh, we can see that the Italian language has lowest number of speakers according to this landscape. So here, Hindi, Urdu, Chinese, Arabic, Bengali, Russian, uh, Italian, Portuguese, German, uh, Japanese, these are low resource languages. So uh, coming to the next point, what are the challenges uh, with these low resource languages uh, while designing some identification, some detection system uh, dealing with these low resource languages? The first challenge that is the very uh, basic challenge is the lack of annotated data set. We have to we have to crawl the information and collect uh, uh, clean the information and then we have to annotate go for annotation process. This is the basic and the first challenge. The other uh, the, the, the next challenge is uh, for some uh, low resource languages like for Urdu, for Arabic, even for uh, Russian and Bengali language, which I know because I work on these languages. Uh, there are some uh, uh, essential resources and uh, accurate text processing toolkits are uh, not available or sometimes they are missing uh, as compared to other high resource languages, for example, for English. So that is the, uh, the, the that is another challenge related to the resources and pre-processing toolkits. The third challenge is uh, uh, some languages use multiple scripts uh, for example, Urdu use two scripts. Uh, people use either Arabic style, that is uh, also called Nestalic style, or Roman style, Roman Urdu or Arabic Urdu. Similarly, for Arabic language, there are also two styles. Hindi language, there are also two styles. Uh, but for English, there is only one style, that is in uh, Roman style. Uh, social media user, uh, users usually use multiple scripts. For example, if I if I consider if I talk about the Urdu language, the user usually use both scripts while sharing their opinion. They share they use Arabic style and Roman style at the same time. So that is the problem of code mixing. That is another issue, another challenge with low resource languages. And the last uh, uh challenge which i enlisted here these are not the all challenges there are also other challenges but i listed few to 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 describe the challenges to to highlight the challenges related to low resource languages the pertinent and uh, famous we can say the uh, the latest uh, uh, language models that are already pre-trained models are hardly available not every model support the low resource languages so that, that is another uh, challenge or issue. Coming to the problem definition, which uh, I want to, uh, uh, the problem and the task which, uh, on which I want to deliver a talk and want to discuss the uh, proposed methodology and the, then the results and the finding. Uh, that problem definition is given, on the, uh, is given on the left side of the presentation. Here we can see the, uh, on the top of user language, <clears throat> then hate speech, that is general hate speech. So that general hate speech could be categorized into threatening content, could be categorized into categorized into violence incitation and, uh, and other categories. So 
uh, today i am uh, i am uh, discussing the, uh, the type of journal hate speech that is threatening content identification in the nestalix script or arabic uh, style so th- on the right side the hierarchical classification of the uh, problem is uh, provided that uh, the tweet or the comment of social media uh, uh, is uh, going to categorize uh, going to be categorized into two uh, two labels that uh, one is threatening and the, the other is non threatening then the threatening contents are further considered for target identification that either individual is being victimized targeted in that uh, in the threatening post or threatening tweet or uh, the group the difference between the individual and group class label or we can say the uh, category is that when a individual person is uh, being addressed then we say that it is a it, it is it is related to the individual class when more than one person are being targeted we categorize it into the group class label well my contribution handling the uh, only urdu language not uh, russian because i am also working on russian language and uh, another low resource language so for urdu language i have these contributions uh, first uh, the uh, i have a contribution in 2022 related to the offensive content identification in urdu uh, one paper was already published and the next paper is uh, in, in in right of state then hate speech and targeted community detection that is uh, related to the uh, community today i am uh, just uh, going to describe the framework related to the journal uh, journal target that is individual or group but in this uh, uh, hate speech and targeted community detection uh, concept or uh, topic we are going to basically Uh, target the community that either it's a religious community political community it's a media community it's a judiciary community it's a it's a army a uniform person community that who are being targeting uh, targeted in the hate speech then threatening content and targeted identification is is the is today topic and uh, also i have a, a contribution in multilingual a model for threatening text identification in in english and urdu language so today uh, i want to share the uh, design of the methodology related to the urdu language uh, concerning the topic of threatening content and targeted identification so here the question arises that uh, uh, why uh, there are uh, there is a need to design a urdu Uh, the uh, uh, identification system for urdu language because urdu is a national language of pakistan and as we uh, if we consider the asian region then uh, around 170 million people are uh, basically uh, speaking and expressing their opinions and views in urdu language on social media then at the same time Uh, if we consider the global perspective then around 300 million uh, people are there related to the Engl- urdu language those are speaker and uh, urdu language is not only being spoken in in asia in the southern part of the asia but also in the usa you in, in the in the uk and in the canada region so that's why uh, there is a need to design a uh, identification framework related to threatening content and target identification in urdu language on the right side i have added the alphabets these are the 39 alphabets uh, used in urdu language to design the words and sentences uh, to describe a uh, 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 opinion or concept so urdu language is more similar to Uh, to arabic language and persian language as compared to them uh, as compared to other any other language what was the objective uh, which was uh, addressed uh, while designing the framework for urdu language the first one is to design an automated uh, identification system for twitter data uh, 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 and to classify them as a threatening versus non threatening accurately the second objective was Uh, for threatening tweets only for threatening tweets uh, design an effective framework to identify the type of target that either individual is being targeted or, or a group is being targeted 
the third objective was and that is the that was the preliminary requirement which we assumed which we set to start the uh, to, to start the design that the proposed framework should be based on the automated feature generation technique in, in contrast or instead of handcrafted feature so it should be automated feature generation technique it should be based on uh, now coming to the proposed methodology uh, here block diagram is added uh, we, we can see that the uh, tweets were collected uh, from the pakistani twitter account because the uh, users of uh, pakistani uh, twitter accounts uh, twitter users were considered because pakistan in pakistan urdu is the national language and we have a uh, we have a chances of uh, a very uh, big corp uh, we, we can design a big corpus of data so after that, the pre-processing techniques, I will describe the, these steps individually in, in the next slide. Just here, I want to give an overview. Uh, then uh, pre-processing techniques were applied, then feature uh, extractions. Here we can see the different types of feature extraction techniques were applied, uh, like uh, word and gram character and gram semantic techniques, uh, word embedding technique, FOSTEX, uh, topic models, latent semantic analysis, and language models were also uh, applied. After that, the, uh, the the machine learning and fine tuning process of the, uh, the Roberta. It's a basically not word. It's a Roberta, Urdu Roberta. It's a mistake here. Uh, so the at the first level, the contents were classified into threatening versus not threatening. Then at the second level, the threatening contents were considered for target identification into individual or group. Uh, before uh, applying the proposed, actual proposed methodology, we should have a data set, annotated data set. That is the first challenge which I described uh, while, de while discussing the challenges related to the uh, low resource languages. So data sets, uh, annotated data sets are always, uh, always have a problem with low resource languages. So we crawl the uh, data. Uh, Hello, is there any question? Okay, so uh, we crawl relevant information, relevant tweets from the tweeters and then uh, process those tweets. Uh, uh, then after that, I will, uh, I uh, we annotate the data sets uh, according to the uh, designed annotated guidelines. Before starting the crawling of the data, whenever we, in NLP, whenever we have, we want to crawl a data uh, related to specific topics, specific, uh, um, uh, uh, specific research area, we need uh, to design a lexicon because uh, without this uh, lexicon, without this seed word lexicon, we could not crawl the relevant data because if we crawl all the data, then how we can uh, we can choose and identify that this data is related to our domain, our topic, and this is not related to our uh, domain or topic. So, for uh, designing the lexicon, we uh, we need to design the this lexicon uh, manually by by looking uh, by looking the, uh, the the type of contents uh, for which we are going to uh, crawl uh, uh, the crawl the corpus so uh, the, the this lexicon is also uh, alternatively uh, we can say that it's a seed word lexicon so we also designed 250 keywords or lexicon uh, keywords uh, to so that we can uh, we can easily crawl the relevant tweets from the Twitter uh, Urdu Twitter accounts. Here I have added the examples of a few keywords. You can see the uh, Urdu part of the keyword and the translated part. Uh, unigram, bigram, and trigram, and also some keywords in foregram. So after designing this uh, uh, lexicon, then. We, we, we then uh, everybody who are going to uh, crawl the data is in a position to get the relevant uh, comments, post, or whatever the face, uh, whatever the social media platform they are going to uh, crawl the information. So uh, the next point is uh, the, the the time range. 
for which time we should uh, we should consider the data crawling because uh, uh, it depends upon the situation for, for threatening content and target identification uh, we consider the time period of 24 months ranging from august 2020 uh, 20 to august 2022 because uh, in this time period the political situation in pakistan was very unstable so people were uh, very aggressive people were very uh, sometimes sad worried and uh, they, they 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 expressed their opinion on twitter on facebook and, uh, and then we have a, a opportunity in this time period to get the relevant uh, content so that we can uh, we can design a better uh, annotated data set so by applying this uh, uh, lexicon uh, and the, the, the time frame, uh, we crawl the uh, data uh, for both uh, uh, for both types of content, threatening versus threatening. Then after that, we applied the process of cleaning because the data should be cleaned and before giving them to the annotators. If uh, uh, the data has inconsistency, then annotators will have a problem uh, while they uh, while they annotate the data set. So uh, there are a few steps uh, enlisted here for related to the cleaning. Removal of empty tweets, uh, duplicate tweets, and those tweets uh, that contain other language words. For example, if a tweet uh, uh, contains the Arabic word or sometimes a Hindi word, sometimes a Bengali word, so it, it, it is not possible manually to to translate those words into the Urdu language because it's a, it takes manual effort. So we, we remove uh, those tweets. After that, we have a clean data set. Then uh, we design the annotated guidelines for annotators so that they can easily annotate the data set. And uh, we for, for this annotation, we hired the, hired the services of uh, Pakistani uh, uh, annotators uh, by because uh, Pakistan in Pakistan Urdu is the national language and people have a uh, have a uh, more uh, uh, advantage as compared to other countries. So uh, the basic criteria for choosing the uh, annotators was the native. There should be native Urdu speakers and they should have at least master level education and have a prior experience of annotating Urdu data. Because the annotation is not only for one level. There are two levels of annotation. First, they have to categorize it into threatening versus non-threatening. And then in the second level, the threatening contents uh, will be considered for individual or group category. So after annotation, we have a, we have a, 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 a data, we compile the data and compute the inter-annotator agreement that is uh, uh, more than 80 uh, exactly, that is eighty-three percent. Here we, uh, here I added few uh, samples of the annotated data set. Uh, we can see the first, second are the threatening tweets, and the, on the second level, the the individual or group is being targeted. Uh, in this uh, in this column, uh, the Urdu part is mentioned, and the in the in the in the uh, beside column, is the translated version is uh, uh, mentioned. If you see the third uh, and fourth uh, tweet, uh, it is obvious and it is clear that for non-threatening tweets, we do not need to consider the second level because we are interested for threatening and then for threatening who is being threatened, individual or group. So that's why here it, this uh, level of annotation is not applied. But here, uh, the fourth tweet, uh, you can see that that is not threatening, but that is abusive or tax, toxic com uh, content because it's a, uh, 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 the person is being referred with the dog tail. Uh, so uh, it's not threatening. It's not exactly threatening, but it is abusive. Uh, the person is being, uh, being abused, being insulted, being, uh, uh, being uh, disrespectful. And as I described earlier, uh, the cleaning process uh, uh, was uh, adopted before annotation. Then after annotation, when we have a final data set, we applied the process of pre-processing. Here, the main difficulty was the, with the stop words list because uh, 
uh, with Urdu, the stop words are very difficult and very different, not in English. Like, because in Urdu, we have, if you see the style of writing Urdu, then for, for one type of stop word, there could be many options, many combinations of stop word. For example, the word here is ka. It is a stop word. It could be k. Uh, it, there could be uh, multiple versions of this uh, stop word. So that that was uh, a main obstacle, a hurdle with the stop words identification and removal. But we designed, there was already some stop words were available because the researchers did some work, but we compiled a big, a big uh, the lexicon and we shared it. Then uh, at the same time with the stop word removal, not for transformer model, for other feature engineering models, we also uh, transform the emojis and emoticons which are present in the in the tweets so that the context should be uh, same. Uh, uh, if we remove the emojis and emoticons from the uh, from the tweets, then uh, the context could be uh, could be uh, could be broken. So we we uh, we uh, adopt this option that we should translate this, uh, this these emojis into the corresponding text. And the other preprocessing techniques, these are already uh, obvious and uh, people are familiar with them that the, the, the other uh, irrelevant information should be removed. Here, the demonstration of these preprocessing techniques are uh, added first punctuation removal uh, with the Urdu text and then uh, with the after removal, you can see and that uh, here the translated uh, tweet is also added. For stop word, this is really interesting. Uh, you can see that the uh, the, the stop word uh, remo when stop word is removed, the the sentence, uh, the 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 behavior of the sentence and the uh, pronoun, how we pronounce and how we uh, how we read this uh, sentence after stop word removal. And uh, replacement of emojis here is uh, the, the example is also demonstrated that in this tweet, the person is angry. So we, we replace the corresponding text. And then after that, the hashtag and the other irrelevant information are also removed. Uh, I also added uh, in this slide some sample stop words uh, so that uh, we can get idea of uh, uh, what uh, stop, what type of stop words are being used in Urdu. Uh, I added their corresponding translation also. You can see uh, these are few stop words uh, used in Urdu uh, language. Here the word count and cloud representation is presented uh, so that we can get the, uh, the, the, the most dominating words, keywords that are being used to threaten uh, somebody. Now let's me let me uh, introduce you the about the proposed methodology related to the feature engineering and then the, the machine learning part of the uh, of the framework. Uh, we uh, search uh, the latest and uh, the uh, already pre-trained uh, language models that are available in Urdu. So after uh, after doing an exhaustive search, uh, we found only one uh, only two. Uh, 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 transformer models that are pre-trained in Urdu. One is uh, uh, Urdu Robota, that, uh, the, the other is Bart Samal. So we uh, we applied both uh, models for, uh, for for feature engineering, but I uh, in this talk I added only this uh, Urdu Robota model because this model the performance is very effective and, uh, and very promising. So here we have a, a tra transformer model that is pre-trained on a big corpus. If we want to use this transformer model for our specific task in Urdu, although it is already pre-trained in Urdu, we need to fine-tune carefully with important hyperparameters. So with fine-tuning, it's not easy task. If we blindly fine-tune our, uh, our uh, pre-trained model, it could even lose the prayer knowledge. So we have a we have two issues uh, while fine tuning any transformer model. When we fine tune, we have these two issues. One is catastrophic forgetting, and the other one is overfitting. Catastrophic forgetting means 
uh, the models already learned a knowledge by pre-training. And if we fine-tune it on a, on a, another corpus, then if we if we do, do, if I do not deal it properly, then it could lose the previous learning. So we have to because we unfreeze the all layers of the uh, of the, of the uh, transformer model, and then uh, for learning new knowledge uh, by fine tuning, and so it could it could lose the previous learning. The other problem is overfitting. And that is also related with deep learning uh, domain that uh, choosing the number of epochs for training a model is a common issue. So if we choose a uh, very few epochs, it could result in underfitting. And if we choose too, too many epochs, it could uh, result in overfitting. So uh, we deal these two problems uh, uh, appropriately, uh, the, the catastrophic forgetting and overfitting. These are the. Th this is the list of uh, uh, hyperparameter which we use for fine tuning the Urdu Roberta model. And uh, you can see the list of the uh, the parameters are, and their ranges. We applied the grid search methodology to uh, to find the optimum values of the parameters uh, so that we can get the uh, best performance from fine tuning. While uh, overfitting uh, problem was uh, uh, was dealt, uh, we use the validation lab because we uh, uh, when we split the data, we split it into three parts: uh, test, uh, training, validation, and test part. And uh, it's a it's a it's the technique mentioned here. It's a very common technique, and majority of the uh, researcher applied this technique for fine tuning that the 80% data should be uh, used for the training process, training purposes and 20% is used for testing purposes. And from the 80%, 90% is actually used for training and 10% is used for validation. So we use the validation part of the data set to see the, to analyze the validation loss uh, on the, uh, because when we apply the train model on the validation part of the data set, uh, we generate the validation loss and we monitor the validation loss and see when model uh, is, when validation loss is decreases and when it it is going to increase and continuously increasing so we conclude concluded on on this uh, on this matter of overfitting that five to six uh, epochs are enough uh, for this type, for this problem I will I will describe this matter uh, in the next slides and that how it is possible. So fine tuning process it is common that we need to apply the tokenization then training a training up uh, any transformer model with a classification layer. Uh, as far as catastrophic uh, forgetting is concerned, I already described that when we unfreeze the layers of the transformer model while fine tuning, we have to carefully uh, monitor the uh, the the learning of the uh, model that it already learned. So we uh, we finalize the starting learning rate that from which learning rate we should start uh, our model fine tuning so that it could keep the previous learning and also uh, to also will be uh, will be able to learn new knowledge that is related to threatening content and uh, target identification so we tried several uh, learning rates and the, those are given here uh, 3 e raised to power 4 and above but while applying the learning rate we conclude uh, we reach on a conclusion that the fine tuning of the Urdu Roberta leads to convergent failure. So we obtain the best performance with the, the two e raised to power minus five learning rate and, uh, that is helpful to handle the problem of catastrophic forgetting. Uh, the next point is uh, which baselines and comparable models we use to to compare our our proposed methodology. So that we can compare uh, uh, fairly that uh, how our our uh, proposed model is uh, performing. So there was uh, only one study uh, exists uh, in the prior approaches that also addressed the same problem of uh, threatening content and hates uh, threatening content and target identification. But with this approach, 
the problem was with their annotated data set. Their data set was actually not threatening and not, uh, unthreatening. Those were basically uh, uh, that the, the data set was actually offensive data set, and they use it for the threatening and uh, threatening uh, identification problem. So we, uh, as I already described, that we designed the new data set annotated it on the two level threatening versus non threatening and target identification. But for this bench, for this previous uh, uh, benchmark or baseline, we regenerate their uh, their uh, results on our data set to compare it fairly with our proposed methodology. And we also uh, design our new uh, uh, new comparable models so that we can we, we, we must uh, compare our uh, our proposed methodology with enough comparables. So uh, latent semantic analysis and bag of word approaches uh, were uh, feature engineering approaches were considered in the benchmark. Uh, word and gram, character and gram, fast tag embeddings, uh, these feature engineering approaches were present. And uh, we also uh, utilize these uh, uh, state-of-the-art machine learning models. So th because these models already demonstrated significant performance in related NLP tasks. And these are the uh, performance measures to evaluate the performance of the classifiers. Coming to the next point. Okay, so here uh, I added the training and validation results obtained by fine tuning the Urdu Roberta for threatening versus non threatening task. Here you can see the two uh, sequence lengths for the upright 64 and 128 with three batch sizes 8, 16, and 32. And uh, five epochs results are added here. Now the, 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 uh, the data related to the uh, to our uh, validation loss, uh, training loss, validation accuracy, and, and, and their, their time. We can see that the very, uh, training loss is continuously decreasing. It means when we, when we apply, when we train the model, it continuously trained. But uh, uh, when we applied the train model on the validation part, we can see that in the uh, the, the first three for three instances, uh, sorry, for first three epochs, the model learn model uh, we behave appropriately. Then after that, the validation loss start increasing. This is the common uh, common behavior of uh, uh, train model on uh, with all uh, with all uh, combinations. So. If we if we see this uh, this uh, behavior of validation and training loss uh, individually, we can see that the uh, the behavior of the uh, training loss is continuously decreasing. And we can see with different sequence length and different batch sizes, with sequence length of sixty four and batch size of eight, sixteen, and thirty two, and for sequence length of 128, 8, 16, and 32 bits. The training loss is continuously decreasing. It means on every epoch, the model is continuously learning. But when we when we uh, uh, applied that training trained model on the validation part of the data set, we can see that for the first three epochs, the model uh, the model behavior is, is that the model is basically performing very well. And then after that, the validation loss start increasing up to the five epochs. So we reach on the conclusion that five epochs are enough. Uh, even four epochs are also enough to, to, to test this model on the test part of the data set because after this, the validation loss is continuously increasing. And there is no, uh, there is no, uh, because if we try more epochs, then our model could overfit. Maybe it could give better results, but it could overfit on the validation uh, part of the data set. And then when we try it on the test part, it, it, it will perform very badly. So we did not apply uh, the, uh, we only apply the five epochs. The reason is uh, I already described with you. That is for threatening, not threatening task. So, uh, before coming to the uh, this uh, validated, first we trained, then validated, and then tested. Uh, sorry, uh, this validated 
fine tune uh, fine tune roberta model for testing part of the data set let me describe you uh, the results obtained uh, uh, from the baseline and from the comparable model here uh, you can see that uh, uh, when uh, because there, there are five machine learning algorithms we applied linear regression sorry logistic regression random forest svm k nearest neighbor and naive base so uh, these five uh, machine learning models were applied for every for each type of features a word uh, unigram bigram trigram and their combined uh, effect then character unigram bigram trigram i just added only those results which which are uh, at least some which crosses some uh, threshold so also we can see the fast text performance bag of word latent semantic analysis here we can see uh, that the logistic regression as compared to the other machine learning models applied machine learning model outperform it gives the best performance so uh, this is one of the finding related to the uh, baseline and comparable model and the other point is uh, as far as threatening versus non threatening uh, classification is concerned uh, in baseline and comparable model we got the best performance with character 5 gram here we can see the the performance because this performance is in accuracy and our data set is balanced data set uh, and in addition we also uh, compute other metrics that is precision recall and macro f1 so here the comparison of the proposed methodology uh, proposed framework for uh, for threatening versus non threatening and the baseline were compared we can see the performance of the uh, various uh, various uh, classification models and in proposed section we can see that uh, we got the best performance with 64 sequence length and with eight batch size the, and the performance is 87.5 percent accuracy and then if we if we if we uh, consider the micro f1 that is 87.8 percent and with character 5 gram the the, the performance is 85.83 percent so uh, the proposed framework that is based on uh, not on handicraft features but base, basically based on automated feature generation methodology it outperformed the other uh, uh, other uh, comparable and even the baseline. The next part is the target identification uh, of the uh, of the of the threat of the threatening tweets. That which target is being uh, addressed, either individual or group. So uh, here we here I added uh, again the uh, the training and validation results uh, of uh, fine tuning Roberta model for target identification we can see the performance of the training loss uh, validation loss validation accuracy and uh, and the, the, the number of epochs if we closely uh, analyze the validation loss here for uh, threatening versus non threatening task the validation loss start increasing uh, from third epochs but here you can see that the validation on validation loss uh, means the when we applied the train model on the validation part of the data set, the validation loss start increasing uh, from the third epoch up to the five epoch. So that is the, uh, the the point related to the overfitting. That if we try more epochs, if we try ten epochs, then our model will definitely overfit because validation loss is not decreasing. Then uh, the comparison of the baseline and comparable model for target identification task with the proposed methodology. Here we can see that uh, as compared to the threatening versus not threatening uh, classification task, uh, for target identification, the sequence length of 128 with batch size of 8 outperformed and provided 83.20% micro F1. And it outperformed. So, so, sorry, Mohammed. Uh, we just have a, a couple of few minutes, so if you can uh, try to. Uh, yes, uh, I am just going to okay. uh, to, yeah, to wind up because it's just uh, two, three two slides. Okay, so uh, 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 while concluding the talk, uh, I can I can say that the the, the 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 we designed the significant threatening and target identification framework 
using the contextual semantic embeddings that are basically designed using the uh, using the pre-trained transformer model, but with fine tuning to handle the ambiguity and the complexity complexity issues of the Urdu language. The proposed framework demonstrated benchmark performance in compared to the, in in comparison with the comparable and the baseline. On the top of all, it is based, it is the proposed framework is basically uh, based on the automated feature generation technique, not on handcrafted feature. And the transformer model uh, can capture the actual context of the language being used to thread someone. So the finding of this research could be helpful for law, law and enforcement organization and uh, for identification of uh, this uh, type of unwanted material that is threatening content and target identification uh, in Urdu language. Uh, while uh, talking about, uh, about the future prospects, according to my point of view, uh, I summarize the future prospects in, in, in three points. If we if we deal the interpretability of these uh, trained models and these uh, trusted models uh, for uh, low resource languages, uh, it, 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 we will face the issue. For example, uh, because each low resource language has a different way of creating context to describe an opinion. The next issue uh, that could arise is that uh, the the uh, the definitions of these uh, these uh, different uh, form of hate speech, uh, these uh, definitions overlap. So we need an appropriate categorization of these various type of hate speech for low, low resource languages because the definitions overlap, and uh, uh, the, then then uh, then the classification system uh, uh, could not be effective or efficient. The third. Uh, future prospect and the challenge could, would be that, uh, uh, as I described earlier, that uh, people uh, usually use multiple scripts uh, for a single language uh, to uh, to describe their opinion. So we, so there must be a, a problem of code mixing. And if we are going to design an efficient code mix content identification problem, that is not an easy task. So that is also a challenging task. I am not talking about simple code mix content identification. I am talking about the efficient, that should be efficient. So that's all from my uh, side. And uh, uh, any questions from the audience? Mohammed, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation on very uh, important topic, of course, for model NLP. Uh, first, I just would like to ask if there is any questions from audience. Uh, let me then just um, uh, start. Uh, the formulation of your task is classification, right? Yeah. yeah. So you try to cast uh, toxicity, detect, uh, toxicity hate speech uh, problem as a classification. But um, how about uh, alternative formulations? Let's say uh, you mentioned that hate speech always has a target. Uh, how about detecting precisely uh, what is the target and uh, what exactly insults or other uh, aspects, uh, particular hate speech attributes we used? Or uh, how about a generation of hate speech using LLMs and preventing this? So could you comment on these alternative, let's say, directions of, of, of work? Uh, I use the uh, handcrafted features and also the uh, language model to basically the problem is not hate speech. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a type of uh, hate speech that is the threatening content. So I applied both, mo both models, both type of model handcrafted feature generation uh, techniques. Yeah, yes, that, that, that's, what, that's what, what I mean. But uh, the question is not about how do you solve the problem, but uh, whether, okay, we need classifiers for, for high speech, for toxicity, but then um, maybe we, 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 uh, the, these automatic systems, machine learning systems should, should be also acting differently. Let's say uh, being tagging systems, every token of systems. Uh, so technically not as classifiers, but maybe as sequence tagging or 
you know, rewriting uh, toxic speech into something non-toxic, which would be kind of a tra machine translation or sequence to sequence. Uh, yeah. So what do you but, think? Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, my topic was just classification. I was not uh, considering the sequence to sequence uh, uh, phenomena. And uh, because that's why I use the annotated data set so that the uh, so that the classifier have an opportunity to learn the exact context of the language and that is the specifically language bound classifier that is for urdu uh, arabic style that could not be uh, we could not see that we could not say that this uh, type of uh, this uh, particular classifier could be applied uh, as it is for other low resource languages for other low resource, low resource languages, we have to consider the, uh, the the language context. What are the opportunities? What are the uh, what are the preprocessing and the, what are the other things are available? We have to consider them. And it's a monolingual approach. It's not a it's not a multilingual. Although I have designed a multilingual approach, but uh, uh, as far as low resource languages, uh, usually monolingual approaches are uh, designed so it is just specifically related to the uh, specific language and specific style so okay yes y yes I see. so so i'm i'm sorry to, to interrupt cut this short but we are um, uh, really um, uh, out of time because of some shift so uh yeah i uh, suggest you just to show your contacts and for those who are interested can contact you uh, on on this work and uh, ask questions directly okay thank okay. you very much let's okay. uh, thank uh, mohammed for his presentation and proceed to for the talk uh, chaired by andre Kulus. okay thank you so much and uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee and dr dimitri uh, who provide me this opportunity okay so this is our fully remote session and um it's also uh, uh, streamed uh, on YouTube, so it's not uh, limited to only uh, those present uh, in Zoom. But yeah, so the first talk uh, is uh, about automatic aspect extraction from scientific texts by uh, Anna Marshalova, Elena Bruches, and uh, Tatiana Batura. And as far as I understand, uh, uh, Anna will be presenting. Is that true? Can you unmute yourself? Mm, yes. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Thanks. Yes, yes. So the floor is yours. Can you try to share your screen? So hello, everyone. My name is Anna, and I'm going to present our paper, which is called Automatic Aspect Extraction from Scientific Text. As the number of published research papers increases, uh, there is a growing need in tools that automatically extract uh, information from them. For example, we might need to extract such information as the task of the research, uh, the author's contribution, the use methods, and the conclusion of the study. We suggest calling these uh, main points of a paper its aspects. Uh, however, even though Russian is among the languages uh, most commonly used in science, uh, there is a sparse amount of aspect extraction tools for Russian, and most of them focus on certain domains uh, such as medicine or computer science. Uh, to address this, in our research, we aim to create a cross-domain data set of Russian language scientific texts and to propose a tool for automatic aspect extraction from Russian scientific texts of any domain. Uh, let's start with uh, the data set. Uh, it contains 200 abstracts uh, to papers of 10 scientific domains, uh, namely psychology, physics, medicine, mathematics, computer science, linguistics, journalism, pedagogy, law, and history. Uh, in this text, we identified four types of aspects, uh, task, contribution, method, and conclusion. Uh, here's an example of an annotated text. Um, as you can see, aspects do not cover the whole text and aspects can be nested. For example, in this case, task and method are nested inside the contribution aspect. Uh, overall, we identified uh, 836 aspects. 
uh, almost half of them being the contribution aspect. This might be due to the fact that abstracts are written to give uh, an idea of the author's contribution. Um, however, in some domains, uh, the conclusion aspect prevails. For example, medicine with papers describing uh, results of clinical studies or history with papers describing results of archaeological expeditions. Um, as for the task as aspect, uh, we discovered that in some domains, especially in humanities, we are not talking about the tasks uh, themselves, but rather about some problematic issues or research objects. So it was decided to attribute them to the task aspect as well. And as for the method aspect, it is most, use, most usually mentioned in uh, papers on natural and exact sciences. Um, an average length of an aspect is uh, 12 tokens, but it mostly depends on the aspect type. So uh, task and method are rather short and they are expressed in uh, short terms or phrases, whereas conclusion and contribution are rather long and they are expressed in full sentences or clauses. So uh, let's move on to the algorithm. Uh, for this task, we fine-tuned a BERT model on a multi-class, multi-label token classification task. So for each token, we select up to two the most probable aspects, uh, the probabilities of which are higher than the threshold. And if none of them are higher than the threshold, uh, it means that the aspect is not assigned to any the token is not assigned to any aspect at all. Um, after that, uh, the neighboring tokens um, assigned to one aspect are united into spans. And to these spans, we apply some heuristics uh, to enhance the um, aspect boundary detection. Uh, these heuristics usually remove uh, unnecessary words or add uh, missing ones to uh, the extracted aspects. Uh, finally, aspects expressed in nominal phrases are put into the nominative case. Uh, so here is what we get as a result. Uh, on the left, there is an example of automatic aspect extraction, and you can compare it to the manual annotation on the right. In this task, um, in this case, uh, the model performed quite well, but not perfectly. For example, the extracted conclusion is rather incomplete, but it still expresses the main point. To find the best model, we conducted a number of experiments, which included using different pre-trained models and um, freezing weights and uh, putting some layers on top, but the best results were shown by multilingual BERT uh, fine-tuned in our data with just a linear layer for classification. Uh, the fact that a multilingual model outperformed uh, monolingual specialized models is quite uh, surprising, uh, but to find its reasons, some new experiments are needed and we plan to conduct them in future. By now, uh, these are the best metrics for the best model and the best extracted aspect is contribution as it um, is the most uh, frequent aspect in the dataset. And the worst extracted aspect is task, which might be to um, due to its heterogeneity. Uh, apart from metrics for um, individual tokens, we used exact match ratio, which is lower than the other metrics. So um, we still have some problems with aspect boundary detection. Uh, finally, we conducted cross-domain experiments to see how our model performs on unseen domains. For each experiment, we used 10 dom um, nine domains to train the model and one to test it. 
And the obtained results prove that uh, our model is able to generalize to new domains. So as a result, uh, in our study, we created a cross-domain data set of Russian language scientific texts with manual aspect annotation and proposed a tool for automatic aspects extraction from Russian scientific texts of any domain. Uh, the code and the data set are available by this link. And that is all. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thanks a lot. So since I hear some applause from, <laughs> from Yerevan, uh, I'm not sure, maybe there are some questions from uh, the audience on site before uh, we get to questions from the audience online. So at least I do have a question. You can proceed. Uh, uh, okay, right. So um, again, thanks for the talk. And uh, I, my question is mostly related to the data set that you, um, that you created especially these aspects uh, that you chose to use. So for example, it's not like, I'm looking at the data set right now when you're in your GitHub repository, and it's not quite clear what's the difference, for example, between contributions and conclusions, because it's obvious that sometimes, well, even not sometimes, but often the conclusion of the paper con <laughs> contains the contributions, right? And uh, I'm looking at some examples where I myself would not be entirely sure whether this is a contribution or a conclusion. So how did you um, like choose between these two labels when annotating, I mean? Mm, we mostly identified as contribution something that authors uh, have done. And when they write that we have uh, proposed uh, something, researched something or something like that. And uh, we identified conclusion when they write about uh, the exact uh, conclusion that was reached during the, their research. Okay, so we, yeah, like one of the examples from uh, the linguistics subset. So the sentence, idiomy рассматриваются как промежуточные языковые образования между словосочетаниями и словами, состоящие из особых единиц, чьи свойства позволяют относить их к определенному уровню. This is labeled as contribution. And then comes the sentence labeled as conclusion, and the sentence is, показывается наличие диффузии уровней, континуальность перехода от одного уровня к другому, существование промежуточных уровней, которые располагаются единицы. So, like, the author's have shown something, and this is labeled as conclusion. And then the, another sort of description of what the authors have done is labeled as contribution. Um, we, for the conclusion aspect, we also used uh, some word markers, like показано, mm -hmm. uh, доказано, Okay. Uh, and so on. And we mostly identify this conclusion, uh, the clause which follows uh, such um, the main sentence, uh, which is показано, uh, доказано. So, I mean, uh, in this case, it is more obvious that this is a conclusion. And when we are uh, talking about something like uh, the first sentence you mentioned, um, so how I see it, uh, the, in this sentence, they write that they propose to uh, consider this problem in this uh, way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and the, uh, you report uh, the average interator agreement in the, in the paper, but do you maybe remember what was the agreement for these two aspects? I mean, contribution and conclusion? Uh, we Over did not the... measure agreement for um, pairs of aspects. It was just measured for the whole data set. Yes, yes, but, uh, I, uh, but I guess you have the numbers for every specific aspect because you report the average uh, inter inter agreement over all four aspects. So if you average it, then it means that you have four, four estimations, I mean, four values. Yeah. 
Uh, right. Well, yeah. Um, I guess I haven't, but uh, I just, I don't think that I paid attention to mm. the intermediate yeah. results. It was just accounted. Um, it was just averaged and okay. I did not, maybe sh I should have paid attention because I think uh, there might be some interesting uh, discoveries <laughs> about uh, which pairs of aspects are most usually confused. Okay, I see. Uh, Thank thanks. Uh, yeah, I believe the data set that you released uh, definitely is going to be very useful. Okay, anyway, uh, any questions from the, well, from Yerevan? Yeah, I guess you can just come to the microphone and uh, start speaking because I don't see uh, you anyway. Oh, well, I see something. <laughs> okay, but can you hear me? E well, if you come to the microphone, it will be better, I guess. Yeah. No, you can proceed. Uh, th there is no uh, question from the okay. audience uh, for this one. So. Okay, then let's uh, thank the speakers again. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. So yeah, the next talk is supposed to be uh, prompt tuning for targeted sentiment analysis in Russian by Yuliana Salomatin and Natalia Lukashevich. Uh, okay, I'm going to present our paper, which is called prompt tuning for targeted sentiment analysis in Russian. And uh, first of all, we need to uh, define what targeted sentiment analysis is and how it is different from general uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, in fact, uh, it is of often important to take into account the relationships between the participants of the situation. Uh, for example, X offended Y and so on. Uh, and uh, this is what targeted sentiment analysis is. So we have a target and we have some attitude uh, that is being expressed towards it. Uh, and uh, there are very few uh, studies on this topic using Russian uh, language material. And um, also it is important to mention that uh, targeted sentiment analysis is particularly relevant for the news discourse and uh, news texts are uh, more uh, difficult uh, to analyze in terms of sentiment as compared with uh, reviews, for example, uh, not because of this uh, target uh, topic, but also uh, because of the uh, predominance of uh, neutral polarities, since uh, journalists always try to be as neutral as possible. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, some uh, sentiments are expressed implicitly, which means uh, there are no um, expressive sentiment words, uh, but just uh, some um, underlying meanings, some uh, facts that uh, can uh, be uh, defined as sentiments. And uh, so uh, the, uh, earlier this year, the competition Rue saint -E was organized and uh, the task uh, it was uh, to deal with the targeted sentiment analysis on uh, Russian data. And uh, the current study uh, suggests uh, prompt-based learning for this task. Uh, and for the uh, Blackbone uh, model, we used rural but uh, large model. Uh, and uh, the experiments were based on the question answering approach, which means that the test uh, was formulated as a question in a natural language. And uh, then it was fed into the model and the expected output uh, was the uh, class label, positive, negative or neutral. And uh, uh, it is important to mention that uh, what worked best is fine tuning and prompt tuning both. And uh, I'm uh, going to uh, briefly overview the methods that we implemented during our experiments. And first of all, uh, we are all uh, very familiar with the fine tuning approach, but there is also a prompting approach that was recently suggested. Uh, the idea behind that is that uh, when we um, fine tune the model uh, for the downstream task, uh, we can uh, formulate a prompt 
in such a manner that their downstream task uh, will be very um, similar to their uh, pre-training task and this can boost their model's performance. Uh, and another problem with uh, this uh, kind of uh, tuning is that uh, we it is hard to choose uh, the prompt manually because we can change one uh, token in this prompt and this uh, can significantly affect the result and that's why we, uh, we can uh, tune the prompt just uh, like we tune the whole model or if we deal with a very large model like uh, GPT-3 we can uh, tune uh, the prompt instead of uh, fine-tuning the model. And um, uh, uh, after that, uh, many different modifications of this approach were suggested. For example, prompt tuning with rules. Uh, it means that uh, we can um, uh, mask uh, not only the class label, uh, but also some uh, sub-prompts, some uh, other tokens uh, that help um, uh, explain the task to the model uh, better. And then we can aggregate uh, the uh, predictions uh, via conjunctive normal form and get the final class label. Uh, another approach is knowledgeable prompt tuning. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, is, it deals with the verbalizer. Uh, verbalizer is basically a list of uh, class names. Uh, which are then mapped with the labels of the class uh, and these uh, names are predicted during the language modeling block. And uh, knowledgeable prompt tuning means that uh, we can uh, predict not only the uh, labels uh, of the class, but also some uh, words related to them, uh, which are extracted from some external linguistic research. So in this uh, study, we implemented uh, both uh, manual prompts, prompting approach, and prompt tuning uh, approaches uh, that I uh, just described. And also, we implemented uh, the approach of mixed templates, which means some that some tokens in the prompt can be uh, fixed and others can be uh, tuned. And the data is uh, Rusent and E corpus, uh, which was uh, uh, pre labeled with named entities and then it was labeled with uh, uh, sentiments and with uh, relationships uh, between their uh, named entities and uh, for the competition it was um, pre-processed uh, for example uh, they are only uh, used uh, sentences with uh, non-contradictionary um, cases, which means that X is uh, loved by uh, Y but hated by Z. It is contradictory case, uh, which uh, in these cases were excluded. And also we only dealt with uh, sentence level and not with document level. And for evaluation in this uh, research, we uh, first uh, conducted a threefold cross-validation, and then we um, uh, tested uh, our model on the Rusent and E split, which was provided by the uh, organizers of the competition. And I would also like to say that uh, the baseline model for the competition was uh, rule built uh, without any modifications and uh, the results are uh, presented on the slide. And the metrics uh, which were used, uh, apart from just the F score, uh, F1 score, also the uh, F1 score that was uh, averaged across only the positive and negative class, since uh, these two classes are particularly interesting for this task. And also, I would like to acknowledge the authors of this uh, paper about open prompt, since they released a very helpful tool for uh, different for implementing different prompt tuning strategies out of the box, uh, which uh, really uh, helps uh, using them for using any uh, prompt tuning approach for uh, the downstream task just by loading the uh, pre-trained model from Hagen phase and uh, formulating the template of the prompt. And the first series of experiments uh, is uh, uh, manual prompt based experiments. And uh, here we tested two variables, the prompt type and the um, 
a way we handle class imbalance since uh, as i already mentioned news texts uh, contain uh, many neutral polarities and uh, not many positive or negative ones and uh, we use a prompt as just a target word or a question to the target word about uh, how do they feel about x and for handling class imbalance uh, we uh, First of all, try to not use any other any anything for this. Uh, then we try to uh, calculate class weights uh, in the uh, during the in the loss function, uh, and also to augment our data via back translation and replacing some tokens with contextually close uh, other tokens. Uh, then. Um, the mixed template uh, is uh, presented on the slide. Uh, here, the soft uh, are the tunable tokens, and uh, text are the fixed tokens, which uh, were just the same uh, during their whole training stage. And the verbalizer uh, consists of just class names. And there, um, uh, then we implemented prompt, uh, prompt tuning with rules. And uh, here, we also tested uh, how the initialization of the prompt can affect the result. And in the first uh, template, uh, we tried to focus on the fact that there, there is uh, some uh, participant uh, of the situation mentioned in the sentence from which uh, the model can derive uh, the attitude. And in the second template, uh, uh, we uh, emphasize the fact that the uh, sentiment can be expressed both implicitly and explicitly. Uh, and uh, the last approach is uh, knowledgeable uh, prompt tuning. And for this, we uh, utilized uh, Rue Sentilex and Rue uh, Sender Frames lexicons. And um, uh, in the first strategy, we tried to uh, collect words for the verbalizers in such a way that for both uh, negative and positive sentiments, uh, the classes uh, could overlap since there are some words that can uh, have uh, different meanings in different contexts and can have different uh, sentiments in different contexts. And in the second strategies, uh, strategy, we uh, made sure that, that, uh, that there are no overlapping and the positive class is always prioritized since in the previous experiments uh, we saw that the uh, results for the positive class are always uh, a bit worse than for the negative one and um, so it means that for example some words like uh, shame murder uh, uh, have negative connotation that's why it is negative class and so on and the results are presented here and uh, we can see uh, first of all that uh, no, um, uh, no method to handle class imbalance uh, showed good result. Uh, and some of them, like augmentation, are very time consuming and they uh, do not uh, give some uh, performance boost. Uh, so they are not uh, really suitable for the task. Uh, and a prompting approach uh, works much uh, better. And the best model that showed the best result during our experiments is uh, knowledgeable prompt tuning uh, with the other first strategy and uh, so we selected this best model and then evaluated it on the data split from the uh, competition uh, and the results uh, can be compared to the third place uh, however uh, the models from the top of the leaderboard leveraged its ensembling methods uh, and uh, these methods are extremely um, computationally intensive uh, because they are ensembles of transformers. And so the prompting uh, and prompt tuning approach uh, works uh, really good, uh, not only in terms of the quality, but also in terms of the uh, computational intensity. And uh, so in the current study, uh, we researched the task of targeted sentiment analysis in Russian, and um, we tested different strategies for both uh, hard prompts and soft prompts. 
uh, and uh, we also saw that prompt tuning uh, along with fine tuning uh, surpasses vanilla fine tuning and manual, and manual prompting and the best uh, model that showed uh, really good results uh, was the model based on uh, knowledgeable prompt tuning and uh, that's it um, thank you for your attention uh, if you have any questions please feel free to ask them thanks a lot Juliana so uh, are there any questions uh, in zoom so let's uh, for a change start with uh, with the online uh, audience you can raise your hand or just unmute uh, your microphone. And as I've said, if there are any questions in the in the on-site uh, from the on-site audience, yeah, just come up to the mic. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, just uh, maybe a very silly question from me. Uh, since you use prompting anyway, so. Um, uh, why have you decided to use uh, BERT-like encoder uh, models, and not generative decoder or encoder-decoder models? And uh, don't you think uh, that using generative models would uh, improve the performance of your approach? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, I was considering that, but uh, first I started with the rule BERT model. Uh, because uh, this uh, was uh, before the whole thing with uh, ChatGPT and so on, and uh, BERT models uh, were uh, more suitable for classification tasks and also for the uh, purposes of uh, uh, computational uh, uh, possibilities. And uh, then uh, it... Uh, uh, the experiments showed that Ru Roberta uh, was uh, given even better results, uh, and then the uh, ChatGPT appeared. And I also uh, had some experiments with ChatGPT which uh, were not uh, very successful. Uh, and this is just uh, a topic for another conversation why they were not that successful. But uh, yeah, I think that. Uh, it is possible that decoder-only models, uh, when prompt-tuned, can be um, very uh, suitable for this task. But I also wonder, uh, as far as I know, no one uh, from the participants of the competition, uh, no one used decoder models. Maybe they also conducted some experiments. But yeah, thank you. I think that uh, uh, there is uh, room for improvement for uh, other experiments on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And what about encoder decoder models like T5, etc.? You didn't try them either. No, I didn't try them. Okay. Also. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. I guess uh, we are way out of time, so we probably should move on with the next uh, talk. But yeah, uh, thanks again, uh, Idana. That was very interesting. And uh, the next talk is supposed to be the battle of informational presentations comparing sentiment and semantic features for forecasting market trends. Uh, yeah, and I guess Andrei Zaychenko is here in Zoom. Uh, so again, greetings, everyone. Uh, I will introduce to you our paper comparing sentiment uh, and semantic features for forecasting market trends. Uh, in recent years, several studies have applied deep learning and NLP techniques to financial data, including news articles, uh, social media posts, and quarterly financial reports in order to predict price movements. Uh, despite its significance, most researchers rely on sentiment analysis as the primary additional feature, uh, leaving little exploration of the potential of semantics and context hidden in the text. Uh, in this paper, we aim to fill this gap in research by testing the hypothesis that semantic features are important for stock price prediction. 
uh, our approach uses sentence embeddings extracted from Twitter data uh, to capture extra information and uh, contextual relationships with financial market trends. And uh, then we compare our approach to traditional sentiment-based solutions to evaluate its performance. Uh, in, the, in the introduction to the paper, we made a claim uh, about existence of contextual information inside the text that can be utilized and retained uh, using the embedded approach. Um, to demonstrate the validity of this claim, we created a vector representation of the text using uh, the state-of-the-art sentence transformer model, uh, mapping our sentence to 384-dimensional dense vector space. Uh, after the creation of tweet embeddings, we proceeded with a vector clustering and used a bird topic modeling technique to create a uh, higher uh, Just uh, Andre, yes. is it supposed yeah. to be that you still show like the title slide only? Oh, no, no, no. Yes, you can see on the slide the resulting output of the uh, topic clustering. In this case, uh, you can see the results for the Google tweets. Uh, it produced a list of 20 topics uh, denoted by the distinct circles, which were later grouped up into four main large crust clusters of the topics. Uh, so next slide. Uh, now we will connect these topics and market data and observe multiple time periods uh, with high and low user activity. Uh, during low activity period, we can see proportionally equal spikes of cluster topics reacting to volatility changes. Uh, and uh, they are caused by just the tweet number increase. On the other hand, high user activity leads to great diversity in topic reactions. All of them have their peaks and lows, uh, meaning that larger sample uh, help us uh, to make help, helps us make a distinction of topic trends resulting in higher correlation that is at least twice as large as you can see in the tables below the graphs. This further speaks in favor of our ongoing hypothesis that great amount of extra information is hidden inside the text semantics uh, that can be used to predict stock market volatility. Next slide. Now we proceed to an overview of overall scheme of conducted experiment. Uh, it consists of four main steps. Uh, first is data retrieval, a process uh, where we collected uh, a five-year data set uh, published on Kaggle. Um, it, was, uh, it was containing uh, tweets regarding uh, Tesla, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft companies. Uh, then the data pre-processing. So we uh, deduplicated uh, some tweets in order to uh, clean the data. Yes. Uh, then uh, the covariates aggregation, uh, depending on the experiment, we either used binary sentiment score or created the embedding vector and used this as a feature. Uh, for the target variable, we chose the close price. Uh, last step is model prediction. After covariates are were fed into either TFT or nlinear models, we train it and make a three or five step ahead historical prediction on validation data set dependent on the experiment. Uh, next slide. In order to prevent overfitting and produce better results, uh, we introduced a custom loss function, DMSE. Uh, it was built on top of one of the most popular loss functions uh, for regression text, the mean square error. Uh, but we had a directional component. Uh, it was done because MSE just focuses on the difference uh, between true and predicted price. Uh, in terms of stock price prediction, the direction of the price movement is actually a more important factor than the value itself. That's why the custom loss was introduced. Next slide. Uh, depending on the experiment, uh, three main groups of uh, past covariates were used, containing market, sentiment, and embedded features. Further, they will be denoted by the abbreviations, where HLOV is market features, uh, S denotes sentiment score, and E is for embedded vectors. Next slide. Uh, two models uh, and one baseline approach were used during experiments to predict the closing stock price, the temporal fusion transformer, and linear and naive seasonal approach. Uh, TFT is an encoded-decoded transform model. 
uh, it's, it makes use of uh, multi-head attention, GRNs and LSTM, uh, while nLinear is a more novel approach uh, of a simple linear layer introduced in 2022 that outperformed uh, multiple transformer models on time series uh, benchmark data sets. That's why we uh, used it uh, as kind of a benchmark for our experiment. Next slide. Uh, during elaborate exploration of uh, sentiment score, we achieved results confirming that the social network sentiment is a great indicator for stock price movement prediction. Uh, as you can see on the figures on the left, uh, we demonstrate stock price movement as well as sentiment score uh, calculated in both ways. Uh, first, as a relation between negative and positive tweets, and second, as fraction of negative tweets in the total amount. Uh, visually, we can observe a great amount of resemblance between price and sentiment variables. Uh, in this case, Apple, which is on above, has a lower correlation compared to Amazon below. Uh, for Apple, in this case, the correlation was around 20%, while Amazon has 40%. Uh, when we compare stock volatility with sentiment score in figures in the middle, we observe the same phenomena. Correlation is higher for Amazon by 52%. And actually for Apple, we can clearly see the time lag between uh, public reaction and stock volatility. Uh, volatility precedes public sentiment shift, uh, but for Amazon, the situation is slightly different. Uh, we can see that sentiment changes are synchronized and even precede the volatility shift in some cases, making it a greater predictor of price movement. And using scatter plot, we can further observe linear dependence between uh, sentiment and volatility for both companies, although for Amazon, the dependence is more prominent. Uh, we therefore claim that there is a clear statistical relationship between uh, observed values. Next slide. Uh, here we present a table of a resulting error score for symmetric mean absolute percentage error for all companies. Overall, TFT model performed better than in linear for all companies. Uh, the best performing model for Apple is TFT with embedding vectors as a feature. Uh, comparing the closest instance, uh, we observe uh, at least 30% uh, decrease for SMAPE. It is also important to point out that for Apple using sentiment score uh, actually didn't help to improve models accuracy for both of the models. On the contrary, with Amazon, we observe different behavior of models performance. Uh, given the input features, both nLinear and TFT received performance boost with usage of sentiment score uh, and embedding vector actually yielded higher error values. Um, Models with embedding vectors show the best accuracy only in two cases out of five for Apple and Microsoft uh, that were companies with the lowest correlation between volatility and sentiment, as we said in the previous experiments uh, for Amazon, Google and Tesla, sentiment score outperformed uh, our embedding vector approach. Next slide. Uh, the above results could not lead us to a complete conclusion, so we experimented further with a smaller prediction window of three days. Another approach was a different sentence embedding algorithm created by Microsoft, MPNet. It has twice the amount of dimensions compared with the approach mentioned previously, but the accuracy of closing price prediction dropped significantly for our model. In the table, we observed that for some metrics, embedding approach still shows better performance, but uh, the difference actually is insignificant and sentiment approach received better results for four out of five metrics like in the case of Apple. Uh, another company that had nearly similar results for both feature sets was Google. The difference are negligible, only 0.04% for MAPE. For Amazon and Tesla, sentiment again proved to be a better feature, scoring higher for all of the metrics. Both of those additional experiments, uh, they further demonstrated that sentiment as a baseline solution still performs better than the proposed embedding vector approach. Uh, next slide. 
So yeah, uh, the results of this study provides uh, further evidence uh, in support of sentiment analysis as an effective tool for predicting price movements in financial markets. Um, it showed that the binary sentiment polarity extraction approach outperformed sentence embeddings in terms of accuracy and uh, training time. For some cases, uh, the embedding approach proved to be useful on five prediction window, five day prediction window, uh, outperforming sentiment baseline solutions. Uh, this suggests that uh, the choice between binary sentiment polarity extractions and uh, sentence embeddings as the preferred approach can possibly depend on the specific task and the prediction horizon, as well as the effectiveness of sentiment as a predictor in the given context. In the majority of the conducted experiments, the sentiment approach outperforms the embedding vectors method. This fact might be might be counterintuitive because uh, embeddings uh, seem to encompass more valuable contextual information. Uh, however, sentiments tend to represent information in a more concise way, bringing less noise into the prediction model. Nevertheless, the embedding approach still has an advantage that it does not require an additional model for sentiment extraction and uh, the consequent quality verification of that procedure on the other hand, sentence embeddings approach uh, did, uh, does, doesn't require us to verify it and can produce similar results to sentiment extraction, retaining more of the semantic and contextual information contained in the text. Uh, nevertheless, the model training time for sentence embedding, sentence embedding is significantly longer. These findings uh, suggest that uh, sentence embedding could be considered as a robust solution after further works. Uh, due to its similar performance to the sentiment extraction. Yes, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes, thanks a lot. So we have time for probably one question. Uh, any questions uh, in the audience, either online or offline? Please just speak up. Okay, yeah, I have a question. Thanks for the talk. I'm not familiar with the uh, stock price prediction field. Uh, what usually related work do? I mean, which additional field do they use? Mm, I guess sentiment uh, polarity uh, score should be somehow known for stock price prediction already. Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, the current approaches, uh, most of them use the sentiment polarity extraction uh, from uh, multiple resources like uh, social networks or uh, some of them use uh, the financial reports in order to predict uh, long term price movements. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, the usage of the text itself e isn't very a uh, research topic. But uh, even if we talk about the sentiment polarity extractions, most of them um, perform um, rather bad uh, in the um, in terms of uh, testing on the real data, uh, when we try to apply these models to the real stock market movements, it only performs uh, good on the historical data, but uh, uh, it is actually a very um, under-researched topic uh, because the price movements are rather random and it is very hard to, uh, to find some um, robust solutions uh, to bring the prices, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I believe we have to move on uh, to the next and last talk, but yeah, uh, thank you again, uh, Andre. Thank you. Right, and uh, the next and actually the last talk of this session, and in fact, the last talk of the NLP track of ICE this year, uh, is uh, whether large language models learn at the inference stage by Vlad Leon Kulikov, Ilya Makarov, and Radoslav Nechev. And I see Radoslav is here in Zoom. Can you say something just to make sure? Yeah. That... Hello, everyone. Glad Hi. To... Yes, yes, we can hear you. Can you share your screen? Definitely. So here we go. It should be up and running now. Three, yes. One. Yes, Daniel. Please move on. 15 minutes right. is yours. 
Thank you, Andre. So hello, everyone. Thank you for hosting me here today. Unfortunately, I was unable to join in person, but hope next time it will be it. So we have a lot of different discussions uh, on uh, recent advances in NLP, especially in the generative models, including uh, transformer-based architectures. And with my clicks, we tried to analyze why actually they perform really better in some cases when we provide some additional information during the inference stage. Or is it so-called the learning and reasoning effect during the inference stage? So main goal was not actually to provide some new approach to make it even better, but to understand and explain and maybe provide it to other people the pipeline how to make it work and analyze what are the main reasons of this happening. So just in case, the main question is, how do these models, especially transformer-based models like GPT or Bloom family, learn during the inference stage, learn in quotes, of course, so they incorporate some additional novel information which wasn't present during the training stage with no changes either to the architecture and to the model premise. And in addition, we tried to cover these two questions because they are quite widely known, but they are not that strictly defined. First of all, what is Ellender effect or learning and reasoning effect? And do they actually learn and reason during the inference stage? By them, I mean the large language models, or they simply simulate some intelligent behavior. So there are a lot of different papers, of course, on this uh, topic. I've only brought uh, three of them that for me seems a little bit most relevant for this particular research, but actually in the original paper supplementing this uh, speech, we have more than 15 different sources, then they all are important. So first of all, there was a first paper which provided the chain of thought prompting in large language modeling in the same approach we do, the first one. Second one is just the original paper on GPT-3. And the last one is actually quite uh, old compared with uh, all the other papers. Paper on the future learning in machine translation from back 2018, but we have a few relevant uh, ideas from the paper in here. So let's first of all formulate the hypothesis which will help us to move on. Main hypothesis in this work and we will try to support it with several experimental and uh, literature results, is the following. Large language models, and by large language models, we assume all the models which have big enough parameter of space, space parameters. I will define what is big enough a little bit later. We assume that they create some inner language spaces that contain not only the language itself, like grammatics, semantics, and so on, but some patterns of uh, rules and reasonings which are implicitly, not explicitly, embedded in this space. So LMs, instead of uh, learning something new during the inference stage, simply adjust their state of mind to the particular already learned behavior trajectories. So main idea, once again, of this hypothesis is that the majority of the information is uh, learned and embedded into this space during the train stage and during the inference stage, the examples of reasonings, chain of thought, and so on, only provide some instructions to calibrate the behavior of the model. So I will be brief on the problem of you because I understand that everybody on this conference is uh, well aware of all the problems we are solving with uh, language models. But just in case, we assume that we have given a sequence of some tokens from finite dictionary, which contain description and maybe one or several examples of the behavior on the desired problem. And we assume that these behavior examples help us to solve the problem. Let it be easy classification, regression, text generation, whatever. So first of all, let's take a look at the data size and uh, the model size for which we actually observe this learn and reason effect, because if you take Nano GPT provided by Andre Kripati with 300 lines of code, then you definitely will not see any Ellender effect, and that's fine. So according to the data we checked in several uh, sources, all the sources list once again are available in the paper itself, the corpus itself, corpus of data, meaning should have at least 300 billions of tokens, because otherwise it's kind of 
too small. And also the models should be of size billions, not millions, of course. It should be approximately 33 or 50 billions of parameters. However, even uh, 7 billions seems uh, to be enough for certain types of tests. For example, if you are speaking only about the machine inflation. And speaking about that paper on uh, unsupervised machine translation and how is it related for the current speech. Actually, translation systems uh, show us that uh, if we're speaking about unsupervised machine translation, from the time we can see that if we have two different models trained for language modeling on two different languages, we can simply try adjusting the internal spaces together by using only small amount of uh, Label data, what I mean, we can have one, some kind of uh, language model or just word embedding model like word to vec fast text and so on. And the other one in here on the slides, I just adjusted as some kind of strange clouds. And the idea in there is the following. We assume that all the languages are actually based on the real world, real world scenarios outside, uh, outside there. And we know that actually word uh, sun and uh, Sky are usually much more aligned and uh, they usually come together than words uh, sun and uh, I don't know, dimethyl or hedgehog or something else. So when we provide some examples of words that directly translate one into another, for example, word gato in Spanish, I guess, or Adelian, sorry, I forgot it, and cat in English, we simply adjust these um, clouds of points. And then we can get the time, of course, almost state of that approach with almost no data which is aligned between two spaces. So the assumption is the following. These models already have created some internal states, and then we simply align them with several examples which are labeled for first and second uh, spaces. So the spaces are aligned as the mark D, and now we get the aligned spaces and the translating can be performed rather well. Okay, that was the idea from the machine translation. And later, we tried to adjust this idea to the chain of thought reasoning, because when we provide some chain of thought reasoning for the model or provide just an examples to make the model work better, we can see that the model starts working better, but the reason might be the same. We might simply adjust the internal state, internal language space of reasoning of the model, because the model is definitely over parameterized because it contains billions of parameters, and it might cause the better behavior. There is even an important note because which uh, follows our observations and experiments, and it somehow proves our results. Because when we provide some examples for the model, how to work in the upcoming problems like classification or tech generation in specific form or some arithmetic problems, even providing the examples with wrong reasonings, so we provide example that the model should follow some path of reasoning, but the example itself is just incorrect. For example, it has arithmetic errors or just uh, broken logic and so on. Even such examples help the model to perform better and to achieve better results. But if we change the order of reasoning, for example, we try to just shuffle the sentences within this examples, then the whole sequence is kind of broken and the model behavior fails. The model quality fails, sorry, and the model behavior is not as we expected. Okay, to provide some experimental proof of our claims, not only to refer to some other external research papers, we've run the experimental setup with five different prompt and scenarios. First one was absolutely no prompt, so we simply ask the model to answer to our question, just like in zero-shot learning, for example, compute something, I don't know how many computers are in here. And we also had four additional prompting scenarios. First of all, standard prompting. So we have simply simple example in here, like one-shot learning, for example, question, there are nine computers in the server room, five more computers were installed each day, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is 29. After that, we assume we send another question for the model, and we'll ask the model to continue the sentence to generate the answer, as we usually work with this language modeling approach. The second scenario is chain of thought prompting. So we provide a question, and then we provide a chain of thought sequence. So we not only provide the answer, but the chain of thought as well. Third 
scenario is actually invalid reasoning. So the same stuff as we did with the chain of thought, but now the chain of thought is actually incorrect. But in this case, we still have the correct sequence of steps. So we had original nine computers, then we have for each day, we have arithmetical errors and the answer. And finally, the irrelevant prompting. So we have question on something related, for example, with computers or with uh, vegetables or with something. And the answer is just random coming from another example, for example. So we had five scenarios and we used a couple of uh, open and closed source models because we wanted to check the behavior either on some, the, on some state of the art models like GPT family or some open source models. Just in case this uh, work was mostly performed during spring, so we don't have the most recent uh, models like Second Llama and so on. So we mostly focus on Bloom, include if we're speaking about open source models. We started using models from uh, half billion of parameters to 176 billions, so including Bloom, MT0, Excel, and Quancao, and of course GPT-4 because it's kind of state of the art for now. So I will provide the example table, so it's much easier to see, but the main idea was kind of simple. Models with a small size, including Bloom up to seven billions, could not provide any useful improvement using chain of thought, either correct or incorrect, so they're not present in the table. And uh, MT0 was also kind of inefficient if we try to provide some chain of thought reasoning. While Bloom 176, Guancao and GPT-4, and also including uh, previous to GPT-4, GPT-3.5 and 3 models like Text Da Vinci 0.2 and 0.3, provided some useful improvements. So first two columns in here, speaking about the models, correspond to open source models, while last three correspond to open AI models, which are kind of close. And we have a percent of the correct answers in five scenarios. So no DEMA, no prompting at all, then standard prompting, chain of thought, invalid chain of thought, and irrelevant chain of thought. And we can see that actually Bloom behavior did not improve on the arithmetic reasoning at all using any of the examples except standard reasoning and chain of thought. So it improved the behavior a little bit. For the Panaco, it seemed a little bit surprising. So without any DEMA, it performed much better than with standard prompting. But chain of thought and invalid chain of thought provided improvement of the score. So once again, we prove the, the hypothesis that actually the order of the prompting is more relevant than the correctness of it itself. And speaking about the OpenAI models, we can see that uh, we solved them. We did not use them with uh, no prompting at all. So we use only with standard prompting and chain of thought. We can see that chain of thought improves the behavior. Invalid prompting doesn't break it. And sometimes it even improves for some reason. Maybe it's the consequences of not big enough size of the tested data set, but for all the other models, this size was quite enough because the results were rather stable. And even when we provide some irrelevant prompting, we can see that it might improve for, or not degrade for GPT-like models spoken about OpenAI. And last but not least, GPT-4 provides uh, great results out of the box. And with prompting, with, we can either achieve the same behavior or even break it despite we're using some useful prompting, so it's standard prompting or chain of thought with correct examples. Same stuff was achieved with question and answer and reasoning on the Bamboogle test. So we can see exactly the same behavior. Chain of thought either improves everything a lot or doesn't change it for GPT-4. Invalid prompting in this case can break it a little bit, but still it's really close to correct prompting, but irrelevant breaks it a lot. So the conclusion might be the following, and I decided to just break it into the couple of questions we formulated in the beginning. So first of all, what is learn and reason effect? We assume, according to the research we formed, that learn and reason effect is uh, more about finding some similar reasoning patterns in the latent space the model has 
created during the training stage. And then these examples, chain of thought, or just uh, several short learning, provide the model example how to calibrate itself to find the appropriate, uh, maybe a projection of its own parameter space for the desired problem to solve the problem better. So it seems uh, like the application of pre-existing knowledge rather acquiring anything new. And speaking about the idea of large language models learning during the inference stage, seems like they, okay, I cannot say that they're not learned during the inference stage, but for now, we have not found any exact evidence that they actually learn something new during the inference stage, but we can assume that they are kind of exploiting their already existing knowledge and that, once again, is proved also by the results which we observe when we provide incorrect prompting, but preserving the desired sequence. So while when the model is just following the path we provided it, it achieves better results, even if we provide it with wrong examples. So that's kind of it. And uh, if you have any specific questions, thank you. Just from my, uh, not thank you, sorry, you're welcome. Just from my side. Actually, the area is rapidly evolving, and I understand that if there are some new results, this might become a little bit incorrect just every day because uh, we got into a really tricky area of trying to explain why all these models work. So I would be glad to hear any of the questions, including the questions which just uh, question the correctness of this paper as well, because I want the discussion to be useful for all of us. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Radoslav. Thanks a lot. Uh, this sort of concludes uh, the ISNLP session, but maybe we still have time like for one uh, quick question. I guess people on site and uh, online are already anticipating the closing of the conference, but yeah, still <laughs> any questions? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, yeah, just uh, just a brief one from me. Uh, I'm a bit <laughs> a bit um, confused, in fact, about your uh, final uh, claim uh, or statement that uh, large language models don't learn anything uh, during a few short uh, in few shots uh, few short scenarios. It, isn't it sort of uh, trivial? And I mean, does anyone actually claim that models learn anything in, in few short scenarios? Of course, they don't because they uh, their weights are not updated. So, like, uh, what? Okay. May I then fix a little bit this uh, formulation? Yeah, you're right. So, I'm not speaking. We're not speaking about the learning in classical paradigm when we just update the model weights or add some another adapter. No. By learning, we merely meant that the models do not acquire any new knowledge. So if they are unable to solve some problems at the, if they are not trained to solve some problems during the training stage, they won't acquire this uh, ability, even if we provide them some uh, useful prompts, uh, some examples and so on. So we only can make the models solve the problems they already have seen during the training stage, maybe in a little bit different scenario, but we cannot uh, generalize them to unseen regions of our feature space or problem space. Well, but we do know that uh, we can, uh, I mean, <laughs> and just this uh, claim sounds to me a bit uh, self-supporting and- uh, Okay, it's a little bit obvious, right? Yeah. Okay, then it might be a little bit obvious. So the main reason we performed actually this research was the curiosity to find out whether they do or do not, because when we started, it was kind of a little bit, a little less than a year ago. There were several examples like providing IRIS dataset to ChatGPT, and it was able to perform the classification on the inference stage, providing some examples and improving the quality of the answer a lot. So we tried to make a little bit bigger overview, including a couple of different papers, different approaches to actually approve or claim that it's not learning during the inference stage. So yeah, we're not trying to provide any novel, I guess, uh, result in terms of uh, its uh, astonishing result. We're trying to actually a little bit more formally prove that no, they're not learning yet. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I guess it's time to thank the speaker again and uh, close the session.
Thank you, Radoslav. And now, yeah, I step down uh, to leave the space for the closing session. Thank you, Andre, for chairing. So this is a Leonas edition uh, uh, of ICE conference. Uh, first of all, we're very glad that many people made it offline and uh, many nice and really high quality talks were presented during these two days. And the first nomination in the natural language processing uh, area uh, awards goes to Anton Alexeyev, Sergei, Niko uh, Sergei Nikolenko, Gulnar uh, Kabaeva for their work on Kyrgyz language. So with this, I would like to uh, please uh, Anton to come uh, and to make some short one minute uh, presentation and highlight the work. So, but first, let's. Well, first of all, thank you for the honor. I guess now I'll really have to continue the research on the topic to make the data set uh, even more fine-grained and more justified. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the whole purpose of this work was to create the uh, Walter Liebig to topic classification data set for Kyrgyz language, which would and is essentially the first data set for the applied NLP task in Kyrgyz language. And then um, the overall idea, why would that be? Why such a task is uh, that uh, there is an urgent need in some data set to find out whether uh, the multilingual models work for Kyrgyz language. And uh, as we've shown, they do to a certain extent and uh, outperform the very basic bag of engrams approaches by a large margin. The work is going to be continued and uh, now for sure. And uh, more interesting work, works, I hope, are to come because during the this year and a year and a half, maybe, a large community of uh, volunteers in Kyrgyzstan evolved. So this is it. And I'm pretty sure that there will be a special time for that, but may I have some personal remark. I would uh, like to thank the uh, organizers who make the conference happen, uh, the, who made this conference happen again. And of course, our fabulous hosts who managed to do everything like perfectly, uh, despite the trying times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next section is computer vision and uh, awards go to Razan uh, Dido, uh, Andrei Galichin, Pavel Astashev, Dmitry uh, Dilov, and Alek Rogov. And this is uh, work on deep learning based uh, one pathology localization with classification with uh, X-ray images. So uh, I'm not sure whether Alec is a f for first time at the highest and uh, arrived just this morning and already got uh, <laughs> best favor award. So uh, please. Yeah, this is probably because yesterday I was giving a speech regarding the artificial general intelligence, I believe. Yeah, so I think here all the credits go uh, mostly to uh, Razan Dibo, who is now the PhD student of the Tensor uh, Networks Lab with the Skoltech. So, um, we all know that uh, attention is all you need, but uh, sometimes you have to look on the ones. So we, we decided to combine these approaches and uh, eventually we found an architectural approach to address um, a very important uh, medical task of uh, child's uh, uh, risk trauma detection in hospital. We eventually got uh, past uh, the preclinical trials and uh, we developed the, uh, the approach that uh, combines uh, uh, the state-of-the-art approaches uh, in the object detection, uh, gradient attention mechanisms, and uh, the shifted uh, window block in it. So, um, well, I think that uh, as uh, once uh, Andrei uh, Kolmogorov said that uh, really new things uh, lie in between um, something trivial and uh, something un something incomprehensible. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, the next award uh, on social network analysis go to Sergei Sidorov, uh, Sergei Mironov, and Alexey Grigoryev on a work on limited distributions of friendship index in scale-free networks. Please. Uh, please say a couple of words about your work. Uh, thank you. That's a big surprise for, for me. Uh, thanks, organizers. Well, uh, Friendship Index uh, was uh, uh, was studied a lot in the social uh, studies, but uh, what hasn't been given enough attention in uh, network analysis. So here we did some uh, extensive research on well, uh, Friendship Index and its uh, continuation of our work. Uh, well, we uh, we've studied a lot of. <laughs> Uh, distributions, how it's distributed, what its limits are, and uh, well, actually, I think now it's uh, the uh, it's time to put friendship index away and move on because it's not a, a great measure. It's not a well uh, all solving one, but and uh, I hope uh, this well uh, well I hope uh, well you like. Our talk, my talk and all this stuff is thank you very much and congrats once again uh so the next talk is on machine learning it goes to vladimir berikov on ensemble clustering with heterogeneous transfer learning vladimir say please a couple of words about your work Thank you very much for <laughs> right. it's, it's a lot uh, to be, uh, surprising for me yes so this work <clears throat> this work uh, the idea of some additional information which uh, can give some insight to the analysis of data of target data is used and uh, the algorithm is based on finding some useful meta features and data from both domains are quite different. The features are uh, different for, for the domains uh, and we should find some uh, structural properties of data and transfer knowledge from uh, one domain to another domain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, last award goes to Dmitry Ignatov on his uh, theoretical work uh, on asymptotic coefficients uh, for the maximum anti-chain of partitions and related counting inequalities. And I really hope that Dmitry will decrypt now what his contribution is. Thank you. This is a bit unusual being an organizing uh, member and uh, receiving this kind of award, but I always wanted to contribute with this theoretical section with something worthy, and it was a pleasure for me that the committee evaluated my work by, it, by its scientific merits, and I was also happy uh, to apply data mining and machine learning techniques uh, to the problems that were posed by such eminent mathematicians like Giancarlo Rota, known in combinatorics, Ron Graham, uh, Harper, Canfield, and Kleitman. So uh, here I, I just added one small break uh, to our knowledge on the number of maximal anti chains and uh, anti-chains of partitions in particular, and also somehow help to uh, reduce uh, reduce uncertainty in some asymptotic coefficients. So thank you. Thank you, Dmitry. Uh, and let me now say once again, uh, great, great thanks for our hosts. Uh, we all heard probably about Armenian hospitality, but now we certainly all experienced uh, the best of it. And this conference, this event would not happen uh, unless uh, Habet and Amalia would 
do so much during this uh, half a year or more. And uh, first of all, thanks for just proposing an opportunity to host the conference and providing all the resources and all the support uh, and uh, our every need. So Habet and Amalia, let's uh, thank them and uh, computer science uh, and engineering uh, department of AU. Uh, so thanks a lot. <laughs> think, uh, thanks. And of course, thanks for all our uh, supporters from um, uh, Skoltech, Irie, Mrs. Uh, High School of Economics, who, uh, those uh, who um, basically contributed uh, time of their people or other resources uh, to the conference. So with this, uh, I'm glad and a bit sad to conclude this edition of IEST. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, next time at the conference. Uh, stay tuned uh, when and where it will be. And we be sure that we work in to make it happen <laughs> next time. <laughs>